Section one of the Brothers Karamazov. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Book one. The History of a Family. Chapter one. Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov. Alexey Fyodorovitch Karamazov was the third son of Fyodor Pavlovitch Karamazov, a landowner well known in our district in his own day and still remembered among us, owing to his gloomy and tragic death, which happened thirteen years ago, and which I shall describe in its proper place. For the present, I will only say that this landowner, for so we used to call him, although he hardly spent a day of his life on his own estate, was a strange type yet one pretty frequently to be met with a type abject and vicious and at the same time senseless but he was one of those senseless persons who are very well capable of looking after their worldly affairs and apparently after nothing else fyodor pavlovitch for instance began with next to nothing his estate was of the smallest he ran to dine at other men's tables and fastened on them as a toady yet at his death it appeared that he had a hundred thousand roubles in hard cash at the same time he was all his life one of the most senseless fantastical fellows in the whole district i repeat it was not stupidity the majority of these fantastical fellows are shrewd and intelligent enough but just senselessness and a peculiar national form of it he was married twice and had three sons the eldest dmitri by his first wife and two ivan and alexey by his second fyodor pavlovitch's first wife adalida ivanovna belonged to a fairly rich and distinguished noble family also landowners in our district the miusovs how it came to pass that an heiress who was also a beauty and moreover one of those vigorous intelligent girls so common in this generation but sometimes also to be found in the last could have married such a worthless puny weakling as we all called him i won't attempt to explain i knew a young lady of the last romantic generation who after some years of an enigmatic passion for a gentleman whom she might quite easily have married at any moment invented insuperable obstacles to their union and ended by throwing herself one stormy night into a rather deep and rapid river from a high bank almost a precipice and so perished entirely to satisfy her own caprice and to be like shakespeare's ophelia indeed if this precipice a chosen and favourite spot of hers had been less picturesque if there had been a prosaic flat bank in its place most likely the suicide would never have taken place this is a fact and probably there have been not a few similar instances in the last two or three generations adelaida ivanovna musov's action was similarly no doubt an echo of other people's ideas and was due to the irritation caused by lack of mental freedom she wanted perhaps to show her feminine independence to override class distinctions and the despotism of her family and a pliable imagination persuaded her we must suppose for a brief moment that fyodor pavlovitch in spite of his parasitic position was one of the bold and ironical spirits of that progressive epoch though he was in fact an ill-natured buffoon and nothing more what gave the marriage piquancy was that it was preceded by an elopement and this greatly captivated adelaida ivanovna's fancy fyodor pavlovitch's position at the time made him specially eager for any such enterprise for he was passionately anxious to make a career in one way or another to attach himself to a good family and obtain a dowry was an alluring prospect as for mutual love it did not exist apparently either in the bride or in him in spite of adelaida ivanovna's beauty this was perhaps a unique case of the kind in the life of fyodor pavlovitch who was always of a voluptuous temper and ready to run after any petticoat on the slightest encouragement 
she seems to have been the only woman who made no particular appeal to his senses immediately after the elopement adelaida ivanovna discerned in a flash that she had no feeling for her husband but contempt the marriage accordingly showed itself in its true colors with extraordinary rapidity although the family accepted the event pretty quickly and apportioned the runaway bride her dowry the husband and wife began to lead a most disorderly life and there were everlasting scenes between them it was said that the young wife showed incomparably more generosity and dignity than fyodor pavlovitch who as is now known got hold of all her money up to twenty five thousand roubles as soon as she received it so that those thousands were lost to her forever the little village and the rather fine town-house which formed part of her dowry he did his utmost for a long time to transfer to his name by means of some deed of conveyance he would probably have succeeded merely from her moral fatigue and desire to get rid of him and from the contempt and loathing he aroused by his persistent and shameless importunity but fortunately adelaida ivanovna's family intervened and circumvented his greediness it is known for a fact that frequent fights took place between the husband and wife but rumor had it that fyodor pavlovitch did not beat his wife but was beaten by her for she was a hot-tempered bold dark-browed impatient woman possessed of remarkable physical strength finally she left the house and ran away from fyodor pavlovitch with a destitute divinity student leaving mitya a child of three years old in her husband's hands immediately fyodor pavlovitch introduced a regular harem into the house and abandoned himself to orgies of drunkenness in the intervals he used to drive all over the province complaining tearfully to each and all of adelaida ivanovna's having left him going into details too disgraceful for a husband to mention in regard to his own married life what seemed to gratify him and flatter his self-love most was to play the ridiculous part of the injured husband and to parade his woes with embellishments one would think that you'd got a promotion fyodor pavlovitch you seem so pleased in spite of your sorrow scoffers said to him many even added that he was glad of a new comic part in which to play the buffoon and that it was simply to make it funnier that he pretended to be unaware of his ludicrous position but who knows it may have been simplicity at last he succeeded in getting on the track of his runaway wife the poor woman turned out to be in petersburg where she had gone with her divinity student and where she had thrown herself into a life of complete emancipation fyodor pavlovitch at once began bustling about making preparations to go to petersburg with what object he could not himself have said he would perhaps have really gone but having determined to do so he felt at once entitled to fortify himself for the journey by another bout of reckless drinking and just at that time his wife's family received the news of her death in petersburg she had died quite suddenly in a garret according to one story of typhus or as another version had it of starvation fyodor pavlovitch was drunk when he heard of his wife's death and the story is that he ran out into the street and began shouting with joy raising his hands to heaven lord now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace but others said he wept without restraint like a little child so much so that people were sorry for him in spite of the repulsion he inspired it is quite possible that both versions were true that he rejoiced at his release and at the same time wept for her who released him as a general rule people even the wicked are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose and we ourselves are too end of section one Section two of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. 
book one chapter two he gets rid of his eldest son you can easily imagine what a father such a man could be and how he would bring up his children his behavior as a father was exactly what might be expected he completely abandoned the child of his marriage with adelaida ivanovna not from malice nor because of his matrimonial grievances but simply because he forgot him while he was wearying every one with his tears and complaints and turning his house into a sink of debauchery a faithful servant of the family grigory took the three-year-old mitya into his care if he hadn't looked after him there would have been no one even to change the baby's little shirt it happened moreover that the child's relations on his mother's side forgot him too at first his grandfather was no longer living his widow mitya's grandmother had moved to moscow and was seriously ill while his daughters were married so that mitya remained for almost a whole year in old grigory's charge and lived with him in the servant's cottage but if his father had remembered him he could not indeed have been altogether unaware of his existence he would have sent him back to the cottage as the child would only have been in the way of his debaucheries but a cousin of mitya's mother pyotr alexandrovitch musov happened to return from paris he lived for many years afterwards abroad but was at that time quite a young man and distinguished among the musovs as a man of enlightened ideas and of european culture who had been in the capitals and abroad towards the end of his life he became a liberal of the type common in the forties and fifties in the course of his career he had come into contact with many of the most liberal men of his epoch both in russia and abroad he had known proudhon and bakunin personally and in his declining years was very fond of describing the three days of the paris revolution of february eighteen forty eight hinting that he himself had almost taken part in the fighting on the barricades this was one of the most grateful recollections of his youth he had an independent property of about a thousand souls to reckon in the old style his splendid estate lay on the outskirts of our little town and bordered on the lands of our famous monastery with which pyotr alexandrovitch began an endless lawsuit almost as soon as he came into the estate concerning the rights of fishing in the river or wood-cutting in the forest i don't know exactly which he regarded it as his duty as a citizen and a man of culture to open an attack upon the clericals hearing all about adelaida ivanovna whom he of course remembered and in whom he had at one time been interested and learning of the existence of mitya he intervened in spite of all his youthful indignation and contempt for fyodor pavlovitch he made the latter's acquaintance for the first time and told him directly that he wished to undertake the child's education he used long afterwards to tell as a characteristic touch that when he began to speak of mitya fyodor pavlovitch looked for some time as though he did not understand what child he was talking about and even as though he was surprised to hear that he had a little son in the house the story may have been exaggerated yet it must have been something like the truth fyodor pavlovitch was all his life fond of acting of suddenly playing an unexpected part sometimes without any motive for doing so and even to his own direct disadvantage as for instance in the present case this habit however is characteristic of a very great number of people some of them very clever ones not like fyodor pavlovitch pyotr alexandrovitch carried the business through vigorously and was appointed with fyodor pavlovitch joint guardian of the child who had a small property a house and land left him by his mother mitya did in fact pass into his cousin's keeping but as the latter had no family of his own and after securing the revenues of his estates was in haste to return at once to paris he left the boy in charge of one of his cousins a lady living in moscow it came to pass that settling permanently in paris he too forgot the child 
especially when the revolution of february broke out making an impression on his mind that he remembered all the rest of his life the moscow lady died and mitya passed into the care of one of her married daughters i believe he changed his home a fourth time later on i won't enlarge upon that now as i shall have much to tell later of fyodor pavlovitch's first-born and must confine myself now to the most essential facts about him without which i could not begin my story in the first place this mitya or rather dmitri fyodorovitch was the only one of fyodor pavlovitch's three sons who grew up in the belief that he had property and that he would be independent on coming of age he spent an irregular boyhood and youth he did not finish his studies at the gymnasium he got into a military school then went to the caucasus was promoted fought a duel and was degraded to the ranks earned promotion again led a wild life and spent a good deal of money he did not begin to receive any income from fyodor pavlovitch until he came of age and until then got into debt he saw and knew his father fyodor pavlovitch for the first time on coming of age when he visited our neighbourhood on purpose to settle with him about his property he seems not to have liked his father he did not stay long with him and made haste to get away having only succeeded in obtaining a sum of money and entering into an agreement for future payments from the estate of the revenues and value of which he was unable a fact worthy of note upon this occasion to get a statement from his father fyodor pavlovitch remarked for the first time then this too should be noted that mitya had a vague and exaggerated idea of his property fyodor pavlovitch was very well satisfied with this as it fell in with his own designs he gathered only that the young man was frivolous unruly of violent passions impatient and dissipated and that if he could only obtain ready money he would be satisfied although only of course for a short time so fyodor pavlovitch began to take advantage of this fact sending him from time to time small doles installments in the end when four years later mitya losing patience came a second time to our little town to settle up once for all with his father it turned out to his amazement that he had nothing that it was difficult to get an account even that he had received the whole value of his property in sums of money from fyodor pavlovitch and was perhaps even in debt to him that by various agreements into which he had of his own desire entered at various previous dates he had no right to expect anything more and so on and so on the young man was overwhelmed suspected deceit and cheating and was almost beside himself and indeed this circumstance led to the catastrophe the account of which forms the subject of my first introductory story or rather the external side of it but before i pass to that story i must say a little of fyodor pavlovitch's other two sons and of their origin end of section two section three of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book one chapter three the second marriage and the second family very shortly after getting his four-year-old mitya off his hands fyodor pavlovitch married a second time his second marriage lasted eight years he took this second wife sophia ivanovna also a very young girl from another province where he had gone upon some small piece of business in company with a jew though fyodor pavlovitch was a drunkard and a vicious debauchee he never neglected investing his capital and managed his business affairs very successfully though no doubt not over scrupulously sophia ivanovna was the daughter of an obscure deacon and was left from childhood an orphan without relations 
she grew up in the house of a general's widow a wealthy old lady of good position who was at once her benefactress and tormentor i do not know the details but i have only heard that the orphan girl a meek and gentle creature was once cut down from a halter in which she was hanging from a nail in the loft so terrible were her sufferings from the caprice and everlasting nagging of this old woman who was apparently not bad-hearted but had become an insufferable tyrant through idleness fyodor pavlovitch made her an offer inquiries were made about him and he was refused but again as in his first marriage he proposed an elopement to the orphan girl there is very little doubt that she would not on any account have married him if she had known a little more about him in time but she lived in another province besides what could a little girl of sixteen know about it except that she would be better at the bottom of the river than remaining with her benefactress so the poor child exchanged a benefactress for a benefactor fyodor pavlovitch did not get a penny this time for the general's widow was furious she gave them nothing and cursed them both but he had not reckoned on a dowry what allured him was the remarkable beauty of the innocent girl above all her innocent appearance which had a peculiar attraction for a vicious profligate who had hitherto admired only the coarser types of feminine beauty those innocent eyes slit my soul up like a razor he used to say afterwards with his loathsome snigger in a man so depraved this might of course mean no more than sensual attraction as he had received no dowry with his wife and had so to speak taken her from the halter he did not stand on ceremony with her making her feel that she had wronged him he took advantage of her phenomenal meekness and submissiveness to trample on the elementary decencies of marriage he gathered loose women into his house and carried on orgies of debauchery in his wife's presence to show what a pass things had come to i may mention that grigory the gloomy stupid obstinate argumentative servant who had always hated his first mistress adelaida ivanovna took the side of his new mistress he championed her cause abusing fyodor pavlovitch in a manner little befitting a servant and on one occasion broke up the revels and drove all the disorderly women out of the house in the end this unhappy young woman kept in terror from her childhood fell into that kind of nervous disease which is most frequently found in peasant women who are said to be possessed by devils at times after terrible fits of hysterics she even lost her reason yet she bore fyodor pavlovitch two sons ivan and alexey the eldest in the first year of marriage and the second three years later when she died little alexey was in his fourth year and strange as it seems i know that he remembered his mother all his life like a dream of course at her death almost exactly the same thing happened to the two little boys as to their elder brother mitya they were completely forgotten and abandoned by their father they were looked after by the same grigory and lived in his cottage where they were found by the tyrannical old lady who had brought up their mother she was still alive and had not all those eight years forgotten the insult done her all that time she was obtaining exact information as to her sophia's manner of life and hearing of her illness and hideous surroundings she declared aloud two or three times to her retainers it serves her right god has punished her for her ingratitude exactly three months after sophia ivanovna's death the general's widow suddenly appeared in our town and went straight to fyodor pavlovitch's house she spent only half an hour in the town but she did a great deal it was evening fyodor pavlovitch whom she had not seen for those eight years came in to her drunk the story is that instantly upon seeing him without any sort of explanation she gave him two good resounding slaps on the face seized him by a tuft of hair and shook him three times up and down then without a word she went straight to the cottage to the two boys 
seeing at the first glance that they were unwashed and in dirty linen she promptly gave grigory too a box on the ear and announcing that she would carry off both the children she wrapped them just as they were in a rug put them in the carriage and drove off to her own town grigory accepted the blow like a devoted slave without a word and when he escorted the old lady to her carriage he made her a low bow and pronounced impressively that god would repay her for the orphans you are a blockhead all the same the old lady shouted to him as she drove away fyodor pavlovitch thinking it over decided that it was a good thing and did not refuse the general's widow his formal consent to any proposition in regard to his children's education as for the slaps she had given him he drove all over the town telling the story it happened that the old lady died soon after this but she left the boys in her will a thousand roubles each for their instruction and so that all be spent on them exclusively with the condition that it be so portioned out as to last till they are twenty-one for it is more than adequate provision for such children if other people think fit to throw away their money let them i have not read the will myself but i heard there was something queer of the sort very whimsically expressed the principal heir yefim petrovitch polyanov the marshal of nobility of the province turned out however to be an honest man writing to fyodor pavlovitch and discerning at once that he could extract nothing from him for his children's education though the latter never directly refused but only procrastinated as he always did in such cases and was indeed at times effusively sentimental yefim petrovitch took a personal interest in the orphans he became especially fond of the younger alexey who lived for a long while as one of his family i beg the reader to note this from the beginning and to yefim petrovitch a man of a generosity and humanity rarely to be met with the young people were more indebted for their education and bringing up than to any one he kept the two thousand roubles left to them by the general's widow intact so that by the time they came of age their portions had been doubled by the accumulation of interest he educated them both at his own expense and certainly spent far more than a thousand roubles upon each of them i won't enter into a detailed account of their boyhood and youth but will only mention a few of the most important events of the elder ivan i will only say that he grew into a somewhat morose and reserved though far from timid boy at ten years old he had realized that they were living not in their own home but on other people's charity and that their father was a man of whom it was disgraceful to speak this boy began very early almost in his infancy so they say at least to show a brilliant and unusual aptitude for learning i don't know precisely why but he left the family of yefim petrovitch when he was hardly thirteen entering a moscow gymnasium and boarding with an experienced and celebrated teacher an old friend of yefim petrovitch ivan used to declare afterwards that this was all due to the ardour for good works of yefim petrovitch who was captivated by the idea that the boy's genius should be trained by a teacher of genius but neither yefim petrovitch nor this teacher was living when the young man finished at the gymnasium and entered the university as yefim petrovitch had made no provision for the payment of the tyrannical old lady's legacy which had grown from one thousand to two it was delayed owing to formalities inevitable in russia and the young man was in great straits for the first two years at the university as he was forced to keep himself all the time he was studying it must be noted that he did not even attempt to communicate with his father perhaps from pride from contempt for him or perhaps from his cool common sense which told him that from such a father he would get no real assistance however that may have been the young man was by no means despondent and succeeded in getting work 
at first giving sixpenny lessons and afterwards getting paragraphs on street incidents into the newspapers under the signature of eye-witness these paragraphs it was said were so interesting and piquant that they were soon taken this alone showed the young man's practical and intellectual superiority over the masses of needy and unfortunate students of both sexes who hang about the offices of the newspapers and journals unable to think of anything better than everlasting entreaties for copying and translations from the french having once got into touch with the editors ivan fyodorovitch always kept up his connection with them and in his latter years at the university he published brilliant reviews of books upon various special subjects so that he became well known in literary circles but only in his last year he suddenly succeeded in attracting the attention of a far wider circle of readers so that a great many people noticed and remembered him it was rather a curious incident when he had just left the university and was preparing to go abroad upon his two thousand roubles ivan fyodorovitch published in one of the more important journals a strange article which attracted general notice on a subject of which he might have been supposed to know nothing as he was a student of natural science the article dealt with a subject which was being debated everywhere at the time the position of the ecclesiastical courts after discussing several opinions on the subject he went on to explain his own view what was most striking about the article was its tone and its unexpected conclusion many of the church party regarded him unquestioningly as on their side and yet not only the secularists but even atheists joined them in their applause finally some sagacious persons opined that the article was nothing but an impudent satirical burlesque i mention this incident particularly because this article penetrated into the famous monastery in our neighbourhood where the inmates being particularly interested in the question of the ecclesiastical courts were completely bewildered by it learning the author's name they were interested in his being a native of the town and the son of that fyodor pavlovitch and just then it was that the author himself made his appearance among us why ivan fyodorovitch had come amongst us i remember asking myself at the time with a certain uneasiness this fateful visit which was the first step leading to so many consequences i never fully explained to myself it seemed strange on the face of it that a young man so learned so proud and apparently so cautious should suddenly visit such an infamous house and a father who had ignored him all his life hardly knew him never thought of him and would not under any circumstances have given him money though he was always afraid that his sons ivan and alexey would also come to ask him for it and here the young man was staying in the house of such a father had been living with him for two months and they were on the best possible terms this last fact was a special cause of wonder to many others as well as to me Pyotr Alexandrovitch Musov, of whom we have spoken already, the cousin of Fyodor Pavlovitch's first wife, happened to be in the neighborhood again on a visit to his estate. He had come from Paris, which was his permanent home. I remember that he was more surprised than any one when he made the acquaintance of the young man, who interested him extremely, and with whom he sometimes argued, and not without an inner pang compared himself in acquirements he is proud he used to say he will never be in want of pence he has got money enough to go abroad now what does he want here every one can see that he hasn't come for money for his father would never give him any he has no taste for drink and dissipation and yet his father can't do without him they get on so well together that was the truth 
the young man had an unmistakable influence over his father who positively appeared to be behaving more decently and even seemed at times ready to obey his son though often extremely and even spitefully perverse it was only later that we learned that ivan had come partly at the request of and in the interests of his elder brother dmitri whom he saw for the first time on this very visit though he had before leaving moscow been in correspondence with him about an important matter of more concern to dmitri than himself what that business was the reader will learn fully in due time yet even when i did know of this special circumstance i still felt ivan fyodorovitch to be an enigmatic figure and thought his visit rather mysterious i may add that ivan appeared at the time in the light of a mediator between his father and his elder brother dmitri who was in open quarrel with his father and even planning to bring an action against him the family i repeat was now united for the first time and some of its members met for the first time in their lives the younger brother alexey had been a year already among us having been the first of the three to arrive it is of that brother alexey i find it most difficult to speak in this introduction yet i must give some preliminary account of him if only to explain one queer fact which is that i have to introduce my hero to the reader wearing the cassock of a novice yes he had been for the last year in our monastery and seemed willing to be cloistered there for the rest of his life End of section three. Section four of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book one, chapter four. The third son, Alyosha. He was only twenty. His brother Ivan was in his twenty-fourth year at the time, while their elder brother Dmitri was twenty-seven first of all i must explain that this young man alyosha was not a fanatic and in my opinion at least was not even a mystic i may as well give my full opinion from the beginning he was simply an early lover of humanity and that he adopted the monastic life was simply because at that time it struck him so to say as the ideal escape for his soul struggling from the darkness of worldly wickedness to the light of love and the reason this life struck him in this way was that he found in it at that time as he thought an extraordinary being our celebrated elder zasima to whom he became attached with all the warm first love of his ardent heart but i do not dispute that he was very strange even at that time and had been so indeed from his cradle i have mentioned already by the way that though he lost his mother in his fourth year he remembered her all his life her face her caresses as though she stood living before me such memories may persist as every one knows from an even earlier age even from two years old but scarcely standing out through a whole lifetime like spots of light out of darkness like a corner torn out of a huge picture which has all faded and disappeared except that fragment that is how it was with him he remembered one still summer evening an open window the slanting rays of the setting sun that he recalled most vividly of all in a corner of the room the holy image before it a lighted lamp and on her knees before the image his mother sobbing hysterically with cries and moans snatching him up in both arms squeezing him close till it hurt and praying for him to the mother of god holding him out in both arms to the image as though to put him under the mother's protection and suddenly a nurse runs in and snatches him from her in terror that was the picture and alyosha remembered his mother's face at that minute he used to say that it was frenzied but beautiful as he remembered 
but he rarely cared to speak of this memory to any one in his childhood and youth he was by no means expansive and talked little indeed but not from shyness or a sullen unsociability quite the contrary from something different from a sort of inner preoccupation entirely personal and unconcerned with other people but so important to him that he seemed as it were to forget others on account of it but he was fond of people he seemed throughout his life to put implicit trust in people yet no one ever looked on him as a simpleton or naive person there was something about him which made one feel at once and it was so all his life afterwards that he did not care to be a judge of others that he would never take it upon himself to criticize and would never condemn any one for anything he seemed indeed to accept everything without the least condemnation though often grieving bitterly and this was so much so that no one could surprise or frighten him even in his earliest youth coming at twenty to his father's house which was a very sink of filthy debauchery he chaste and pure as he was simply withdrew in silence when to look on was unbearable but without the slightest sign of contempt or condemnation his father who had once been in a dependent position and so was sensitive and ready to take offence met him at first with distrust and sullenness he does not say much he used to say and thinks the more but soon within a fortnight indeed he took to embracing him and kissing him terribly often with drunken tears with sottish sentimentality yet he evidently felt a real and deep affection for him such as he had never been capable of feeling for any one before every one indeed loved this young man wherever he went and it was so from his earliest childhood when he entered the household of his patron and benefactor yefim petrovitch polyanov he gained the hearts of all the family so that they looked on him quite as their own child yet he entered the house at such a tender age that he could not have acted from design nor artfulness in winning affection so that the gift of making himself loved directly and unconsciously was inherent in him in his very nature so to speak it was the same at school though he seemed to be just one of those children who are distrusted sometimes ridiculed and even disliked by their schoolfellows he was dreamy for instance and rather solitary from his earliest childhood he was fond of creeping into a corner to read and yet he was a general favorite all the while he was at school he was rarely playful or merry but any one could see at the first glance that this was not from any sullenness on the contrary he was bright and good-tempered he never tried to show off among his schoolfellows perhaps because of this he was never afraid of any one yet the boys immediately understood that he was not proud of his fearlessness and seemed to be unaware that he was bold and courageous he never resented an insult it would happen that an hour after the offence he would address the offender or answer some question with as trustful and candid an expression as though nothing had happened between them and it was not that he seemed to have forgotten or intentionally forgiven the affront but simply that he did not regard it as an affront and this completely conquered and captivated the boys he had one characteristic which made all his schoolfellows from the bottom class to the top want to mock at him not from malice but because it amused them this characteristic was a wild fanatical modesty and chastity he could not bear to hear certain words and certain conversations about women there are certain words and conversations unhappily impossible to eradicate in schools boys pure in mind and heart almost children are fond of talking in school among themselves and even aloud of things pictures and images of which even soldiers would sometimes hesitate to speak more than that much that soldiers have no knowledge or conception of 
is familiar to quite young children of our intellectual and higher classes there is no moral depravity no real corrupt inner cynicism in it but there is the appearance of it and it is often looked upon among them as something refined subtle daring and worthy of imitation seeing that alyosha karamazov put his fingers in his ears when they talked of that they used sometimes to crowd round him pull his hands away and shout nastiness into both ears while he struggled slipped to the floor tried to hide himself without uttering one word of abuse enduring their insults in silence but at last they left him alone and gave up taunting him with being a regular girl and what's more they looked upon it with compassion as a weakness he was always one of the best in the class but was never first at the time of yefim petrovitch's death alyosha had two more years to complete at the provincial gymnasium the inconsolable widow went almost immediately after his death for a long visit to italy with her whole family which consisted only of women and girls Alyosha went to live in the house of two distant relations of Yefim Petrovitch, ladies whom he had never seen before. On what terms he lived with them, he did not know himself. It was very characteristic of him, indeed, that he never cared at whose expense he was living. In that respect, he was a striking contrast to his elder brother Ivan, who struggled with poverty for his first two years in the university maintained himself by his own efforts and had from childhood been bitterly conscious of living at the expense of his benefactor but this strange trait in alyosha's character must not i think be criticized too severely for at the slightest acquaintance with him any one would have perceived that alyosha was one of those youths almost of the type of religious enthusiast who if they were suddenly to come into possession of a large fortune would not hesitate to give it away for the asking either for good works or perhaps to a clever rogue in general he seemed scarcely to know the value of money not of course in a literal sense when he was given pocket money which he never asked for he was either terribly careless of it so that it was gone in a moment or he kept it for weeks together not knowing what to do with it in later years pyotr alexandrovitch Musov, a man very sensitive on the score of money and bourgeois honesty pronounced the following judgment after getting to know alyosha here is perhaps the one man in the world whom you might leave alone without a penny in the centre of an unknown town of a million inhabitants and he would not come to harm he would not die of cold and hunger for he would be fed and sheltered at once and if he were not he would find a shelter for himself and it would cost him no effort or humiliation and to shelter him would be no burden but on the contrary would probably be looked on as a pleasure he did not finish his studies at the gymnasium a year before the end of the course he suddenly announced to the ladies that he was going to see his father about a plan which had occurred to him they were sorry and unwilling to let him go the journey was not an expensive one and the ladies would not let him pawn his watch a parting present from his benefactor's family they provided him liberally with money and even fitted him out with new clothes and linen but he returned half the money they gave him saying that he intended to go third class on his arrival in the town he made no answer to his father's first inquiry why he had come before completing his studies and seemed so they say unusually thoughtful it soon became apparent that he was looking for his mother's tomb he practically acknowledged at the time that that was the only object of his visit but it can hardly have been the whole reason of it it is more probable that he himself did not understand and could not explain what had suddenly arisen in his soul and drawn him irresistibly into a new unknown but inevitable path 
fyodor pavlovitch could not show him where his second wife was buried for he had never visited her grave since he had thrown earth upon her coffin and in the course of years had entirely forgotten where she was buried fyodor pavlovitch by the way had for some time previously not been living in our town three or four years after his wife's death he had gone to the south of russia and finally turned up in odessa where he spent several years he made the acquaintance at first in his own words of a lot of low jews jewesses and jukins and ended by being received by jews high and low alike it may be presumed that at this period he developed a peculiar faculty for making and hoarding money he finally returned to our town only three years before alyosha's arrival his former acquaintances found him looking terribly aged although he was by no means an old man he behaved not exactly with more dignity but with more effrontery the former buffoon showed an insolent propensity for making buffoons of others his depravity with women was not simply what it used to be but even more revolting in a short time he opened a great number of new taverns in the district it was evident that he had perhaps a hundred thousand roubles or not much less many of the inhabitants of the town and district were soon in his debt and of course had given good security of late too he looked somehow bloated and seemed more irresponsible more uneven had sunk into a sort of incoherence used to begin one thing and go on with another as though he were letting himself go altogether he was more and more frequently drunk and if it had not been for the same servant grigory who by that time had aged considerably too and used to look after him sometimes almost like a tutor fyodor pavlovitch might have gotten into terrible scrapes alyosha's arrival seemed to affect even his moral side as though something had awakened in this prematurely old man which had long been dead in his soul do you know he used often to say looking at alyosha that you are like her the crazy woman that was what he used to call his dead wife alyosha's mother grigory it was who pointed out the crazy woman's grave to alyosha he took him to our town cemetery and showed him in a remote corner a cast-iron tombstone cheap but decently kept on which were inscribed the name and age of the deceased and the date of her death and below a four-lined verse such as are commonly used on old-fashioned middle-class tombs to alyosha's amazement this tomb turned out to be grigory's doing he had put it up on the poor crazy woman's grave at his own expense after fyodor pavlovitch whom he had often pestered about the grave had gone to odessa abandoning the grave and all his memories alyosha showed no particular emotion at the sight of his mother's grave he only listened to grigory's minute and solemn account of the erection of the tomb he stood with bowed head and walked away without uttering a word it was perhaps a year before he visited the cemetery again but this little episode was not without an influence upon fyodor pavlovitch and a very original one he suddenly took a thousand roubles to our monastery to pay for requiems for the soul of his wife but not for the second alyosha's mother the crazy woman but for the first adalaida ivanovna who used to thrash him in the evening of the same day he got drunk and abused the monks to alyosha he himself was far from being religious he had probably never put a penny candle before the image of a saint strange impulses of sudden feeling and sudden thought are common in such types i have mentioned already that he looked bloated his countenance at this time bore traces of something that testified unmistakably to the life he had led besides the long fleshy bags under his little always insolent suspicious and ironical eyes besides the multitude of deep wrinkles in his little fat face 
the adam's apple hung below his sharp chin like a great fleshy goiter which gave him a peculiar repulsive sensual appearance add to that a long rapacious mouth with full lips between which could be seen little stumps of black decayed teeth he slobbered every time he began to speak he was fond indeed of making fun of his own face though i believe he was well satisfied with it he used particularly to point to his nose which was not very large but very delicate and conspicuously aquiline a regular roman nose he used to say with my goiter i've quite the countenance of an ancient roman patrician of the decadent period he seemed proud of it not long after visiting his mother's grave alyosha suddenly announced that he wanted to enter the monastery and that the monks were willing to receive him as a novice he explained that this was his strong desire and that he was solemnly asking his consent as his father the old man knew that the elder sasima who was living in the monastery hermitage had made a special impression upon his gentle boy that is the most honest monk among them of course he observed after listening in thoughtful silence to alyosha and seeming scarcely surprised at his request hm. so that's where you want to be my gentle boy he was half drunk and suddenly he grinned his slow half drunken grin which was not without a certain cunning and tipsy slyness hm. i had a presentiment that you would end in something like this would you believe it you were making straight for it well to be sure you have your own two thousand that's a dowry for you and i'll never desert you my angel and i'll pay what's wanted for you there if they ask for it but of course if they don't ask why should we worry them what do you say you know you spend money like a canary two grains a week hmm. do you know that near one monastery there's a place outside the town where every baby knows there are none but the monks wives living as they are called thirty women i believe i have been there myself you know it's interesting in its own way of course as a variety the worst of it is it's awfully russian there are no french women there of course they could get them fast enough they have plenty of money if they get to hear of it they'll come along well there's nothing of that sort here no monks wives and two hundred monks they're honest they keep the fasts i admit it hmm. so you want to be a monk and do you know i'm sorry to lose you alyosha would you believe it i've really grown fond of you well it's a good opportunity you'll pray for us sinners we have sinned too much here i have always been thinking who would pray for me and whether there's any one in the world to do it my dear boy i'm awfully stupid about that you wouldn't believe it awfully you see however stupid i am about it i keep thinking i keep thinking from time to time of course not all the while it's impossible i think for the devils to forget to drag me down to hell with their hooks when i die then i wonder hooks where would they get them what of iron hooks where do they forge them have they a foundry there of some sort the monks in the monastery probably believe that there's a ceiling in hell for instance now i'm ready to believe in hell but without a ceiling it makes it more refined more enlightened more lutheran that is and after all what does it matter whether it has a ceiling or hasn't but do you know there's a damnable question involved in it if there's no ceiling there can be no hooks and if there are no hooks it all breaks down which is unlikely again for then there would be none to drag me down to hell and if they don't drag me down what justice is there in the world il faudrait les inventer those hooks on purpose for me alone for if you only knew alyosha what a blackguard i am 
but there are no hooks there said alyosha looking gently and seriously at his father yes yes only the shadows of hooks i know i know that's how a frenchman described hell j'ai bu l'ombre d'un cocher qui avec l'ombre d'une brasse frappe l'ombre d'une carrosse how do you know there are no hooks darling when you've lived with the monks you will sing a different tune but go and get at the truth there and then come and tell me anyway it's easier going to the other world if one knows what there is there besides it will be more seemly for you with the monks than here with me with a drunken old man and young harlots though you're like an angel nothing touches you and i dare say nothing will touch you there that's why i let you go because i hope for that you've got all your wits about you you will burn and you will burn out you will be healed and come back again and i will wait for you i feel that you're the only creature in the world who has not condemned me my dear boy i feel it you know i can't help feeling it and he even began blubbering he was sentimental he was wicked and sentimental end of section four section five of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book one chapter five elders some of my readers may imagine that my young man was a sickly ecstatic poorly developed creature a pale consumptive dreamer on the contrary alyosha was at this time a well-grown red-cheeked clear-eyed lad of nineteen radiant with health he was very handsome too graceful moderately tall with hair of a dark brown with a regular rather long oval-shaped face and wide-set dark gray shining eyes he was very thoughtful and apparently very serene i shall be told perhaps that red cheeks are not incompatible with fanaticism and mysticism but i fancy that alyosha was more of a realist than any one oh no doubt in the monastery he fully believed in miracles but to my thinking miracles are never a stumbling block to the realist it is not miracles that dispose realists to belief the genuine realist if he is an unbeliever will always find strength and ability to disbelieve in the miraculous and if he is confronted with a miracle as an irrefutable fact he would rather disbelieve his own senses than admit the fact even if he admits it he admits it as a fact of nature till then unrecognized by him faith does not in the realist spring from the miracle but the miracle from faith if the realist once believes then he is bound by his very realism to admit the miraculous also the apostle thomas said that he would not believe till he saw but when he did see he said my lord and my god was it the miracle forced him to believe most likely not but he believed solely because he desired to believe and possibly he fully believed in his secret heart even when he said i do not believe till i see i shall be told perhaps that alyosha was stupid undeveloped had not finished his studies and so on that he did not finish his studies is true but to say that he was stupid or dull would be a great injustice i'll simply repeat what i have said above he entered upon this path only because at that time it alone struck his imagination and presented itself to him as offering an ideal means of escape for his soul from darkness to light add to that that he was to some extent a youth of our last epoch that is honest in nature desiring the truth seeking for it and believing in it and seeking to serve it at once with all the strength of his soul seeking for immediate action and ready to sacrifice everything life itself for it 
though these young men unhappily fail to understand that the sacrifice of life is in many cases the easiest of all sacrifices and that to sacrifice for instance five or six years of their seething youth to hard and tedious study if only to multiply tenfold their powers of serving the truth and the cause they have set before them as their goal such a sacrifice is utterly beyond the strength of many of them the path alyosha chose was a path going in the opposite direction but he chose it with the same thirst for swift achievement as soon as he reflected seriously he was convinced of the existence of god and immortality and at once he instinctively said to himself i want to live for immortality and i will accept no compromise in the same way if he had decided that god and immortality did not exist he would at once have become an atheist and a socialist for socialism is not merely the labor question it is before all things the atheistic question the question of the form taken by atheism today the question of the tower of babel built without god not to mount to heaven from earth but to set up heaven on earth alyosha would have found it strange and impossible to go on living as before it is written give all that thou hast to the poor and follow me if thou wouldst be perfect alyosha said to himself i can't give two roubles instead of all and only go to mass instead of following him perhaps his memories of childhood brought back our monastery to which his mother may have taken him to mass perhaps the slanting sunlight and the holy image to which his poor crazy mother had held him up still acted upon his imagination brooding on these things he may have come to us perhaps only to see whether here he could sacrifice all or only two roubles and in the monastery he met this elder i must digress to explain what an elder is in russian monasteries and i am sorry that i do not feel very competent to do so i will try however to give a superficial account of it in a few words authorities on the subject assert that the institution of elders is of recent date not more than a hundred years old in our monasteries though in the orthodox east especially in sinai and athos it has existed over a thousand years it is maintained that it existed in ancient times in russia also but through the calamities which overtook russia the tartars civil war the interruption of relations with the east after the destruction of constantinople this institution fell into oblivion it was revived among us towards the end of the last century by one of the great ascetics as they called him paisi velichkovsky and his disciples but to this day it exists in few monasteries only and has sometimes been almost persecuted as an innovation in russia it flourished especially in the celebrated kozelsky optin monastery when and how it was introduced into our monastery i cannot say there had already been three such elders and zasima was the last of them but he was almost dying of weakness and disease and they had no one to take his place the question for our monastery was an important one for it had not been distinguished by anything in particular till then they had neither relics of saints nor wonder-working icons nor glorious traditions nor historical exploits it had flourished and been glorious all over russia through its elders to see and hear whom pilgrims had flocked for thousands of miles from all parts what was such an elder an elder was one who took your soul your will into his soul and his will when you choose an elder you renounce your own will and yield it to him in complete submission complete self-abnegation this novitiate this terrible school of abnegation is undertaken voluntarily in the hope of self-conquest of self-mastery in order after a life of obedience to attain perfect freedom that is from self 
to escape the lot of those who have lived their whole life without finding their true selves in themselves this institution of elders is not founded on theory but was established in the east from the practice of a thousand years the obligations due to an elder are not the ordinary obedience which has always existed in our russian monasteries the obligation involves confession to the elder by all who have submitted themselves to him and to the indissoluble bond between him and them the story is told for instance that in the early days of christianity one such novice failing to fulfil some command laid upon him by his elder left his monastery in syria and went to egypt there after great exploits he was found worthy at last to suffer torture and a martyr's death for the faith when the church regarding him as a saint was burying him suddenly at the deacon's exhortation depart all ye unbaptized the coffin containing the martyr's body left its place and was cast forth from the church and this took place three times and only at last they learnt that this holy man had broken his vow of obedience and left his elder and therefore could not be forgiven without the elder's absolution in spite of his great deeds only after this could the funeral take place this of course is only an old legend but here is a recent instance a monk was suddenly commanded by his elder to quit athos which he loved as a sacred place and a haven of refuge and to go first to jerusalem to do homage to the holy places and then to go to the north to siberia there is the place for thee and not here the monk overwhelmed with sorrow went to the ecumenical patriarch at constantinople and besought him to release him from his obedience but the patriarch replied that not only was he unable to release him but there was not and could not be on earth a power which could release him except the elder who had himself laid that duty upon him in this way the elders are endowed in certain cases with unbounded and inexplicable authority that is why in many of our monasteries the institution was at first resisted almost to persecution meantime the elders immediately began to be highly esteemed among the people masses of the ignorant people as well as men of distinction flocked for instance to the elders of our monastery to confess their doubts their sins and their sufferings and ask for counsel and admonition seeing this the opponents of the elders declared that the sacrament of confession was being arbitrarily and frivolously degraded though the continual opening of the heart to the elder by the monk or the layman had nothing of the character of the sacrament in the end however the institution of elders has been retained and is becoming established in russian monasteries it is true perhaps that this instrument which had stood the test of a thousand years for the moral regeneration of a man from slavery to freedom and to moral perfectibility may be a two-edged weapon and it may lead some not to humility and complete self-control but to the most satanic pride that is to bondage and not to freedom the elder zosima was sixty-five he came of a family of landowners had been in the army in early youth and served in the caucasus as an officer he had no doubt impressed alyosha by some peculiar quality of his soul alyosha lived in the cell of the elder who was very fond of him and let him wait upon him it must be noted that alyosha was bound by no obligation and could go where he pleased and be absent for whole days though he wore the monastic dress it was voluntarily not to be different from others no doubt he liked to do so possibly his youthful imagination was deeply stirred by the power and fame of his elder it was said that so many people had for years past come to confess their sins to father zosima and to entreat him for words of advice and healing that he had acquired the keenest intuition and could tell from an unknown face 
what a newcomer wanted and what was the suffering on his conscience he sometimes astounded and almost alarmed his visitors by his knowledge of their secrets before they had spoken a word alyosha noticed that many almost all went into the elder for the first time with apprehension and uneasiness but came out with bright and happy faces alyosha was particularly struck by the fact that father zosima was not at all stern on the contrary he was almost always gay the monks used to say that he was more drawn to those who were more sinful and the greater the sinner the more he loved him there were no doubt up to the end of his life among the monks some who hated and envied him but they were few in number and they were silent though among them were some of great dignity in the monastery one for instance of the older monks distinguished for his strict keeping of fasts and vows of silence but the majority were on father zosima's side and very many of them loved him with all their hearts warmly and sincerely some were almost fanatically devoted to him and declared though not quite aloud that he was a saint that there could be no doubt of it and seeing that his end was near they anticipated miracles and great glory to the monastery in the immediate future from his relics alyosha had unquestioning faith in the miraculous power of the elder just as he had unquestioning faith in the story of the coffin that flew out of the church he saw many who came with sick children or relatives and besought the elder to lay hands on them and to pray over them return shortly after some the next day and falling in tears at the elder's feet thank him for healing their sick whether they had really been healed or were simply better in the natural course of the disease was a question which did not exist for alyosha for he fully believed in the spiritual power of his teacher and rejoiced in his fame in his glory as though it were his own triumph his heart throbbed and he beamed as it were all over when the elder came out to the gates of the hermitage into the waiting crowd of pilgrims of the humbler class who had flocked from all parts of russia on purpose to see the elder and obtain his blessing they fell down before him wept kissed his feet kissed the earth on which he stood and wailed while the women held up their children to him and brought him the sick possessed with devils the elder spoke to them read a brief prayer over them blessed them and dismissed them of late he had become so weak through attacks of illness that he was sometimes unable to leave his cell and the pilgrims waited for him to come out for several days alyosha did not wonder why they loved him so why they fell down before him and wept with emotion merely at seeing his face oh he understood that for the humble soul of the russian peasant worn out by grief and toil and still more by the everlasting injustice and everlasting sin his own and the world's it was the greatest need and comfort to find some one or something holy to fall down before and worship among us there is sin injustice and temptation but yet somewhere on earth there is some one holy and exalted he has the truth he knows the truth so it is not dead upon the earth so it will come one day to us too and rule over all the earth according to the promise alyosha knew that this was just how the people felt and even reasoned he understood it but that the elder zosima was this saint and custodian of god's truth of that he had no more doubt than the weeping peasants and the sick women who held out their children to the elder the conviction that after his death the elder would bring extraordinary glory to the monastery was even stronger in alyosha than in any one there and of late a kind of deep flame of inner ecstasy burnt more and more strongly in his heart he was not at all troubled at this elder standing as a solitary example before him no matter he is holy 
he carries in his heart the secret of renewal for all that power which will at last establish truth on the earth and all men will be holy and love one another and there will be no more rich nor poor no exalted nor humbled but all will be as the children of god and the true kingdom of christ will come that was the dream in Alyosha's heart the arrival of his two brothers whom he had not known till then seemed to make a great impression on alyosha he more quickly made friends with his half-brother dmitri though he arrived later than with his own brother ivan he was extremely interested in his brother ivan but when the latter had been two months in the town though they had met fairly often they were still not intimate alyosha was naturally silent and he seemed to be expecting something ashamed about something while his brother ivan though alyosha noticed at first that he looked long and curiously at him seemed soon to have left off thinking of him alyosha noticed it with some embarrassment he ascribed his brother's indifference at first to the disparity of their age and education but he also wondered whether the absence of curiosity and sympathy in ivan might be due to some other cause entirely unknown to him he kept fancying that ivan was absorbed in something something inward and important that he was striving towards some goal perhaps very hard to attain and that that was why he had no thought for him alyosha wondered too whether there was not some contempt on the part of the learned atheist for him a foolish novice he knew for certain that his brother was an atheist he could not take offence at this contempt if it existed yet with an uneasy embarrassment which he did not himself understand he waited for his brother to come nearer to him dmitri used to speak of ivan with the deepest respect and with the peculiar earnestness from him alyosha learnt all the details of the important affair which had of late formed such a close and remarkable bond between the two elder brothers dmitri's enthusiastic references to ivan were the more striking in alyosha's eyes since dmitri was compared with ivan almost uneducated and the two brothers were such a contrast in personality and character that it would be difficult to find two men more unlike it was at this time that the meeting or rather gathering of the members of this inharmonious family took place in the cell of the elder who had such an extraordinary influence on alyosha the pretext for this gathering was a false one it was at this time that the discord between dmitri and his father seemed at its acutest stage and their relations had become insufferably strained fyodor pavlovitch seems to have been the first to suggest apparently in joke that they should all meet in father zosima's cell and that without appealing to his direct intervention they might more decently come to an understanding under the conciliating influence of the elder's presence dmitri who had never seen the elder naturally supposed that his father was trying to intimidate him but as he secretly blamed himself for his outbursts of temper with his father on several recent occasions he accepted the challenge it must be noted that he was not like ivan staying with his father but living apart at the other end of the town it happened that pyotr alexandrovitch Musov, who was staying in the district at the time caught eagerly at the idea a liberal of the forties and fifties a free thinker and atheist he may have been led on by boredom or the hope of frivolous diversion he was suddenly seized with the desire to see the monastery and the holy man as his lawsuit with the monastery still dragged on he made it the pretext for seeing the superior in order to attempt to settle it amicably a visitor coming with such laudable intentions might be received with more attention and consideration than if he came from simple curiosity 
influences from within the monastery were brought to bear on the elder who of late had scarcely left his cell and had been forced by illness to deny even his ordinary visitors in the end he consented to see them and the day was fixed who has made me a judge over them was all he said smilingly to alyosha alyosha was much perturbed when he heard of the proposed visit of all the wrangling quarrelsome party dmitri was the only one who could regard the interview seriously all the others would come from frivolous motives perhaps insulting to the elder alyosha was well aware of that ivan and musov would come from curiosity perhaps of the coarsest kind while his father might be contemplating some piece of buffoonery though he said nothing alyosha thoroughly understood his father the boy i repeat was far from being so simple as everyone thought him he awaited the day with a heavy heart no doubt he was always pondering in his mind how the family discord could be ended but his chief anxiety concerned the elder he trembled for him for his glory and dreaded any affront to him especially the refined courteous irony of musov and the supercilious half utterances of the highly educated ivan he even wanted to venture on warning the elder telling him something about them but on second thoughts said nothing he only sent word the day before through a friend to his brother dmitri that he loved him and expected him to keep his promise dmitri wondered for he could not remember what he had promised but he answered by letter that he would do his utmost not to let himself be provoked by vileness but that although he had a deep respect for the elder and for his brother ivan he was convinced that the meeting was either a trap for him or an unworthy farce nevertheless i would rather bite out my tongue than be lacking in respect to the sainted man whom you reverence so highly he wrote in conclusion alyosha was not greatly cheered by the letter end of section five Section six of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book two, An Unfortunate Gathering, Chapter one. They arrive at the monastery. It was a warm, bright day at the end of August. The interview with the elder had been fixed for half past eleven, immediately after late mass our visitors did not take part in the service but arrived just as it was over first an elegant open carriage drawn by two valuable horses drove up with miusov and a distant relative of his a young man of twenty called pyotr fomitch kalganov this young man was preparing to enter the university miusov with whom he was staying for the time was trying to persuade him to go abroad to the university of zurich or jena the young man was still undecided he was thoughtful and absent-minded he was nice-looking strongly built and rather tall there was a strange fixity in his gaze at times like all very absent-minded people he would sometimes stare at a person without seeing him he was silent and rather awkward but sometimes when he was alone with any one he became talkative and effusive and would laugh at anything or nothing but his animation vanished as quickly as it appeared he was always well and even elaborately dressed he had already some independent fortune and expectations of much more he was a friend of alyosha's in an ancient jolting but roomy hired carriage with a pair of old pinkish-gray horses a long way behind miusov's carriage came fyodor pavlovitch with his son ivan dmitri was late though he had been informed of the time the evening before the visitors left their carriage at the hotel outside the precincts and went to the gates of the monastery on foot except fyodor pavlovitch 
none of the party had ever seen the monastery and Musov had probably not even been to church for thirty years he looked about him with curiosity together with assumed ease but except the church and the domestic buildings though these two were ordinary enough he found nothing of interest in the interior of the monastery the last of the worshippers were coming out of the church bareheaded and crossing themselves among the humbler people were a few of higher rank two or three ladies and a very old general they were all staying at the hotel our visitors were at once surrounded by beggars but none of them gave them anything except young kalganov who took a ten kopeck piece out of his purse and nervous and embarrassed god knows why hurriedly gave it to an old woman saying divide it equally none of his companions made any remark upon it so that he had no reason to be embarrassed but perceiving this he was even more overcome it was strange that their arrival did not seem expected and that they were not received with special honour though one of them had recently made a donation of a thousand roubles while another was a very wealthy and highly cultured landowner upon whom all in the monastery were in a sense dependent as a decision of the lawsuit might at any moment put their fishing rights in his hands yet no official personage met them miusov looked absent-mindedly at the tombstones round the church and was on the point of saying that the dead buried here must have paid a pretty penny for the right of lying in this holy place but refrained his liberal irony was rapidly changing almost into anger who the devil is there to ask in this imbecile place we must find out for time is passing he observed suddenly as though speaking to himself all at once there came up a bald-headed elderly man with ingratiating little eyes wearing a full summer overcoat lifting his hat he introduced himself with a honeyed lisp as maximov a landowner of tula he at once entered into our visitor's difficulty father zosima lives in the hermitage apart four hundred paces from the monastery the other side of the copse i know it's the other side of the copse observed fyodor pavlovitch but we don't remember the way it's a long time since we've been here this way by this gate and straight across the copse the copse come with me won't you i'll show you i have to go i'm going myself this way this way they came out of the gate and turned towards the copse maximov a man of sixty ran rather than walked turning sideways to stare at them all with an incredible degree of nervous curiosity his eyes looked starting out of his head you see we have come to the elder upon business of our own observed miusov severely that personage has granted us an audience so to speak and so though we thank you for showing us the way we cannot ask you to accompany us i've been there i've been already un chevalier parfait and maximov snapped his fingers in the air who is a chevalier asked miusov the elder the splendid elder the elder the honour and glory of the monastery Sosima, such an elder but his incoherent talk was cut short by a very pale wan-looking monk of medium height wearing a monk's cap who overtook them fyodor pavlovitch and musov stopped the monk with an extremely courteous profound bow announced the father superior invites all of you gentlemen to dine with him after your visit to the hermitage at one o'clock not later and you also he added addressing maximov that i certainly will without fail cried fyodor pavlovitch hugely delighted at the invitation and believe me we've all given our word to behave properly here and you pyotr alexandrovitch will you go too yes of course what have i come for but to study all the customs here the only obstacle to me is your company yes dmitri fyodorovitch is non-existent as yet it would be a capital thing if he didn't turn up 
do you suppose i like all this business and in your company too so we will come to dinner thank the father superior he said to the monk no it is my duty now to conduct you to the elder answered the monk if so i'll go straight to the father superior to the father superior babbled maximoff the father superior is engaged just now but as you please the monk hesitated impertinent old man musov observed aloud while maximoff ran back to the monastery he's like fanson fyodor pavlovitch said suddenly is that all you can think of in what way is he like fanson have you ever seen fanson i've seen his portrait it's not the features but something indefinable he's a second fanson i can always tell from the physiognomy ah i dare say you are a connoisseur in that but look here fyodor pavlovitch you said just now that we had given our word to behave properly remember it i advise you to control yourself but if you begin to play the fool i don't intend to be associated with you here you see what a man he is he turned to the monk i'm afraid to go among decent people with him a fine smile not without a certain slyness came on to the pale bloodless lips of the monk but he made no reply and was evidently silent from a sense of his own dignity Yusuf frowned more than ever oh devil take them all an outer show elaborated through centuries and nothing but charlatanism and nonsense underneath flashed through Yusuf's mind here's the hermitage we've arrived cried fyodor pavlovitch the gates are shut and he repeatedly made the sign of the cross to the saints painted above and on the sides of the gates when you go to rome you must do as the romans do here in this hermitage there are twenty-five saints being saved they look at one another and eat cabbages and not one woman goes in at this gate that's what is remarkable and that really is so but i did hear that the elder receives ladies he remarked suddenly to the monk women of the people are here too now lying in the portico there waiting but for ladies of higher rank two rooms have been built adjoining the portico but outside the precincts you can see the windows and the elder goes out to them by an inner passage when he is well enough they are always outside the precincts there is a harkoff lady madame holikoff waiting there now with her sick daughter probably he has promised to come out to her though of late he has been so weak that he has hardly shown himself even to the people so then there are loopholes after all to creep out of the hermitage to the ladies don't suppose holy father that i mean any harm but do you know that at athos not only the visits of women are not allowed but no creature of the female sex no hens nor turkey hens nor cows fyodor pavlovitch i warn you i shall go back and leave you here they'll turn you out when i'm gone but i'm not interfering with you pyotr alexandrovitch look he cried suddenly stepping within the precincts what a veil of roses they live in though there were no roses now there were numbers of rare and beautiful autumn flowers growing wherever there was space for them and evidently tended by a skilful hand there were flower-beds round the church and between the tombs and the one-storied wooden house where the elder lived was also surrounded with flowers and was it like this in the time of the last elder varsonofy he didn't care for such elegance they say he used to jump up and thrash even ladies with a stick observed fyodor pavlovitch as he went up the steps the elder varsonofy did sometimes seem rather strange but a great deal that's told is foolishness he never thrashed any one answered the monk now gentlemen if you will wait a minute i will announce you fyodor pavlovitch for the last time your compact do you hear behave properly or i will pay you out Yusuf had time to mutter again i can't think why you are so agitated 
fyodor pavlovitch observed sarcastically are you uneasy about your sins they say he can tell by one's eyes what one has come about and what a lot you think of their opinion you a parisian and so advanced i'm surprised at you but Musov had no time to reply to this sarcasm they were asked to come in he walked in somewhat irritated now i know myself i am annoyed i shall lose my temper and begin to quarrel and lower myself and my ideas he reflected end of section six Section seven of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book two, chapter two, The Old Buffoon. They entered the room almost at the same moment that the elder came in from his bedroom. There were already in the cell, awaiting the elder, two monks of the hermitage, one the father librarian, and the other Father Paisi, a very learned man, so they said, in delicate health, though not old. There was also a tall young man, who looked about two and twenty, standing in the corner throughout the interview. He had a broad, fresh face and clever, observant, narrow brown eyes, and was wearing ordinary dress he was a divinity student living under the protection of the monastery his expression was one of unquestioning but self-respecting reverence being in a subordinate and dependent position and so not on an equality with the guests he did not greet them with a bow father zasima was accompanied by a novice and by alyosha the two monks rose and greeted him with a very deep bow touching the ground with their fingers then kissed his hand blessing them the elder replied with as deep a reverence to them and asked their blessing the whole ceremony was performed very seriously and with an appearance of feeling not like an everyday rite but musov fancied that it was all done with intentional impressiveness he stood in front of the other visitors he ought he had reflected upon it the evening before from simple politeness since it was the custom here to have gone up to receive the elder's blessing even if he did not kiss his hand but when he saw all this bowing and kissing on the part of the monks he instantly changed his mind with dignified gravity he made a rather deep conventional bow and moved away to a chair fyodor pavlovitch did the same mimicking musov like an ape ivan bowed with great dignity and courtesy but he too kept his hands at his sides while kalganov was so confused that he did not bow at all the elder let fall the hand raised to bless them and bowing to them again asked them all to sit down the blood rushed to alyosha's cheeks he was ashamed his forebodings were coming true father zasima sat down on a very old-fashioned mahogany sofa covered with leather and made his visitors sit down in a row along the opposite wall on four mahogany chairs covered with shabby black leather the monks sat one at the door and the other at the window the divinity student the novice and alyosha remained standing the cell was not very large and had a faded look it contained nothing but the most necessary furniture of coarse and poor quality there were two pots of flowers in the window and a number of holy pictures in the corner before one huge ancient icon of the virgin a lamp was burning near it were two other holy pictures in shining settings and next them carved cherubims china eggs a catholic cross of ivory with a mater dolorosa embracing it and several foreign engravings from the great italian artists of past centuries next to these costly and artistic engravings were several of the roughest russian prints of saints and martyrs such as are sold for a few farthings at all the fairs on the other walls were portraits of russian bishops past and present 
miusov took a cursory glance at all these conventional surroundings and bent an intent look upon the elder he had a high opinion of his own insight a weakness excusable in him as he was fifty an age at which a clever man of the world of established position can hardly help taking himself rather seriously at the first moment he did not like zosima there was indeed something in the elder's face which many people besides miusov might not have liked he was a short bent little man with very weak legs and though he was only sixty-five he looked at least ten years older his face was very thin and covered with a network of fine wrinkles particularly numerous about his eyes which were small light-colored quick and shining like two bright points he had a sprinkling of gray hair about his temples his pointed beard was small and scanty and his lips which smiled frequently were as thin as two threads his nose was not long but sharp like a bird's beak to all appearances a malicious soul full of petty pride thought miusov he felt altogether dissatisfied with his position a cheap little clock on the wall struck twelve hurriedly and served to begin the conversation precisely to our time cried fyodor pavlovitch but no sign of my son dmitri i apologize for him sacred elder alyosha shuddered all over at sacred elder i am always punctual myself minute for minute remembering that punctuality is the courtesy of kings but you are not a king anyway yusov muttered losing his self-restraint at once yes that's true i'm not a king and would you believe it pyotr alexandrovitch i was aware of that myself but there i always say the wrong thing your reverence he cried with sudden pathos you behold before you a buffoon in earnest i introduce myself as such it's an old habit alas and if i sometimes talk nonsense out of place it's with an object with the object of amusing people and making myself agreeable one must be agreeable mustn't one i was seven years ago in a little town where i had business and i made friends with some merchants there we went to the captain of police because we had to see him about something and to ask him to dine with us he was a tall fat fair sulky man the most dangerous type in such cases it's their liver i went straight up to him and with the ease of a man of the world you know mr ispravnik said i be our napravnik what do you mean by napravnik said he i saw at the first half second that it had missed fire he stood there so glum i wanted to make a joke said i for the general diversion as mr napravnik is our well-known russian orchestra conductor and what we need for the harmony of our undertaking is some one of that sort and i explained my comparison very reasonably didn't i excuse me said he i am an ispravnik and i do not allow puns to be made on my calling he turned and walked away i followed him shouting yes yes you are an ispravnik not a napravnik no he said since you called me a napravnik i am one and would you believe it it ruined our business and i'm always like that always like that always injuring myself with my politeness once many years ago i said to an influential person your wife is a ticklish lady in an honorable sense of the moral quality so to speak but he asked me why have you tickled her i thought i'd be polite so i couldn't help saying yes and he gave me a fine tickling on the spot only that happened long ago so i'm not ashamed to tell the story i'm always injuring myself like that you're doing it now muttered miusov with disgust father zosima scrutinized them both in silence am i would you believe it i was aware of that too pyotr alexandrovitch and let me tell you indeed i foresaw i should as soon as i began to speak and do you know i foresaw too that you'd be the first to remark on it 
the minute i see my joke isn't coming off your reverence both my cheeks feel as though they were drawn down to the lower jaw and there is almost a spasm in them that's been so since i was young when i had to make jokes for my living in noblemen's families i am an inveterate buffoon and have been from birth up your reverence it's as though it were a craze in me i dare say it's a devil within me but only a little one a more serious one would have chosen another lodging but not your soul pyotr alexandrovitch you're not a lodging worth having either but i do believe i believe in god though i have had doubts of late but now i sit and await words of wisdom i'm like the philosopher diderot your reverence did you ever hear most holy father how diderot went to see the metropolitan platon in the time of the empress catherine he went in and said straight out there is no god to which the great bishop lifted up his finger and answered the fool hath said in his heart there is no god and he fell down at his feet on the spot i believe he cried and will be christened and so he was princess dashkov was his godmother and Potyomkin his godfather fyodor pavlovitch this is unbearable you know you're telling lies and that that stupid anecdote isn't true why are you playing the fool cried musov in a shaking voice i suspected all my life that it wasn't true fyodor pavlovitch cried with conviction but i'll tell you the whole truth gentlemen great elder forgive me the last thing about diderot's christening i made up just now i never thought of it before i made it up to add piquancy i play the fool pyotr alexandrovitch to make myself agreeable though i really don't know myself sometimes what i do it for and as for diderot i heard as far as the fool hath said in his heart twenty times from the gentry about here when i was young i heard your aunt pyotr alexandrovitch tell the story they all believe to this day that the infidel diderot came to dispute about god with the metropolitan platon musov got up forgetting himself in his impatience he was furious and conscious of being ridiculous what was taking place in the cell was really incredible for forty or fifty years past from the times of former elders no visitors had entered that cell without feelings of the profoundest veneration almost every one admitted to the cell felt that a great favour was being shown him many remained kneeling during the whole visit of those visitors many had been men of high rank and learning some even free thinkers attracted by curiosity but all without exception had shown the profoundest reverence and delicacy for here there was no question of money but only on the one side love and kindness and on the other penitence and eager desire to decide some spiritual problem or crisis so that such buffoonery amazed and bewildered the spectators or at least some of them the monks with unchanged countenances waited with earnest attention to hear what the elder would say but seemed on the point of standing up like musov alyosha stood with hanging head on the verge of tears what seemed to him strangest of all was that his brother ivan on whom alone he had rested his hopes and who alone had such influence on his father that he could have stopped him sat now quite unmoved with downcast eyes apparently waiting with interest to see how it would end as though he had nothing to do with it alyosha did not dare to look at rakitin the divinity student whom he knew almost intimately he alone in the monastery knew rakitin's thoughts forgive me began musov addressing father zossima for perhaps i seem to be taking part in this shameful foolery i made a mistake in believing that even a man like fyodor pavlovitch would understand what was due on a visit to so honoured a personage i did not suppose i should have to apologize simply for having come with him pyotr alexandrovitch could say no more and was about to leave the room overwhelmed with confusion don't distress yourself i beg 
the elder got on to his feeble legs and taking pyotr alexandrovitch by both hands made him sit down again i beg you not to disturb yourself i particularly beg you to be my guest and with a bow he went back and sat down again on his little sofa great elder speak do i annoy you by my vivacity fyodor pavlovitch cried suddenly clutching the arms of his chair in both hands as though ready to leap up from it if the answer were unfavourable i earnestly beg you too not to disturb yourself and not to be uneasy the elder said impressively do not trouble make yourself quite at home and above all do not be so ashamed of yourself for that is at the root of it all quite at home to be my natural self oh that is too much but i accept it with grateful joy do you know blessed father you'd better not invite me to be my natural self don't risk it i will not go so far as that myself i warn you for your own sake well the rest is still plunged in the mists of uncertainty though there are people who'd be pleased to describe me for you i mean that for you pyotr alexandrovitch but as for you holy being let me tell you i am brimming over with ecstasy he got up and throwing up his hands declaimed blessed be the womb that bare thee and the paps that gave thee suck the paps especially when you said just now don't be so ashamed of yourself for that is at the root of it all you pierced right through me by that remark and read me to the core indeed i always feel when i meet people that i am lower than all and that they all take me for a buffoon so i say let me really play the buffoon i am not afraid of your opinion for you are every one of you worse than i am that is why i am a buffoon it is from shame great elder from shame it's simply oversensitiveness that makes me rowdy if i had only been sure that every one would accept me as the kindest and wisest of men oh lord what a good man i should have been then teacher he fell suddenly on his knees what must i do to gain eternal life it was difficult even now to decide whether he was joking or really moved father zossima lifting his eyes looked at him and said with a smile you have known for a long time what you must do you have sense enough don't give way to drunkenness and incontinence of speech don't give way to sensual lust and above all to the love of money and close your taverns if you can't close all at least two or three and above all don't lie you mean about diderot no not about diderot above all don't lie to yourself the man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to such a pass that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him and so loses all respect for himself and for others and having no respect he ceases to love and in order to occupy and distract himself without love he gives way to passions and coarse pleasures and sinks to bestiality in his vices all from continual lying to other men and to himself the man who lies to himself can be more easily offended than any one you know it is sometimes very pleasant to take offence isn't it a man may know that nobody has insulted him but that he has invented the insult for himself has lied and exaggerated to make it picturesque has caught at a word and made a mountain out of a molehill he knows that himself yet he will be the first to take offence and will revel in his resentment till he feels great pleasure in it and so pass to genuine vindictiveness but get up sit down i beg you all this too is deceitful posturing blessed man give me your hand to kiss fyodor pavlovitch skipped up and imprinted a rapid kiss on the elder's thin hand it is it is pleasant to take offence you said that so well as i never heard it before 
yes i have been all my life taking offence to please myself taking offence on aesthetic grounds for it is not so much pleasant as distinguished sometimes to be insulted that you had forgotten great elder it is distinguished i shall make a note of that but i have been lying lying positively my whole life long every day and hour of it of a truth i am a lie and the father of lies though i believe i am not the father of lies i am getting mixed in my texts say the son of lies and that will be enough only my angel i may sometimes talk about diderot diderot will do no harm though sometimes a word will do harm great elder by the way i was forgetting though i had been meaning for the last two years to come here on purpose to ask and to find out something only do tell pyotr alexandrovitch not to interrupt me here is my question is it true great father that the story is told somewhere in the lives of the saints of a holy saint martyred for his faith who when his head was cut off at last stood up picked up his head and courteously kissing it walked a long way carrying it in his hands is that true or not honoured father no it is untrue said the elder there is nothing of the kind in all the lives of the saints what saint do you say the story is told of asked the father librarian i do not know what saint i do not know and can't tell i was deceived i was told the story i had heard it and do you know who told it pyotr alexandrovitch musov here who was so angry just now about diderot he it was who told the story i have never told it you i never speak to you at all it is true you did not tell me but you told it when i was present it was three years ago i mentioned it because by that ridiculous story you shook my faith pyotr alexandrovitch you knew nothing of it but i went home with my faith shaken and i have been getting more and more shaken ever since yes pyotr alexandrovitch you were the cause of a great fall that was not a diderot fyodor pavlovitch got excited and pathetic though it was perfectly clear to every one by now that he was playing a part again yet musov was stung by his words what nonsense and it is all nonsense he muttered i may really have told it some time or other but not to you i was told it myself i heard it in paris from a frenchman he told me it was read at our mass from the lives of the saints he was a very learned man who had made a special study of russian statistics and had lived a long time in russia i have not read the lives of the saints myself and i am not going to read them all sorts of things are said at dinner we were dining then yes you were dining then and so i lost my faith said fyodor pavlovitch mimicking him what do i care for your faith Yusov was on the point of shouting but he suddenly checked himself and said with contempt you defile everything you touch the elder suddenly rose from his seat excuse me gentlemen for leaving you a few minutes he said addressing all his guests i have visitors awaiting me who arrived before you but don't you tell lies all the same he added turning to fyodor pavlovitch with a good-humoured face he went out of the cell alyosha and the novice flew to escort him down the steps alyosha was breathless he was glad to get away but he was glad too that the elder was good-humoured and not offended father zosima was going towards the portico to bless the people waiting for him there but fyodor pavlovitch persisted in stopping him at the door of the cell blessed man he cried with feeling allow me to kiss your hand once more yes with you i could still talk i could still get on do you think i always lie and play the fool like this 
believe me i have been acting like this all the time on purpose to try you i have been testing you all the time to see whether i could get on with you is there room for my humility beside your pride i am ready to give you a testimonial that one can get on with you but now i'll be quiet i will keep quiet all the time i'll sit in a chair and hold my tongue now it is for you to speak pyotr alexandrovitch you are the principal person left now for ten minutes End of section seven. Section eight of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book two, chapter three. Peasant women who have faith near the wooden portico below built on to the outer wall of the precinct there was a crowd of about twenty peasant women they had been told that the elder was at last coming out and they had gathered together in anticipation two ladies madame holakoff and her daughter had also come out into the portico to wait for the elder but in a separate part of it set aside for women of rank madame holakoff was a wealthy lady still young and attractive and always dressed with taste she was rather pale and had lively black eyes she was not more than thirty-three and had been five years a widow her daughter a girl of fourteen was partially paralyzed the poor child had not been able to walk for the last six months and was wheeled about in a long reclining chair she had a charming little face rather thin from illness but full of gaiety there was a gleam of mischief in her big dark eyes with their long lashes her mother had been intending to take her abroad ever since the spring but they had been detained all the summer by business connected with their estate they had been staying a week in our town where they had come more for purposes of business than devotion but had visited father zasima once already three days before though they knew that the elders scarcely saw any one they had now suddenly turned up again and urgently entreated the happiness of looking once again on the great healer the mother was sitting on a chair by the side of her daughter's invalid carriage and two paces from her stood an old monk not one of our monastery but a visitor from an obscure religious house in the far north he too sought the elder's blessing but father zasima on entering the portico went first straight to the peasants who were crowded at the foot of the three steps that led up into the portico father zasima stood on the top step put on his stole and began blessing the women who thronged about him one crazy woman was led up to him as soon as she caught sight of the elder she began shrieking and writhing as though in the pains of childbirth laying the stole on her forehead he read a short prayer over her and she was at once soothed and quieted i do not know how it may be now but in my childhood i often happened to see and hear these possessed women in the villages and monasteries they used to be brought to mass they would squeal and bark like a dog so that they were heard all over the church but when the sacrament was carried in and they were led up to it at once the possession ceased and the sick women were always soothed for a time i was greatly impressed and amazed at this as a child but then i heard from country neighbors and from my town teachers that the whole illness was simulated to avoid work and that it could always be cured by suitable severity various anecdotes were told to confirm this but later on i learnt with astonishment from medical specialists that there is no pretense about it that it is a terrible illness to which women are subject specially prevalent among us in russia and that it is due to the hard lot of the peasant women it is a disease i was told arising from exhausting toil too soon after hard abnormal and unassisted labor in childbirth and from the hopeless misery from beatings and so on which some women were not able to endure like others 
the strange and instant healing of the frantic and struggling woman as soon as she was led up to the holy sacrament which had been explained to me as due to malingering and the trickery of the clericals arose probably in the most natural manner both the women who supported her and the invalid herself fully believed as a truth beyond question that the evil spirit in possession of her could not hold out if the sick woman were brought to the sacrament and made to bow down before it and so with a nervous and psychically deranged woman a sort of convulsion of the whole organism always took place and was bound to take place at the moment of bowing down to the sacrament aroused by the expectation of the miracle of healing and the implicit belief that it would come to pass and it did come to pass though only for a moment it was exactly the same now as soon as the elder touched the sick woman with the stole many of the women in the crowd were moved to tears of ecstasy by the effect of the moment some strove to kiss the hem of his garment others cried out in sing-song voices he blessed them all and talked with some of them the possessed woman he knew already she came from a village only six firsts from the monastery and had been brought to him before but here is one from afar he pointed to a woman by no means old but very thin and wasted with a face not merely sunburnt but almost blackened by exposure she was kneeling and gazing with a fixed stare at the elder there was something almost frenzied in her eyes from afar off father from afar off from two hundred miles from here from afar off father from afar off the woman began in a sing-song voice as though she were chanting a dirge swaying her head from side to side with her cheek resting in her hand there is silent and long-suffering sorrow to be met with among the peasantry it withdraws into itself and is still but there is a grief that breaks out and from that minute it bursts into tears and finds vent in wailing this is particularly common with women but it is no lighter a grief than the silent lamentations comfort only by lacerating the heart still more such grief does not desire consolation it feeds on the sense of its hopelessness lamentations spring only from the constant craving to reopen the wound you are of the tradesman class said father zossima looking curiously at her town folk we are father town folk yet we are peasants though we live in the town i have come to see you o oh father we heard of you father we heard of you i have buried my little son and i have come on a pilgrimage i have been in three monasteries but they told me go nastasia go to them that is to you i have come i was yesterday at the service and to-day i have come to you what are you weeping for it's my little son i'm grieving for father he was three years old three years all but three months for my little boy father i'm in anguish for my little boy he was the last one left we had four my nikita and i and now we've no children our dear ones have all gone i buried the first three without grieving over much and now i have buried the last i can't forget him he seems always standing before me he never leaves me he has withered my heart i look at his little clothes his little shirt his little boots and i wail i lay out all that is left of him all his little things i look at them and wail i say to nikita my husband let me go on a pilgrimage master he is a driver we're not poor people father not poor he drives our own horse it's all our own the horse and the carriage and what good is it all to us now my nikita has begun drinking while i am away he's sure to it used to be so before as soon as i turn my back he gives way to it but now i don't think about him it's three months since i left home i've forgotten him i've forgotten everything 
i don't want to remember and what would our life be now together i've done with him i've done i've done with them all i don't care to look upon my house and my goods i don't care to see anything at all listen mother said the elder once in olden times a holy saint saw in the temple a mother like you weeping for her little one her only one whom god had taken knowest thou not said the saint to her how bold these little ones are before the throne of god verily there are none bolder than they in the kingdom of heaven thou didst give us life o lord they say and scarcely had we looked upon it when thou didst take it back again and so boldly they ask and ask again that god gives them at once the rank of angels therefore said the saint thou too o mother rejoice and weep not for thy little son is with the lord in the fellowship of the angels that's what the saint said to the weeping mother of old he was a great saint and he could not have spoken falsely therefore you too mother know that your little one is surely before the throne of god is rejoicing and happy and praying to god for you and therefore weep not but rejoice the woman listened to him looking down with her cheek in her hand she sighed deeply my nikita tried to comfort me with the same words as you foolish one he said why weep our son is no doubt singing with the angels before god he says that to me but he weeps himself i see that he cries like me i know nikita said i where could he be if not with the lord god only here with us now he is not as he used to sit beside us before and if only i could look upon him one little time if only i could peep at him one little time without going up to him without speaking if i could be hidden in a corner and only see him for one little minute hear him playing in the yard calling in his little voice mammy where are you if only i could hear him pattering with his little feet about the room just once only once for so often so often i remember how he used to run to me and shout and laugh if only i could hear his little feet i should know him but he's gone father he's gone and i shall never hear him again here's his little sash but him i shall never see or hear now she drew out of her bosom her boy's little embroidered sash and as soon as she looked at it she began shaking with sobs hiding her eyes with her fingers through which the tears flowed in a sudden stream it is rachel of old said the elder weeping for her children and will not be comforted because they are not such is the lot set on earth for you mothers be not comforted consolation is not what you need weep and be not consoled but weep only every time that you weep be sure to remember that your little son is one of the angels of god that he looks down from there at you and sees you and rejoices at your tears and points at them to the lord god and a long while yet will you keep that great mother's grief but it will turn in the end into quiet joy and your bitter tears will be only tears of tender sorrow that purifies the heart and delivers it from sin and i shall pray for the peace of your child's soul what was his name alexey father a sweet name after alexey the man of god yes father what a saint he was i will remember him mother and your grief in my prayers and i will pray for your husband's health it is a sin for you to leave him your little one will see from heaven that you have forsaken his father and will weep over you why do you trouble his happiness he is living for the soul lives for ever and though he is not in the house he is near you unseen 
how can he go into the house when you say that the house is hateful to you to whom is he to go if he find you not together his father and mother he comes to you in dreams now and you grieve but then he will send you gentle dreams go to your husband mother go this very day i will go father at your word i will go you've gone straight to my heart my nikita my nikita you are waiting for me the woman began in a sing-song voice but the elder had already turned away to a very old woman dressed like a dweller in the town not like a pilgrim her eyes showed that she had come with an object and in order to say something she said she was the widow of a non-commissioned officer and lived close by in the town her son vasenka was in the commissariat service and had gone to irkutsk in siberia he had written twice from there but now a year had passed since he had written she did inquire about him but she did not know the proper place to inquire only the other day stepanida ilyanishna she's a rich merchant's wife said to me you go pohorovna and put your son's name down for prayer in the church and pray for the peace of his soul as though he were dead his soul will be troubled she said and he will write you a letter and stepanida ilyanishna told me it was a certain thing which had been many times tried only i am in doubt oh you light of ours is it true or false and would it be right don't think of it it's shameful to ask the question how is it possible to pray for the peace of a living soul and his own mother too it's a great sin akin to sorcery only for your ignorance it is forgiven you better pray to the queen of heaven our swift defence and help for his good health and that she may forgive you for your error and another thing i will tell you prohorovna either he will soon come back to you your son or he will be sure to send a letter go and henceforward be in peace your son is alive i tell you dear father god reward you our benefactor who prays for all of us and for our sins but the elder had already noticed in the crowd two glowing eyes fixed upon him an exhausted consumptive-looking though young peasant woman was gazing at him in silence her eyes besought him but she seemed afraid to approach what is it my child absolve my soul father she articulated softly and slowly sank on her knees and bowed down at his feet i have sinned father i am afraid of my sin the elder sat down on the lower step the woman crept closer to him still on her knees i am a widow these three years she began in a half whisper with a sort of shudder i had a hard life with my husband he was an old man he used to beat me cruelly he lay ill i thought looking at him if he were to get well if he were to get up again what then and then the thought came to me stay said the elder and he put his ear close to her lips the woman went on in a low whisper so that it was almost impossible to catch anything she had soon done three years ago asked the elder three years at first i didn't think about it but now i've begun to be ill and the thought never leaves me have you come from far over three hundred miles away have you told it in confession i have confessed it twice i have confessed it have you been admitted to communion yes i am afraid i am afraid to die fear nothing and never be afraid and don't fret if only your penitence fail not god will forgive all there is no sin and there can be no sin on all the earth which the lord will not forgive to the truly repentant 
man cannot commit a sin so great as to exhaust the infinite love of god can there be a sin which could exceed the love of god think only of repentance continual repentance but dismiss fear altogether believe that god loves you as you cannot conceive that he loves you with your sin in your sin it has been said of old that over one repentant sinner there is more joy in heaven than over ten righteous men go and fear not be not bitter against men be not angry if you are wronged forgive the dead man in your heart what wrong he did you be reconciled with him in truth if you are penitent you love and if you love you are of god all things are atoned for all things are saved by love if i a sinner even as you are am tender with you and have pity on you how much more will god love is such a priceless treasure that you can redeem the whole world by it and expiate not only your own sins but the sins of others he signed her three times with the cross took from his own neck a little icon and put it upon her she bowed down to the earth without speaking he got up and looked cheerfully at a healthy peasant woman with a tiny baby in her arms from vishagoria dear father five miles you have dragged yourself with the baby what do you want i've come to look at you i have been to you before or have you forgotten you've no great memory if you've forgotten me they told us you were ill thinks i i'll go and see him for myself now i see you and you're not ill you'll live another twenty years god bless you there are plenty to pray for you how should you be ill i thank you for all daughter by the way i have a thing to ask not a great one here are sixty kopecks give them dear father to some one poorer than me i thought as i came along better give through him he'll know whom to give to thanks my dear thanks you are a good woman i love you i will do so certainly is that your little girl my little girl father lizaveta may the lord bless you both you and your babe lizaveta you have gladdened my heart mother farewell dear children farewell dear ones he blessed them all and bowed low to them end of section eight Section nine of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book two, chapter four. A lady of little faith. A visitor looking on the scene of his conversation with the peasants and his blessing them, shed silent tears and wiped them away with her handkerchief she was a sentimental society lady of genuinely good disposition in many respects when the elder went up to her at last she met him enthusiastically ah what i have been feeling looking on at this touching scene she could not go on for emotion oh i understand the people's love for you i love the people myself i want to love them and who could help loving them our splendid russian people so simple in their greatness how is your daughter's health you wanted to talk to me again oh i have been urgently begging for it i have prayed for it i was ready to fall on my knees and kneel for three days at your windows until you let me in we have come great healer to express our ardent gratitude you have healed my lise healed her completely merely by praying over her last thursday and laying your hands upon her we have hastened here to kiss those hands to pour out our feelings and our homage what do you mean by healed but she is still lying down in her chair but her night fevers have entirely ceased ever since thursday said the lady with nervous haste 
and that's not all her legs are stronger this morning she got up well she had slept all night look at her rosy cheeks her bright eyes she used to be always crying but now she laughs and is gay and happy this morning she insisted on my letting her stand up and she stood up for a whole minute without any support she wagers that in a fortnight she'll be dancing a quadrille i've called in dr herzenstube he shrugged his shoulders and said i am amazed i can make nothing of it and would you have us not come here to disturb you not fly here to thank you please thank him thank him lise's pretty little laughing face became suddenly serious she rose in her chair as far as she could and looking at the elder clasped her hands before him but could not restrain herself and broke into laughter it's at him she said pointing to alyosha with childish vexation at herself for not being able to repress her mirth if any one had looked at alyosha standing a step behind the elder he would have caught a quick flush crimsoning his cheeks in an instant his eyes shone and he looked down she has a message for you alexey fyodorovitch how are you the mother went on holding out her exquisitely gloved hand to alyosha the elder turned round and all at once looked attentively at alyosha the latter went nearer to lise and smiling in a strangely awkward way held out his hand to her too lise assumed an important air katerina ivanovna has sent you this through me she handed him a little note she particularly begs you to go and see her as soon as possible that you will not fail her but will be sure to come she asks me to go and see her me what for alyosha muttered in great astonishment his face at once looked anxious oh it's all to do with dmitri fyodorovitch and what has happened lately the mother explained hurriedly katerina ivanovna has made up her mind but she must see you about it why of course i can't say but she wants to see you at once and you will go to her of course it is a christian duty i have only seen her once alyosha protested with the same perplexity oh she is such a lofty incomparable creature if only for her suffering think what she has gone through what she is enduring now think what awaits her it's all terrible terrible very well i will come alyosha decided after rapidly scanning the brief enigmatic note which consisted of an urgent entreaty that he would come without any sort of explanation oh how sweet and generous that would be of you cried lise with sudden animation i told mamma you'd be sure not to go i said you were saving your soul how splendid you are i've always thought you were splendid how glad i am to tell you so lise said her mother impressively though she smiled after she had said it you have quite forgotten us alexey fyodorovitch she said you never come to see us yet lise has told me twice that she is never happy except with you alyosha raised his downcast eyes and again flushed and again smiled without knowing why but the elder was no longer watching him he had begun talking to a monk who as mentioned before had been awaiting his entrance by lise's chair he was evidently a monk of the humblest that is of the peasant class of a narrow outlook but a true believer and in his own way a stubborn one he announced that he had come from the far north from obdorsk from saint sylvester and was a member of a poor monastery consisting of only ten monks the elder gave him his blessing and invited him to come to his cell whenever he liked how can you presume to do such deeds the monk asked suddenly pointing solemnly and significantly at lise he was referring to her healing it's too early of course to speak of that relief is not complete cure and may proceed from different causes but if there has been any healing it is by no power but god's will it's all from god visit me father 
he added to the monk it's not often i can see visitors i am ill and i know that my days are numbered oh no no god will not take you from us you will live a long long time yet cried the lady and in what way are you ill you look so well so gay and happy i am extraordinarily better to-day but i know that it's only for a moment i understand my disease now thoroughly if i seem so happy to you you could never say anything that would please me so much for men are made for happiness and any one who is completely happy has a right to say to himself i am doing god's will on earth all the righteous all the saints all the holy martyrs were happy oh how you speak what bold and lofty words cried the lady you seem to pierce with your words and yet happiness happiness where is it who can say of himself that he is happy oh since you have been so good as to let us see you once more to-day let me tell you what i could not utter last time what i dared not say all i am suffering and have been for so long i am suffering forgive me i am suffering and in a rush of fervent feeling she clasped her hands before him from what specially i suffer from lack of faith lack of faith in god oh no no i dare not even think of that but the future life it is such an enigma and no one no one can solve it listen you are a healer you are deeply versed in the human soul and of course i dare not expect you to believe me entirely but i assure you on my word of honour that i am not speaking lightly now the thought of the life beyond the grave distracts me to anguish to terror and i don't know to whom to appeal and have not dared to all my life and now i am so bold as to ask you oh god what will you think of me now she clasped her hands don't distress yourself about my opinion of you said the elder i quite believe in the sincerity of your suffering oh how thankful i am to you you see i shut my eyes and ask myself if every one has faith where did it come from and then they do say that it all comes from terror at the menacing phenomena of nature and that none of it's real and i say to myself what if i've been believing all my life and when i come to die there's nothing but the burdocks growing on my grave as i read in some author it's awful how how can i get back my faith but i only believed when i was a little child mechanically without thinking of anything how how is one to prove it i have come now to lay my soul before you and to ask you about it if i let this chance slip no one all my life will answer me how can i prove it how can i convince myself oh how unhappy i am i stand and look about me and see that scarcely any one else cares no one troubles his head about it and i'm the only one who can't stand it it's deadly deadly no doubt but there's no proving it though you can be convinced of it how by the experience of active love strive to love your neighbor actively and indefatigably and as far as you advance in love you will grow surer of the reality of god and of the immortality of your soul if you attain to perfect self-forgetfulness in the love of your neighbor then you will believe without doubt and no doubt can possibly enter your soul this has been tried this is certain in active love there's another question and such a question you see i so love humanity that would you believe it i often dream of forsaking all that i have leaving lees and becoming a sister of mercy i close my eyes and think and dream and at that moment i feel full of strength to overcome all obstacles no wounds no festering sores could at that moment frighten me i would bind them up and wash them with my own hands i would nurse the afflicted i would be ready to kiss such wounds it is much and well that your mind is full of such dreams and not others sometime unawares you may do a good deed in reality 
yes but could i endure such a life for long the lady went on fervently almost frantically that's the chief question that's my most agonizing question i shut my eyes and ask myself would you persevere long on that path and if the patient whose wounds you are washing did not meet you with gratitude but worried you with his whims without valuing or remarking your charitable services began abusing you and rudely commanding you and complaining to the superior authorities of you which often happens when people are in great suffering what then would you persevere in your love or not and do you know i came with horror to the conclusion that if anything could dissipate my love to humanity it would be ingratitude in short i am a hired servant i expect my payment at once that is praise and the repayment of love with love otherwise i am incapable of loving any one she was in a very paroxysm of self-castigation and concluding she looked with defiant resolution at the elder it's just the same story as a doctor once told me observed the elder he was a man getting on in years and undoubtedly clever he spoke as frankly as you though in jest in bitter jest i love humanity he said but i wonder at myself the more i love humanity in general the less i love man in particular in my dreams he said i have often come to making enthusiastic schemes for the service of humanity and perhaps i might actually have faced crucifixion if it had been suddenly necessary and yet i am incapable of living in the same room with any one for two days together as i know by experience as soon as any one is near me his personality disturbs my self-complacency and restricts my freedom in twenty-four hours i begin to hate the best of men one because he's too long over his dinner another because he has a cold and keeps on blowing his nose i become hostile to people the moment they come close to me but it has always happened that the more i detest men individually the more ardent becomes my love for humanity but what's to be done what can one do in such a case must one despair no it is enough that you are distressed at it do what you can and it will be reckoned unto you much is done already in you since you can so deeply and sincerely know yourself if you have been talking to me so sincerely simply to gain approbation for your frankness as you did for me just now then of course you will not attain to anything in the achievement of real love it will all get no further than dreams and your whole life will slip away like a phantom in that case you will naturally cease to think of the future life too and will of yourself grow calmer after a fashion in the end you have crushed me only now as you speak i understand that i was really only seeking your approbation for my sincerity when i told you i could not endure ingratitude you have revealed me to myself you have seen through me and explained me to myself are you speaking the truth well now after such a confession i believe that you are sincere and good at heart if you do not attain happiness always remember that you are on the right road and try not to leave it above all avoid falsehood every kind of falsehood especially falseness to yourself watch over your own deceitfulness and look into it every hour every minute avoid being scornful both to others and to yourself what seems to you bad within you will grow purer from the very fact of your observing it in yourself avoid fear too though fear is only the consequence of every sort of falsehood never be frightened at your own faint-heartedness in attaining love don't be frightened over much even at your evil actions i am sorry i can say nothing more consoling to you for love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing 
compared with love in dreams love in dreams is greedy for immediate action rapidly performed and in the sight of all men will even give their lives if only the ordeal does not last long but is soon over with all looking on and applauding as though on the stage but active love is labor and fortitude and for some people too perhaps a complete science but i predict that just when you see with horror that in spite of all your efforts you are getting farther from your goal instead of nearer to it at that very moment i predict that you will reach it and behold clearly the miraculous power of the lord who has been all the time loving and mysteriously guiding you forgive me for not being able to stay longer with you they are waiting for me good-bye the lady was weeping lise lise bless her bless her she cried starting up suddenly she does not deserve to be loved i have seen her naughtiness all along the elder said jestingly why have you been laughing at alexey lise had in fact been occupied in mocking at him all the time she had noticed before that alyosha was shy and tried not to look at her and she found this extremely amusing she waited intently to catch his eye alyosha unable to endure her persistent stare was irresistibly and suddenly drawn to glance at her and at once she smiled triumphantly in his face alyosha was even more disconcerted and vexed at last he turned away from her altogether and hid behind the elder's back after a few minutes drawn by the same irresistible force he turned again to see whether he was being looked at or not and found lise almost hanging out of her chair to peep sideways at him eagerly waiting for him to look catching his eye she laughed so that the elder could not help saying why do you make fun of him like that naughty girl lise suddenly and quite unexpectedly blushed her eyes flashed and her face became quite serious she began speaking quickly and nervously in a warm and resentful voice why has he forgotten everything then he used to carry me about when i was little we used to play together he used to come to teach me to read do you know two years ago when he went away he said that he would never forget me that we were friends for ever for ever for ever and now he's afraid of me all at once am i going to eat him why doesn't he want to come near me why doesn't he talk why won't he come and see us it's not that you won't let him we know that he goes everywhere it's not good manners for me to invite him he ought to have thought of it first if he hasn't forgotten me no now he's saving his soul why have you put that long gown on him if he runs he'll fall and suddenly she hid her face in her hand and went off into irresistible prolonged nervous inaudible laughter the elder listened to her with a smile and blessed her tenderly as she kissed his hand she suddenly pressed it to her eyes and began crying don't be angry with me i'm silly and good for nothing and perhaps alyosha is right quite right in not wanting to come and see such a ridiculous girl i will certainly send him said the elder end of section nine Section 10 of The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book 2, Chapter 5. So be it, so be it. The elder's absence from his cell had lasted for about twenty five minutes. It was more than half past twelve, but Dmitri, on whose account they had all met there, had still not appeared but he seemed almost to be forgotten and when the elder entered the cell again he found his guests engaged in eager conversation ivan and the two monks took the leading share in it musov too was trying to take a part and apparently very eagerly in the conversation 
but he was unsuccessful in this also he was evidently in the background and his remarks were treated with neglect which increased his irritability he had had intellectual encounters with ivan before and he could not endure a certain carelessness ivan showed him hitherto at least i have stood in the front ranks of all that is progressive in europe and here the new generation positively ignores us he thought fyodor pavlovitch who had given his word to sit still and be quiet had actually been quiet for some time but he watched his neighbor Musov with an ironical little smile obviously enjoying his discomfiture he had been waiting for some time to pay off old scores and now he could not let the opportunity slip bending over his shoulder he began teasing him again in a whisper why didn't you go away just now after the courteously kissing why did you consent to remain in such unseemly company it was because you felt insulted and aggrieved and you remained to vindicate yourself by showing off your intelligence now you won't go till you've displayed your intellect to them you again on the contrary i'm just going you'll be the last the last of all to go fyodor pavlovitch delivered him another thrust almost at the moment of father zossima's return the discussion died down for a moment but the elder seating himself in his former place looked at them all as though cordially inviting them to go on alyosha who knew every expression of his face saw that he was fearfully exhausted and making a great effort of late he had been liable to fainting fits from exhaustion his face had the pallor that was common before such attacks and his lips were white but he evidently did not want to break up the party he seemed to have some special object of his own in keeping them what object alyosha watched him intently we are discussing this gentleman's most interesting article said father yosef the librarian addressing the elder and indicating ivan he brings forward much that is new but i think the argument cuts both ways it is an article written in answer to a book by an ecclesiastical authority on the question of the ecclesiastical court and the scope of its jurisdiction i'm sorry i have not read your article but i've heard of it said the elder looking keenly and intently at ivan he takes up a most interesting position continued the father librarian as far as church jurisdiction is concerned he is apparently quite opposed to the separation of church from state that's interesting but in what sense father zossima asked ivan the latter at last answered him not condescendingly as alyosha had feared but with modesty and reserve with evident good will and apparently without the slightest arriere pensee i start from the position that this confusion of elements that is of the essential principles of church and state will of course go on for ever in spite of the fact that it is impossible for them to mingle and that the confusion of these elements cannot lead to any consistent or even normal results for there is falsity at the very foundation of it compromise between the church and state in such questions as for instance jurisdiction is to my thinking impossible in any real sense my clerical opponent maintains that the church holds a precise and defined position in the state i maintain on the contrary that the church ought to include the whole state and not simply to occupy a corner in it and if this is for some reason impossible at present then it ought in reality to be set up as the direct and chief aim of the future development of christian society perfectly true father paisi the silent and learned monk assented with fervor and decision the purest ultramontanism cried musov impatiently crossing and recrossing his legs oh well we have no mountains cried father yosef and turning to the elder he continued 
observe the answer he makes to the following fundamental and essential propositions of his opponent who is you must note an ecclesiastic first that no social organization can or ought to arrogate to itself power to dispose of the civic and political rights of its members secondly that criminal and civil jurisdiction ought not to belong to the church and is inconsistent with its nature both as a divine institution and as an organization of men for religious objects and finally in the third place the church is a kingdom not of this world a most unworthy play upon words for an ecclesiastic father paisi could not refrain from breaking in again i have read the book which you have answered he added addressing ivan and was astounded at the words the church is a kingdom not of this world if it is not of this world then it cannot exist on earth at all in the gospel the words not of this world are not used in that sense to play with such words is indefensible our lord jesus christ came to set up the church upon earth the kingdom of heaven of course is not of this world but in heaven but it is only entered through the church which has been founded and established upon earth and so a frivolous play upon words in such a connection is unpardonable and improper the church is in truth a kingdom and ordained to rule and in the end must undoubtedly become the kingdom ruling over all the earth for that we have the divine promise he ceased speaking suddenly as though checking himself after listening attentively and respectfully ivan went on addressing the elder with perfect composure and as before with ready cordiality the whole point of my article lies in the fact that during the first three centuries christianity only existed on earth in the church and was nothing but the church when the pagan roman empire desired to become christian it inevitably happened that by becoming christian it included the church but remained a pagan state in very many of its departments in reality this was bound to happen but rome as a state retained too much of the pagan civilization and culture as for example in the very objects and fundamental principles of the state the christian church entering into the state could of course surrender no part of its fundamental principles the rock on which it stands and could pursue no other aims than those which have been ordained and revealed by god himself and among them that of drawing the whole world and therefore the ancient pagan state itself into the church in that way that is with a view to the future it is not the church that should seek a definite position in the state like every social organization or as an organization of men for religious purposes as my opponent calls the church but on the contrary every earthly state should be in the end completely transformed into the church and should become nothing else but a church rejecting every purpose incongruous with the aims of the church and this will not degrade it in any way or take from its honor and glory as a great state nor from the glory of its rulers but only turns it from a false still pagan and mistaken path to the true and rightful path which alone leads to the eternal goal this is why the author of the book on the foundations of church jurisdiction would have judged correctly if in seeking and laying down those foundations he had looked upon them as a temporary compromise inevitable in our sinful and imperfect days but as soon as the author ventures to declare that the foundations which he predicates now part of which father yosef just enumerated are the permanent essential and eternal foundations he is going directly against the church and its sacred and eternal vocation that is the gist of my article that is in brief father paisi began again laying stress on each word 
according to certain theories only too clearly formulated in the nineteenth century the church ought to be transformed into the state as though this would be an advance from a lower to a higher form so as to disappear into it making way for science for the spirit of the age and civilization and if the church resists and is unwilling some corner will be set apart for her in the state and even that under control and this will be so everywhere in all modern european countries but russian hopes and conceptions demand not that the church should pass as from a lower into a higher type into the state but on the contrary that the state should end by being worthy to become only the church and nothing else so be it so be it well i confess you've reassured me somewhat musov said smiling again crossing his legs so far as i understand then the realization of such an ideal is infinitely remote at the second coming of christ that's as you please it's a beautiful utopian dream of the abolition of war diplomacy banks and so on something after the fashion of socialism indeed but i imagined that it was all meant seriously and that the church might be now going to try criminals and sentence them to beating prison and even death but if there were none but the ecclesiastical court the church would not even now sentence a criminal to prison or to death crime and the way of regarding it would inevitably change not all at once of course but fairly soon ivan replied calmly without flinching are you serious yusof glanced keenly at him if everything became the church the church would exclude all the criminal and disobedient and would not cut off their heads ivan went on i ask you what would become of the excluded he would be cut off then not only from men as now but from christ by his crime he would have transgressed not only against men but against the church of christ this is so even now of course strictly speaking but it is not clearly enunciated and very very often the criminal of to-day compromises with his conscience i steal he says but i don't go against the church i'm not an enemy of christ that's what the criminal of to-day is continually saying to himself but when the church takes the place of the state it will be difficult for him in opposition to the church all over the world to say all men are mistaken all in error all mankind are the false church i a thief and murderer am the only true christian church it will be very difficult to say this to himself it requires a rare combination of unusual circumstances now on the other side take the church's own view of crime is it not bound to renounce the present almost pagan attitude and to change from a mechanical cutting off of its tainted member for the preservation of society as at present into completely and honestly adopting the idea of the regeneration of the man of his reformation and salvation what do you mean i fail to understand again yusof interrupted some sort of dream again something shapeless and even incomprehensible what is excommunication what sort of exclusion i suspect you are simply amusing yourself ivan fyodorovitch yes but you know in reality it is so now said the elder suddenly and all turned to him at once if it were not for the church of christ there would be nothing to restrain the criminal from evil doing no real chastisement for it afterwards none that is but the mechanical punishment spoken of just now which in the majority of cases only embitters the heart and not the real punishment the only effectual one the only deterrent and softening one which lies in the recognition of sin by conscience how is that may one inquire asked musov with lively curiosity why 
began the elder all these sentences to exile with hard labor and formerly with flogging also reform no one and what's more deter hardly a single criminal and the number of crimes does not diminish but is continually on the increase you must admit that consequently the security of society is not preserved for although the obnoxious member is mechanically cut off and sent far away out of sight another criminal always comes to take his place at once and often two of them if anything does preserve society even in our time and does regenerate and transform the criminal it is only the law of christ speaking in his conscience it is only by recognizing his wrongdoing as a son of a christian society that is of the church that he recognizes his sin against society that is against the church so that it is only against the church and not against the state that the criminal of to-day can recognize that he has sinned if society as a church had jurisdiction then it would know when to bring back from exclusion and to reunite to itself now the church having no real jurisdiction but only the power of moral condemnation withdraws of her own accord from punishing the criminal actively she does not excommunicate him but simply persists in motherly exhortation of him what is more the church even tries to preserve all christian communion with the criminal she admits him to church services to the holy sacrament gives him alms and treats him more as a captive than as a convict and what would become of the criminal o oh lord if even the christian society that is the church were to reject him even as the civil law rejects him and cuts him off what would become of him if the church punished him with her excommunication as the direct consequence of the secular law there could be no more terrible despair at least for a russian criminal for russian criminals still have faith though who knows perhaps then a fearful thing would happen perhaps the despairing heart of the criminal would lose its faith and then what would become of him but the church like a tender loving mother holds aloof from active punishment herself as the sinner is too severely punished already by the civil law and there must be at least some one to have pity on him the church holds aloof above all because its judgment is the only one that contains the truth and therefore cannot practically and morally be united to any other judgment even as a temporary compromise she can enter into no compact about that the foreign criminal they say rarely repents for the very doctrines of to-day confirm him in the idea that his crime is not a crime but only a reaction against an unjustly oppressive force society cuts him off completely by a force that triumphs over him mechanically and so at least they say of themselves in europe accompanies this exclusion with hatred forgetfulness and the most profound indifference as to the ultimate fate of the erring brother in this way it all takes place without the compassionate intervention of the church for in many cases there are no churches there at all for though ecclesiastics and splendid church buildings remain the churches themselves have long ago striven to pass from church into state and to disappear in it completely so it seems at least in lutheran countries as for rome it was proclaimed a state instead of a church a thousand years ago and so the criminal is no longer conscious of being a member of the church and sinks into despair if he returns to society often it is with such hatred that society itself instinctively cuts him off you can judge for yourself how it must end in many cases it would seem to be the same with us but the difference is that besides the established law courts we have the church too which always keeps up relations with the criminal as a dear and still precious son 
and besides that there is still preserved though only in thought the judgment of the church which though no longer existing in practice is still living as a dream for the future and is no doubt instinctively recognized by the criminal in his soul what was said here just now is true too that is that if the jurisdiction of the church were introduced in practice in its full force that is if the whole of the society were changed into the church not only the judgment of the church would have influence on the reformation of the criminal such as it never has now but possibly also the crimes themselves would be incredibly diminished and there can be no doubt that the church would look upon the criminal and the crime of the future in many cases quite differently and would succeed in restoring the excluded in restraining those who plan evil and in regenerating the fallen it is true said father zossima with a smile the christian society now is not ready and is only resting on some seven righteous men but as they are never lacking it will continue still unshaken in expectation of its complete transformation from a society almost heathen in character into a single universal and all-powerful church so be it so be it even though at the end of the ages for it is ordained to come to pass and there is no need to be troubled about times and seasons for the secret of the times and seasons is in the wisdom of god in his foresight and his love and what in human reckoning seems still afar off may by the divine ordinance be close at hand on the eve of its appearance and so be it so be it so be it so be it father paisi repeated austerely and reverently strange extremely strange musov pronounced not so much with heat as with latent indignation what strikes you as so strange father yosef inquired cautiously why it's beyond anything cried musov suddenly breaking out the state is eliminated and the church is raised to the position of the state it's not simply ultramontanism it's arch ultramontanism it's beyond the dreams of pope gregory the seventh you are completely misunderstanding it said father paisi sternly understand the church is not to be transformed into the state that is rome and its dream that is the third temptation of the devil on the contrary the state is transformed into the church will ascend and become a church over the whole world which is the complete opposite of ultramontanism and rome and your interpretation and is only the glorious destiny ordained for the orthodox church this star will arise in the east Yusov was significantly silent his whole figure expressed extraordinary personal dignity a supercilious and condescending smile played on his lips alyosha watched it all with a throbbing heart the whole conversation stirred him profoundly he glanced casually at rakitin who was standing immovable in his place by the door listening and watching intently though with downcast eyes but from the colour in his cheeks alyosha guessed that rakitin was probably no less excited and he knew what caused his excitement allow me to tell you one little anecdote gentlemen musov said impressively with a peculiarly majestic air some years ago soon after the coup d'etat of december i happened to be calling in paris on an extremely influential personage in the government and i met a very interesting man in his house this individual was not precisely a detective but was a sort of superintendent of a whole regiment of political detectives a rather powerful position in its own way i was prompted by curiosity to seize the opportunity of conversation with him and as he had not come as a visitor but as a subordinate official bringing a special report and as he saw the reception given me by his chief 
he deigned to speak with some openness to a certain extent only of course he was rather courteous than open as frenchmen know how to be courteous especially to a foreigner but i thoroughly understood him the subject was the socialist revolutionaries who were at that time persecuted i will quote only one most curious remark dropped by this person we are not particularly afraid said he of all these socialists anarchists infidels and revolutionists we keep watch on them and know all their goings-on but there are a few peculiar men among them who believe in god and are christians but at the same time are socialists these are the people we are most afraid of they are dreadful people the socialist who is a christian is more to be dreaded than a socialist who is an atheist the words struck me at the time and now they have suddenly come back to me here gentlemen you apply them to us and look upon us as socialists father paisi asked directly without beating about the bush but before pyotr alexandrovitch could think what to answer the door opened and the guest so long expected dmitri fyodorovitch came in they had in fact given up expecting him and his sudden appearance caused some surprise for a moment End of section 10. Section 11 of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book 2, Chapter 6. Why is such a man alive? Dmitri Fyodorovitch, a young man of eight-and-twenty, of medium height and agreeable countenance, looked older than his years. He was muscular and showed signs of considerable physical strength. Yet there was something not healthy in his face. It was rather thin, his cheeks were hollow, and there was an unhealthy sallowness in their color. His rather large, prominent, dark eyes had an expression of firm determination, and yet there was a vague look in them, too. Even when he was excited and talking irritably, his eyes somehow did not follow his mood, but betrayed something else, sometimes quite incongruous with what was passing. It's hard to tell what he's thinking, those who talked to him sometimes declared people who saw something pensive and sullen in his eyes were startled by his sudden laugh which bore witness to mirthful and light-hearted thoughts at the very time when his eyes were so gloomy a certain strained look in his face was easy to understand at this moment every one knew or had heard of the extremely restless and dissipated life which he had been leading of late as well as of the violent anger to which he had been roused in his quarrels with his father there were several stories current in the town about it it is true that he was irascible by nature of an unstable and unbalanced mind as our justice of the peace ketchalnikov happily described him he was stylishly and irreproachably dressed in a carefully buttoned frock coat he wore black gloves and carried a top hat having only lately left the army he still had moustaches and no beard his dark brown hair was cropped short and combed forward on his temples he had the long determined stride of a military man he stood still for a moment on the threshold and glancing at the whole party went straight up to the elder guessing him to be their host he made him a low bow and asked his blessing father zosima rising in his chair blessed him dmitri kissed his hand respectfully and with intense feeling almost anger he said be so generous as to forgive me for having kept you waiting so long but smerdyakov the valet sent me by my father in reply to my inquiries told me twice over that the appointment was for one now i suddenly learn don't disturb yourself interposed the elder no matter you are a little late it's of no consequence i'm extremely obliged to you and expected no less from your goodness saying this dmitri bowed once more then turning suddenly towards his father 
made him too a similarly low and respectful bow he had evidently considered it beforehand and made this bow in all seriousness thinking it his duty to show his respect and good intentions although fyodor pavlovitch was taken unawares he was equal to the occasion in response to dmitri's bow he jumped up from his chair and made his son a bow as low in return his face was suddenly solemn and impressive which gave him a positively malignant look dmitri bowed generally to all present and without a word walked to the window with his long resolute stride sat down on the only empty chair near father paisy and bending forward prepared to listen to the conversation he had interrupted dmitri's entrance had taken no more than two minutes and the conversation was resumed but this time musov thought it unnecessary to reply to father paisy's persistent and almost irritable question allow me to withdraw from this discussion he observed with a certain well-bred nonchalance it's a subtle question too here ivan fyodorovitch is smiling at us he must have something interesting to say about that also ask him nothing special except one little remark ivan replied at once european liberals in general and even our liberal dilettante often mix up the final results of socialism with those of christianity this wild notion is of course a characteristic feature but it's not only liberals and dilettante who mix up socialism and christianity but in many cases it appears the police the foreign police of course do the same your paris anecdote is rather to the point pyotr alexandrovitch i ask your permission to drop this subject altogether musov repeated i will tell you instead gentlemen another interesting and rather characteristic anecdote of ivan fyodorovitch himself only five days ago in a gathering here principally of ladies he solemnly declared in argument that there was nothing in the whole world to make men love their neighbors that there was no law of nature that man should love mankind and that if there had been any love on earth hitherto it was not owing to a natural law but simply because men have believed in immortality ivan fyodorovitch added in parenthesis that the whole natural law lies in that faith and that if you were to destroy in mankind the belief in immortality not only love but every living force maintaining the life of the world would at once be dried up moreover nothing then would be immoral everything would be lawful even cannibalism that's not all he ended by asserting that for every individual like ourselves who does not believe in god or immortality the moral law of nature must immediately be changed into the exact contrary of the former religious law and that egoism even to crime must become not only lawful but even recognized as the inevitable the most rational even honorable outcome of his position from this paradox gentlemen you can judge of the rest of our eccentric and paradoxical friend ivan fyodorovitch's theories excuse me dmitri cried suddenly if i've heard aright crime must not only be permitted but even recognized as the inevitable and the most rational outcome of his position for every infidel is that so or not quite so said father paisy i'll remember it having uttered these words dmitri ceased speaking as suddenly as he had begun every one looked at him with curiosity is that really your conviction as to the consequences of the disappearance of the faith in immortality the elder asked ivan suddenly yes that was my contention there is no virtue if there is no immortality you are blessed in believing that or else most unhappy why unhappy ivan asked smiling because in all probability you don't believe yourself in the immortality of your soul nor in what you have written yourself in your article on church jurisdiction perhaps you are right but i wasn't altogether joking ivan suddenly and strangely confessed flushing quickly 
you were not altogether joking that's true the question is still fretting your heart and not answered but the martyr likes sometimes to divert himself with his despair as it were driven to it by despair itself meanwhile in your despair you too divert yourself with magazine articles and discussions in society though you don't believe your own arguments and with an aching heart mock at them inwardly that question you have not answered and it is your great grief for it clamours for an answer but can it be answered by me answered in the affirmative ivan went on asking strangely still looking at the elder with the same inexplicable smile if it can't be decided in the affirmative it will never be decided in the negative you know that that is the peculiarity of your heart and all its suffering is due to it but thank the creator who has given you a lofty heart capable of such suffering of thinking and seeking higher things for our dwelling is in the heavens god grant that your heart will attain the answer on earth and may god bless your path the elder raised his hand and would have made the sign of the cross over ivan from where he stood but the latter rose from his seat went up to him received his blessing and kissing his hand went back to his place in silence his face looked firm and earnest this action and all the preceding conversation which was so surprising from ivan impressed every one by its strangeness and a certain solemnity so that all were silent for a moment and there was a look almost of apprehension in alyosha's face but musov suddenly shrugged his shoulders and at the same moment fyodor pavlovitch jumped up from his seat most pious and holy elder he cried pointing to ivan that is my son flesh of my flesh the dearest of my flesh he is my most dutiful karl moor so to speak while this son who has just come in dmitri against whom i am seeking justice from you is the undutiful franz moor they are both out of schiller's robbers and so i am the reigning count von moor judge and save us we need not only your prayers but your prophecies speak without buffoonery and don't begin by insulting the members of your family answered the elder in a faint exhausted voice he was obviously getting more and more fatigued and his strength was failing an unseemly farce which i foresaw when i came here cried dmitri indignantly he too leapt up forgive it reverend father he added addressing the elder i am not a cultivated man and i don't even know how to address you properly but you have been deceived and you have been too good-natured in letting us meet here all my father wants is a scandal why he wants it only he can tell he always has some motive but i believe i know why they all blame me all of them cried fyodor pavlovitch in his turn pyotr alexandrovitch here blames me too you have been blaming me pyotr alexandrovitch you have he turned suddenly to musov although the latter was not dreaming of interrupting him they all accuse me of having hidden the children's money in my boots and cheated them but isn't there a court of law there they will reckon out for you dmitri fyodorovitch from your notes your letters and your agreements how much money you had how much you have spent and how much you have left why does pyotr alexandrovitch refuse to pass judgment dmitri is not a stranger to him because they are all against me while dmitri fyodorovitch is in debt to me and not a little but some thousands of which i have documentary proof the whole town is echoing with his debaucheries and where he was stationed before he several times spent a thousand or two for the seduction of some respectable girl we know all about that dmitri fyodorovitch in its most secret details i'll prove it would you believe it holy father he has captivated the heart of the most honourable of young ladies of good family and fortune daughter of a gallant colonel formerly his superior officer who had received many honours and had the anna order on his breast he compromised the girl by his promise of marriage now she is an orphan and here she is betrothed to him 
yet before her very eyes he is dancing attendance on a certain enchantress and though this enchantress has lived in so to speak civil marriage with a respectable man yet she is of an independent character an unapproachable fortress for everybody just like a legal wife for she is virtuous yes holy fathers she is virtuous dmitri fyodorovitch wants to open this fortress with a golden key and that's why he is insolent to me now trying to get money from me though he has wasted thousands on this enchantress already he's continually borrowing money for the purpose from whom do you think shall i say mitya be silent cried dmitri wait till i'm gone don't dare in my presence to asperse the good name of an honourable girl that you should utter a word about her is an outrage and i won't permit it he was breathless mitya mitya cried fyodor pavlovitch hysterically squeezing out a tear and is your father's blessing nothing to you if i curse you what then shameless hypocrite exclaimed dmitri furiously he says that to his father his father what would he be with others gentlemen only fancy there's a poor but honourable man living here burdened with a numerous family a captain who got into trouble and was discharged from the army but not publicly not by court-martial with no slur on his honour and three weeks ago dmitri seized him by the beard in a tavern dragged him out into the street and beat him publicly and all because he is an agent in a little business of mine it's all a lie outwardly it's the truth but inwardly a lie dmitri was trembling with rage father i don't justify my action yes i confess it publicly i behaved like a brute to that captain and i regret it now and i'm disgusted with myself for my brutal rage but this captain this agent of yours went to that lady whom you call an enchantress and suggested to her from you that she should take i o u s of mine which were in your possession and should sue me for the money so as to get me into prison by means of them if i persisted in claiming an account from you of my property now you reproach me for having a weakness for that lady when you yourself incited her to captivate me she told me so to my face she told me the story and laughed at you you wanted to put me in prison because you were jealous of me with her because you'd begun to force your attentions upon her and i know all about that too she laughed at you for that as well you hear she laughed at you as she described it so here you have this man this father who reproaches his profligate son gentlemen forgive my anger but i foresaw that this crafty old man would only bring you together to create a scandal i had come to forgive him if he held out his hand to forgive him and ask forgiveness but as he has just this minute insulted not only me but an honourable young lady for whom i feel such reverence that i dare not take her name in vain i have made up my mind to show up his game though he is my father he could not go on his eyes were glittering and he breathed with difficulty but every one in the cell was stirred all except father zossima got up from their seats uneasily the monks looked austere but waited for guidance from the elder he sat still pale not from excitement but from the weakness of disease an imploring smile lighted up his face from time to time he raised his hand as though to check the storm and of course a gesture from him would have been enough to end the scene but he seemed to be waiting for something and watched them intently as though trying to make out something which was not perfectly clear to him at last musov felt completely humiliated and disgraced we are all to blame for this scandalous scene he said hotly but i did not foresee it when i came though i knew with whom i had to deal this must be stopped at once believe me your reverence i had no precise knowledge of the details that have just come to light i was unwilling to believe them and i learned for the first time a father is jealous of his son's relations with a woman of loose behaviour and intrigues with the creature to get his son into prison this is the company in which i have been forced to be present i was deceived 
i declare to you all that i was as much deceived as any one dmitri fyodorovitch yelled fyodor pavlovitch suddenly in an unnatural voice if you were not my son i would challenge you this instant to a duel with pistols at three paces across a handkerchief he ended stamping with both feet with old liars who have been acting all their lives there are moments when they enter so completely into their part that they tremble or shed tears of emotion in earnest though at that very moment or a second later they are able to whisper to themselves you know you are lying you shameless old sinner you're acting now in spite of your holy wrath dmitri frowned painfully and looked with unutterable contempt at his father i thought i thought he said in a soft and as it were controlled voice that i was coming to my native place with the angel of my heart my betrothed to cherish his old age and i find nothing but a depraved profligate a despicable clown a duel yelled the old wretch again breathless and spluttering at each syllable and you pyotr alexandrovitch musov let me tell you that there has never been in all your family a loftier and more honest you hear more honest woman than this creature as you have dared to call her and you dmitri fyodorovitch have abandoned your betrothed for that creature so you must yourself have thought that your betrothed couldn't hold a candle to her that's the woman called a creature shameful broke from father yosef shameful and disgraceful kalganov flushing crimson cried in a boyish voice trembling with emotion he had been silent till that moment why is such a man alive dmitri beside himself with rage growled in a hollow voice hunching up his shoulders till he looked almost deformed tell me can he be allowed to go on defiling the earth he looked round at every one and pointed at the old man he spoke evenly and deliberately listen listen monks to the parricide cried fyodor pavlovitch rushing up to father yosef that's the answer to your shameful what is shameful that creature that woman of loose behavior is perhaps holier than you are yourselves you monks who are seeking salvation she fell perhaps in her youth ruined by her environment but she loved much and christ himself forgave the woman who loved much it was not for such love christ forgave her broke impatiently from the gentle father yosef yes it was for such monks it was you save your souls here eating cabbage and think you are the righteous you eat a gudgeon a day and you think you bribe god with gudgeon this is unendurable was heard on all sides in the cell but this unseemly scene was cut short in a most unexpected way father zasima rose suddenly from his seat almost distracted with anxiety for the elder and every one else alyosha succeeded however in supporting him by the arm father zasima moved towards dmitri and reaching him sank on his knees before him alyosha thought that he had fallen from weakness but this was not so the elder distinctly and deliberately bowed down at dmitri's feet till his forehead touched the floor alyosha was so astounded that he failed to assist him when he got up again there was a faint smile on his lips good-bye forgive me all of you he said bowing on all sides to his guests dmitri stood for a few moments in amazement bowing down to him what did it mean suddenly he cried aloud oh god hid his face in his hands and rushed out of the room all the guests flocked out after him in their confusion not saying good-bye or bowing to their host only the monks went up to him again for a blessing what did it mean falling at his feet like that was it symbolic or what said fyodor pavlovitch suddenly quieted and trying to reopen conversation without venturing to address anybody in particular they were all passing out of the precincts of the hermitage at the moment 
i can't answer for a madhouse and for madmen musov answered at once ill-humouredly but i will spare myself your company fyodor pavlovitch and trust me for ever where's that monk that monk that is the monk who had invited them to dine with the superior did not keep them waiting he met them as soon as they came down the steps from the elder's cell as though he had been waiting for them all the time reverend father kindly do me a favor convey my deepest respect to the father superior apologize for me personally musov to his reverence telling him that i deeply regret that owing to unforeseen circumstances i am unable to have the honor of being present at his table greatly as i should desire to do so musov said irritably to the monk and that unforeseen circumstance of course is myself fyodor pavlovitch cut in immediately do you hear father this gentleman doesn't want to remain in my company or else he'd come at once and you shall go pyotr alexandrovitch pray go to the father superior and good appetite to you i will decline and not you home home i'll eat at home i don't feel equal to it here pyotr alexandrovitch my amiable relative i am not your relative and never have been you contemptible man i said it on purpose to madden you because you always disclaim the relationship though you really are a relation in spite of your shuffling i'll prove it by the church calendar as for you ivan stay if you like i'll send the horses for you later propriety requires you to go to the father superior pyotr alexandrovitch to apologize for the disturbance we've been making is it true that you are going home aren't you lying pyotr alexandrovitch how could i dare after what's happened forgive me gentlemen i was carried away and upset besides and indeed i am ashamed gentlemen one man has the heart of alexander of macedon and another the heart of the little dog fido mine is that of the little dog fido i am ashamed after such an escapade how can i go to dinner to gobble up the monastery's sauces i am ashamed i can't you must excuse me the devil only knows what if he deceives us thought musov still hesitating and watching the retreating buffoon with distrustful eyes the latter turned round and noticing that musov was watching him waved him a kiss well are you coming to the superior musov asked ivan abruptly why not i was especially invited yesterday unfortunately i feel myself compelled to go to this confounded dinner said musov with the same irritability regardless of the fact that the monk was listening we ought at least to apologize for the disturbance and explain that it was not our doing what do you think yes we must explain that it wasn't our doing besides father won't be there observed ivan well i should hope not confound this dinner they all walked on however the monk listened in silence on the road through the copse he made one observation however that the father superior had been waiting a long time and that they were more than half an hour late he received no answer musov looked with hatred at ivan here he is going to the dinner as though nothing had happened he thought a brazen face and the conscience of a karamazov end of section eleven Section twelve of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book two, chapter seven. A young man bent on a career. Alyosha helped Father Zosima to his bedroom and seated him on his bed. It was a little room furnished with the bare necessities there was a narrow iron bedstead with a strip of felt for a mattress in the corner under the icons was a reading-desk with the cross and the gospel lying on it the elder sank exhausted on the bed his eyes glittered and he breathed hard 
he looked intently at alyosha as though considering something go my dear boy go porfiry is enough for me make haste you are needed there go and wait at the father superior's table let me stay here alyosha entreated you are more needed there there is no peace there you will wait and be of service if evil spirits rise up repeat a prayer and remember my son the elder liked to call him that this is not the place for you in the future when it is god's will to call me leave the monastery go away for good alyosha started what is it this is not your place for the time i bless you for great service in the world yours will be a long pilgrimage and you will have to take a wife too you will have to bear all before you come back there will be much to do but i don't doubt of you and so i send you forth christ is with you do not abandon him and he will not abandon you you will see great sorrow and in that sorrow you will be happy this is my last message to you in sorrow seek happiness work work unceasingly remember my words for although i shall talk with you again not only my days but my hours are numbered alyosha's face again betrayed strong emotion the corners of his mouth quivered what is it again father zosima asked smiling gently the worldly may follow the dead with tears but here we rejoice over the father who is departing we rejoice and pray for him leave me i must pray go and make haste be near your brothers and not near one only but near both father zosima raised his hand to bless him alyosha could make no protest though he had a great longing to remain he longed moreover to ask the significance of his bowing to dmitri the question was on the tip of his tongue but he dared not ask it he knew that the elder would have explained it unasked if he had thought fit but evidently it was not his will that action had made a terrible impression on alyosha he believed blindly in its mysterious significance mysterious and perhaps awful as he hastened out of the hermitage precincts to reach the monastery in time to serve at the father superior's dinner he felt a sudden pang at his heart and stopped short he seemed to hear again father zosima's words foretelling his approaching end what he had foretold so exactly must infallibly come to pass alyosha believed that implicitly but how could he be left without him how could he live without seeing and hearing him where should he go he had told him not to weep and to leave the monastery good god it was long since alyosha had known such anguish he hurried through the copse that divided the monastery from the hermitage and unable to bear the burden of his thoughts he gazed at the ancient pines beside the path he had not far to go about five hundred paces he expected to meet no one at that hour but at the first turn of the path he noticed rakitin he was waiting for some one are you waiting for me asked alyosha overtaking him yes grinned rakitin you are hurrying to the father superior i know he has a banquet there's not been such a banquet since the superior entertained the bishop and general Pahatov do you remember i shan't be there but you go and hand the sauces tell me one thing alexey what does that vision mean that's what i want to ask you what vision that bowing to your brother dmitri and didn't he tap the ground with his forehead too you speak of father zosima yes of father zosima tapped the ground ah an irreverent expression well what of it anyway what does that vision mean i don't know what it means misha i knew he wouldn't explain it to you there's nothing wonderful about it of course only the usual holy mummery but there was an object in the performance all the pious people in the town will talk about it and spread the story through the province wondering what it meant 
to my thinking the old man really has a keen nose he sniffed a crime your house stinks of it what crime rakitin evidently had something he was eager to speak of it will be in your family this crime between your brothers and your rich old father so father zosima flopped down to be ready for what may turn up if something happens later on it'll be ah the holy man foresaw it prophesied it though it's a poor sort of prophecy flopping like that ah but it was symbolic they'll say an allegory and the devil knows what all it'll be remembered to his glory he predicted the crime and marked the criminal that's always the way with these crazy fanatics they cross themselves at the tavern and throw stones at the temple like your elder he takes a stick to a just man and falls at the feet of a murderer what crime what murderer what do you mean alyosha stopped dead rakitin stopped too what murderer as though you didn't know i bet you'd thought of it before that's interesting too by the way listen alyosha you always speak the truth though you're always between two stools have you thought of it or not answer i have answered alyosha in a low voice even rakitin was taken aback what have you really he cried i i've not exactly thought it muttered alyosha but directly you began speaking so strangely i fancied i had thought of it myself you see and how well you've expressed it looking at your father and your brother mitya to-day you thought of a crime then i'm not mistaken but wait wait a minute alyosha broke in uneasily what has led you to see all this why does it interest you that's the first question two questions disconnected but natural i'll deal with them separately what led me to see it i shouldn't have seen it if i hadn't suddenly understood your brother dmitri seen right into the very heart of him all at once i caught the whole man from one trait these very honest but passionate people have a line which mustn't be crossed if it were he'd run at your father with a knife but your father's a drunken and abandoned old sinner who can never draw the line if they both let themselves go they'll both come to grief no misha no if that's all you've reassured me it won't come to that but why are you trembling let me tell you he may be honest our mitya he is stupid but honest but he's a sensualist that's the very definition and inner essence of him it's your father has handed him on his low sensuality do you know i simply wonder at you alyosha how you can have kept your purity you're a karamazov too you know in your family sensuality is carried to a disease but now these three sensualists are watching one another with their knives in their belts the three of them are knocking their heads together and you may be the fourth you are mistaken about that woman dmitri despises her said alyosha with a sort of shudder grushenka no brother he doesn't despise her since he has openly abandoned his betrothed for her he doesn't despise her there's something here my dear boy that you don't understand yet a man will fall in love with some beauty with a woman's body or even with a part of a woman's body a sensualist can understand that and he'll abandon his own children for her sell his father and mother and his country russia too if he's honest he'll steal if he's humane he'll murder if he's faithful he'll deceive pushkin the poet of women's feet sung of their feet in his verse others don't sing their praises but they can't look at their feet without a thrill and it's not only their feet contempt's no help here brother even if he did despise grushenka he does but he can't tear himself away i understand that alyosha jerked out suddenly really well i dare say you do understand since you blurted out at the first word said rakitin malignantly that escaped you unawares and the confession's the more precious so it's a familiar subject 
you thought about it already about sensuality i mean oh you virgin soul you're a quiet one alyosha you're a saint i know but the devil only knows what you've thought about and what you know already you are pure but you've been down into the depths i've been watching you a long time you're a karamazov yourself you're a thorough karamazov no doubt birth and selection have something to answer for you're a sensualist from your father a crazy saint from your mother why do you tremble is it true then do you know grushenka has been begging me to bring you along i'll pull off his cassock she says you can't think how she keeps begging me to bring you i wondered why she took such an interest in you do you know she's an extraordinary woman too thank her and say i'm not coming said alyosha with a strained smile finish what you were saying misha i'll tell you my idea after there's nothing to finish it's all clear it's the same old tune brother if even you are a sensualist at heart what of your brother ivan he's a karamazov too what is at the root of all you karamazovs is that you're all sensual grasping and crazy your brother ivan writes theological articles in joke for some idiotic unknown motive of his own though he's an atheist and he admits it's a fraud himself that's your brother ivan he's trying to get mitya's betrothed for himself and i fancy he'll succeed too and what's more it's with mitya's consent for mitya will surrender his betrothed to him to be rid of her and escape to grushenka and he's ready to do that in spite of all his nobility and disinterestedness observe that those are the most fatal people who the devil can make you out he recognizes his vileness and goes on with it let me tell you too the old man your father is standing in mitya's way now he has suddenly gone crazy over grushenka his mouth waters at the sight of her it's simply on her account he made that scene in the cell just now simply because musov called her an abandoned creature he's worse than a tomcat in love at first she was only employed by him in connection with his taverns and in some other shady business but now he has suddenly realized all she is and has gone wild about her he keeps pestering her with his offers not honorable ones of course and they'll come into collision the precious father and son on that path but grushenka favors neither of them she's still playing with them and teasing them both considering which she can get the most out of for though she could filch a lot of money from the papa he wouldn't marry her and maybe he'll turn stingy in the end and keep his purse shut that's where mitch's value comes in he has no money but he's ready to marry her yes ready to marry her to abandon his betrothed a rare beauty katerina ivanovna who's rich and the daughter of a colonel and to marry grushenka who has been the mistress of a dissolute old merchant samsonov a coarse uneducated provincial mayor some murderous conflict may well come to pass from all this and that's what your brother ivan is waiting for it would suit him down to the ground he'll carry off katerina ivanovna for whom he is languishing and pocket her dowry of sixty thousand that's very alluring to start with for a man of no consequence and a beggar and take note he won't be wronging mitya but doing him the greatest service for i know as a fact that mitya only last week when he was with some gypsy girls drunk in a tavern cried out aloud that he was unworthy of his betrothed katya but that his brother ivan he was the man who deserved her and katerina ivanovna will not in the end refuse such a fascinating man as ivan she's hesitating between the two of them already and how has that ivan won you all so that you all worship him he is laughing at you and enjoying himself at your expense how do you know how can you speak so confidently 
alyosha asked sharply frowning why do you ask and are frightened at my answer it shows that you know i'm speaking the truth you don't like ivan ivan wouldn't be tempted by money really and the beauty of katerina ivanovna is not only the money though a fortune of sixty thousand is an attraction ivan is above that he wouldn't make up to anyone for thousands it is not money it's not comfort ivan is seeking perhaps it's suffering he is seeking what wild dream now oh you aristocrats ah oh, misha he has a stormy spirit his mind is in bondage he is haunted by a great unsolved doubt he is one of those who don't want millions but an answer to their questions that's plagiarism alyosha you're quoting your elders phrases ah ivan has set you a problem cried rakitin with undisguised malice his face changed and his lips twitched and the problem's a stupid one it's no good guessing it rack your brains you'll understand it his article is absurd and ridiculous and did you hear his stupid theory just now if there's no immortality of the soul then there's no virtue and everything is lawful and by the way do you remember how your brother mitya cried out i will remember an attractive theory for scoundrels i'm being abusive that's stupid not for scoundrels but for pedantic poseurs haunted by profound unsolved doubts he's showing off and what it all comes to is on the one hand we cannot but admit and on the other it must be confessed his whole theory is a fraud humanity will find in itself the power to live for virtue even without believing in immortality it will find it in love for freedom for equality for fraternity rakitin could hardly restrain himself in his heat but suddenly as though remembering something he stopped short well that's enough he said with a still more crooked smile why are you laughing do you think i'm a vulgar fool no i never dreamed of thinking you a vulgar fool you are clever but never mind i was silly to smile i understand you're getting hot about it misha i guess from your warmth that you are not indifferent to katerina ivanovna yourself i've suspected that for a long time brother that's why you don't like my brother ivan are you jealous of him and jealous of her money too won't you add that i'll say nothing about money i'm not going to insult you i believe it since you say so but confound you and your brother ivan with you don't you understand that one might very well dislike him apart from katerina ivanovna and why the devil should i like him he condescends to abuse me you know why haven't i a right to abuse him i've never heard of his saying anything about you good or bad he doesn't speak of you at all but i heard that the day before yesterday at katerina ivanovna's he was abusing me for all he was worth you see what an interest he takes in your humble servant and which is the jealous one after that brother i can't say he was so good as to express the opinion that if i don't go in for the career of an archimandrite in the immediate future and don't become a monk i shall be sure to go to petersburg and get on to some solid magazine as a reviewer that i shall write for the next ten years and in the end become the owner of the magazine and bring it out on the liberal and atheistic side with a socialistic tinge with a tiny gloss of socialism but keeping a sharp lookout all the time that is keeping in with both sides and hoodwinking the fools according to your brother's account the tinge of socialism won't hinder me from laying by the proceeds and investing them under the guidance of some jew till at the end of my career i build a great house in petersburg and move my publishing offices to it and let out the upper stories to lodgers he has even chosen the place for it near the new stone bridge across the neva which they say is to be built in petersburg ah misha that's just what will really happen every word of it 
cried alyosha unable to restrain a good-humoured smile you are pleased to be sarcastic too alexey fyodorovitch no no i'm joking forgive me i've something quite different in my mind but excuse me who can have told you all this you can't have been at katerina ivanovna's yourself when he was talking about you i wasn't there but dmitri fyodorovitch was and i heard him tell it with my own ears if you want to know he didn't tell me but i overheard him unintentionally of course for i was sitting in grushenka's bedroom and i couldn't go away because dmitri fyodorovitch was in the next room oh yes i'd forgotten she was a relation of yours a relation that grushenka a relation of mine cried rakitin turning crimson are you mad you're out of your mind why isn't she a relation of yours i heard so where can you have heard it you karamazovs brag of being an ancient noble family though your father used to run about playing the buffoon at other men's tables and was only admitted to the kitchen as a favour i may be only a priest's son and dirt in the eyes of noblemen like you but don't insult me so lightly and wantonly i have a sense of honour too alexey fyodorovitch i couldn't be a relation of grushenka a common harlot i beg you to understand that rakitin was intensely irritated forgive me for goodness sake i had no idea besides how can you call her a harlot is she that sort of woman alyosha flushed suddenly i tell you again i heard that she was a relation of yours you often go to see her and you told me yourself you're not her lover i never dreamed that you of all people had such contempt for her does she really deserve it i may have reasons of my own for visiting her that's not your business but as for relationship your brother or even your father is more likely to make her yours than mine well here we are you'd better go to the kitchen hello what's wrong what is it are we late they can't have finished dinner so soon have the karamazovs been making trouble again no doubt they have here's your father and your brother ivan after him they've broken out from the father superiors and look father isidore is shouting out something after them from the steps and your father's shouting and waving his arms i expect he's swearing bah and there goes musov driving away in his carriage you see he's going and there's old maximov running there must have been a row there can't have been any dinner surely they've not been beating the father superior or have they perhaps been beaten it would serve them right there was reason for rakitin's exclamations there had been a scandalous and unprecedented scene it had all come from the impulse of a moment End of section twelve Section thirteen of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book two, chapter eight. The Scandalous Scene. Musov, as a man of breeding and delicacy, could not but feel some inward qualms when he reached the Father Superiors with Ivan he felt ashamed of having lost his temper he felt that he ought to have disdained that despicable wretch fyodor pavlovitch too much to have been upset by him in father zosima's cell and so to have forgotten himself the monks were not to blame in any case he reflected on the steps and if they're decent people here and the father superior i understand is a nobleman why not be friendly and courteous with them i won't argue i'll fall in with everything i'll win them by politeness and and show them that i've nothing to do with that aesop that buffoon that pierrot and have merely been taken in over this affair just as they have he determined to drop his litigation with the monastery and relinquish his claims to the woodcutting and fishery rights at once 
he was the more ready to do this because the rights had become much less valuable and he had indeed the vaguest idea where the wood and river in question were these excellent intentions were strengthened when he entered the father superior's dining-room though strictly speaking it was not a dining-room for the father superior had only two rooms altogether they were however much larger and more comfortable than father zossima's but there was no great luxury about the furnishing of these rooms either the furniture was of mahogany covered with leather in the old-fashioned style of eighteen twenty the floor was not even stained but everything was shining with cleanliness and there were many choice flowers in the windows the most sumptuous thing in the room at the moment was of course the beautifully decorated table the cloth was clean the service shone there were three kinds of well-baked bread two bottles of wine two of excellent mead and a large glass jug of kvass both the latter made in the monastery and famous in the neighbourhood there was no vodka rakitin related afterwards that there were five dishes fish soup made of sterlets served with little fish patties then boiled fish served in a special way then salmon cutlets ice pudding and compote and finally blancmange rakitin found out about all these good things for he could not resist peeping into the kitchen where he already had a footing he had a footing everywhere and got information about everything he was of an uneasy and envious temper he was well aware of his own considerable abilities and nervously exaggerated them in his self-conceit he knew he would play a prominent part of some sort but alyosha who was attached to him was distressed to see that his friend rakitin was dishonourable and quite unconscious of being so himself considering on the contrary that because he would not steal money left on the table he was a man of the highest integrity neither alyosha nor anyone else could have influenced him in that rakitin of course was a person of too little consequence to be invited to the dinner to which father yosef father paisi and one other monk were the only inmates of the monastery invited they were already waiting when musov kalganov and ivan arrived the other guest maximov stood a little aside waiting also the father superior stepped into the middle of the room to receive his guests he was a tall thin but still vigorous old man with black hair streaked with gray and a long grave ascetic face he bowed to his guests in silence but this time they approached to receive his blessing Yusuf even tried to kiss his hand but the father superior drew it back in time to avoid the salute but ivan and kalganov went through the ceremony in the most simple-hearted and complete manner kissing his hand as peasants do we must apologize most humbly your reverence began Yusuf, simpering affably and speaking in a dignified and respectful tone pardon us for having come alone without the gentleman you invited fyodor pavlovitch he felt obliged to decline the honour of your hospitality and not without reason in the reverend father zossima's cell he was carried away by the unhappy dissension with his son and let fall words which were quite out of keeping in fact quite unseemly as he glanced at the monks your reverence is no doubt already aware and therefore recognizing that he had been to blame he felt sincere regret and shame and begged me and his son ivan fyodorovitch to convey to you his apologies and regrets in brief he hopes and desires to make amends later he asks your blessing and begs you to forget what has taken place as he uttered the last word of his tirade musov completely recovered his self-complacency and all traces of his former irritation disappeared he fully and sincerely loved humanity again the father superior listened to him with dignity and with a slight bend of the head replied i sincerely deplore his absence 
perhaps at our table he might have learnt to like us and we him pray be seated gentlemen he stood before the holy image and began to say grace aloud all bent their heads reverently and maximov clasped his hands before him with peculiar fervour it was at this moment that fyodor pavlovitch played his last prank it must be noted that he really had meant to go home and really had felt the impossibility of going to dine with the father superior as though nothing had happened after his disgraceful behaviour in the elder's cell not that he was so very much ashamed of himself quite the contrary perhaps but still he felt it would be unseemly to go to dinner yet his creaking carriage had hardly been brought to the steps of the hotel and he had hardly got into it when he suddenly stopped short he remembered his own words at the elders i always feel when i meet people that i am lower than all and that they all take me for a buffoon so i say let me play the buffoon for you are every one of you stupider and lower than i he longed to revenge himself on every one for his own unseemliness he suddenly recalled how he had once in the past been asked why do you hate so-and-so so much and he had answered them with his shameless impudence i'll tell you he has done me no harm but i played him a dirty trick and ever since i have hated him remembering that now he smiled quietly and malignantly hesitating for a moment his eyes gleamed and his lips positively quivered well since i have begun i may as well go on he decided his predominant sensation at that moment might be expressed in the following words well there is no rehabilitating myself now so let me shame them for all i am worth i will show them i don't care what they think that's all he told the coachman to wait while with rapid steps he returned to the monastery and straight to the father superiors he had no clear idea what he would do but he knew that he could not control himself and that a touch might drive him to the utmost limits of obscenity but only to obscenity to nothing criminal nothing for which he could be legally punished in the last resort he could always restrain himself and had marvelled indeed at himself on that score sometimes he appeared in the father superior's dining-room at the moment when the prayer was over and all were moving to the table standing in the doorway he scanned the company and laughing his prolonged impudent malicious chuckle looked them all boldly in the face they thought i had gone and here i am again he cried to the whole room for one moment every one stared at him without a word and at once every one felt that something revolting grotesque positively scandalous was about to happen Musov passed immediately from the most benevolent frame of mind to the most savage all the feelings that had subsided and died down in his heart revived instantly no this i cannot endure he cried i absolutely cannot and i certainly cannot the blood rushed to his head he positively stammered but he was beyond thinking of style and he seized his hat what is it he cannot cried fyodor pavlovitch that he absolutely cannot and certainly cannot your reverence am i to come in or not will you receive me as your guest you are welcome with all my heart answered the superior gentlemen he added i venture to beg you most earnestly to lay aside your dissensions and to be united in love and family harmony with prayer to the lord at our humble table no no it is impossible cried musov beside himself well if it is impossible for pyotr alexandrovitch it is impossible for me and i won't stop that is why i came i will keep with pyotr alexandrovitch everywhere now if you will go away pyotr alexandrovitch i will go away too if you remain i will remain 
you stung him by what you said about family harmony father superior he does not admit he is my relation that's right isn't it vanson here's vanson how are you vanson you mean me muttered maximoff puzzled of course i mean you cried fyodor pavlovitch who else the father superior could not be fanzon but i am not fanzon either i am maximoff no you are fanzon your reverence do you know who fanzon was it was a famous murder case he was killed in a house of harlotry i believe that is what such places are called among you he was killed and robbed and in spite of his venerable age he was nailed up in a box and sent from petersburg to moscow in the luggage van and while they were nailing him up the harlots sang songs and played the harp that is to say the piano so this is that very fanzon he has risen from the dead hasn't he fanzon what is happening what's this voices were heard in the group of monks let us go cried musov addressing kalganov no excuse me fyodor pavlovitch broke in shrilly taking another step into the room allow me to finish there in the cell you blamed me for behaving disrespectfully just because i spoke of eating gudgeon pyotr alexandrovitch musov my relation prefers to have plus de noblesse que de sincérité in his words but i prefer in mine plus de sincérité que de noblesse and damn the noblesse that's right isn't it vanzon allow me father superior though i am a buffoon and play the buffoon yet i am the soul of honour and i want to speak my mind yes i am the soul of honour while in pyotr alexandrovitch there is wounded vanity and nothing else i came here perhaps to have a look and speak my mind my son alexey is here being saved i am his father i care for his welfare and it is my duty to care while i have been playing the fool i have been listening and having a look on the sly and now i want to give you the last act of the performance you know how things are with us as a thing falls so it lies as a thing once has fallen so it must lie for ever not a bit of it i want to get up again holy father i am indignant with you confession is a great sacrament before which i am ready to bow down reverently but there in the cell they all kneel down and confess aloud can it be right to confess aloud it was ordained by the holy fathers to confess in secret then only your confession will be a mystery and so it was of old but how can i explain to him before every one that i did this and that well you understand what sometimes it would not be proper to talk about it so it is really a scandal no fathers one might be carried along with you to the flagellants i dare say at the first opportunity i shall write to the synod and i shall take my son alexey home we must note here that fyodor pavlovitch knew where to look for the weak spot there had been at one time malicious rumours which had even reached the archbishop not only regarding our monastery but in others where the institution of elders existed that too much respect was paid to the elders even to the detriment of the authority of the superior that the elders abused the sacrament of confession and so on and so on absurd charges which had died away of themselves everywhere but the spirit of folly which had caught up fyodor pavlovitch and was bearing him on the current of his own nerves into lower and lower depths of ignominy prompted him with this old slander fyodor pavlovitch did not understand a word of it and he could not even put it sensibly for on this occasion no one had been kneeling and confessing aloud in the elder's cell so that he could not have seen anything of the kind he was only speaking from confused memory of old slanders but as soon as he had uttered his foolish tirade 
he felt he had been talking absurd nonsense and at once longed to prove to his audience and above all to himself that he had not been talking nonsense and though he knew perfectly well that with each word he would be adding more and more absurdity he could not restrain himself and plunged forward blindly how disgraceful cried pyotr alexandrovitch pardon me said the father superior it was said of old many have begun to speak against me and have uttered evil sayings about me and hearing it i have said to myself it is the correction of the lord and he has sent it to heal my vain soul and so we humbly thank you honoured guest and he made fyodor pavlovitch a low bow tut 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 sanctimoniousness and stock phrases old phrases and old gestures the old lies and formal prostrations we know all about them a kiss on the lips and a dagger in the heart as in schiller's robbers i don't like falsehood fathers i want the truth but the truth is not to be found in eating gudgeon and that i proclaim aloud father monks why do you fast why do you expect reward in heaven for that why for reward like that i will come and fast too no saintly monk you try being virtuous in the world do good to society without shutting yourself up in a monastery at other people's expense and without expecting a reward up aloft for it you'll find that a bit harder i can talk sense to father superior what have they got here he went up to the table old port wine mead brewed by the eliseev brothers fie fie fathers that is something beyond gudgeon look at the bottles the fathers have brought out <laughs> and who has provided it all the russian peasant the laborer brings here the farthing earned by his horny hand wringing it from his family and the tax-gatherer you bleed the people you know holy fathers this is too disgraceful said father yosef father paisi kept obstinately silent musov rushed from the room and kalganov after him well father i will follow pyotr alexandrovitch i am not coming to see you again you may beg me on your knees i shan't come i sent you a thousand roubles so you have begun to keep your eye on me <laughs> no i'll say no more i am taking my revenge for my youth for all the humiliation i endured he thumped the table with his fist in a paroxysm of simulated feeling this monastery has played a great part in my life it has cost me many bitter tears you used to set my wife the crazy one against me you cursed me with bell and book you spread stories about me all over the place enough fathers this is the age of liberalism the age of steamers and railways neither a thousand nor a hundred roubles no nor a hundred farthings will you get out of me it must be noted again that our monastery never had played any great part in his life and he never had shed a bitter tear owing to it but he was so carried away by his simulated emotion that he was for one moment almost believing it himself he was so touched he was almost weeping but at that very instant he felt that it was time to draw back the father superior bowed his head at his malicious lie and again spoke impressively it is written again bear circumspectly and gladly dishonour that cometh upon thee by no act of thine own be not confounded and hate not him who hath dishonoured thee and so will we tut 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 be thinking thyself and the rest of the rigmarole be think yourselves fathers i will go but i will take my son alexey away from here forever on my parental authority ivan fyodorovitch my most dutiful son permit me to order you to follow me fanzon what have you to stay for come and see me now in the town it is fun there it is only one short verst instead of lenten oil i will give you sucking pig and kasha 
we will have dinner with some brandy and liqueur to it i've cloudberry wine hey fanson don't lose your chance he went out shouting and gesticulating it was at that moment rakitin saw him and pointed him out to alyosha alexey his father shouted from far off catching sight of him you come home to me to-day for good and bring your pillow and mattress and leave no trace behind alyosha stood rooted to the spot watching the scene in silence meanwhile fyodor pavlovitch had got into the carriage and ivan was about to follow him in grim silence without even turning to say good-bye to alyosha but at this point another almost incredible scene of grotesque buffoonery gave the finishing touch to the episode maximov suddenly appeared by the side of the carriage he ran up panting afraid of being too late rakitin and alyosha saw him running he was in such a hurry that in his impatience he put his foot on the step on which ivan's left foot was still resting and clutching the carriage he kept trying to jump in i am going with you he kept shouting laughing a thin mirthful laugh with a look of reckless glee in his face take me too there cried fyodor pavlovitch delighted did i not say he was fanson it is fanson himself risen from the dead why how did you tear yourself away what did you fanson there and how could you get away from the dinner you must be a brazen-faced fellow i am that myself but i am surprised at you brother jump in jump in let him pass ivan it will be fun he can lie somewhere at our feet will you lie at our feet fanson or perch on the box with the coachman skip onto the box fanson but ivan who had by now taken his seat without a word gave maximov a violent punch in the breast and sent him flying it was quite by chance he did not fall drive on ivan shouted angrily to the coachman why what are you doing what are you about why did you do that fyodor pavlovitch protested but the carriage had already driven away ivan made no reply well you are a fellow fyodor pavlovitch said again after a pause of two minutes looking askance at his son why it was you got up all this monastery business you urged it you approved of it why are you angry now you've talked rot enough you might rest a bit now ivan snapped sullenly fyodor pavlovitch was silent again for two minutes a drop of brandy would be nice now he observed sententiously but ivan made no response you shall have some too when we get home ivan was still silent fyodor pavlovitch waited another two minutes but i shall take alyosha away from the monastery though you will dislike it so much most honoured karl von moor ivan shrugged his shoulders contemptuously and turning away stared at the road and they did not speak again all the way home end of section thirteen Section fourteen of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book three. The Sensualists. Chapter one. In the Servants' Quarters. The Karamazovs' house was far from being in the centre of the town, but it was not quite outside it it was a pleasant-looking old house of two stories painted gray with a red iron roof it was roomy and snug and might still last many years there were all sorts of unexpected little cupboards and closets and staircases there were rats in it but fyodor pavlovitch did not altogether dislike them one doesn't feel so solitary when one's left alone in the evening he used to say it was his habit to send the servants away to the lodge for the night and to lock himself up alone the lodge was a roomy and solid building in the yard fyodor pavlovitch used to have the cooking done there though there was a kitchen in the house 
he did not like the smell of cooking and winter and summer alike the dishes were carried in across the courtyard the house was built for a large family there was room for five times as many with their servants but at the time of our story there was no one living in the house but fyodor pavlovitch and his son ivan and in the lodge there were only three servants old grigory and his old wife marfa and a young man called smerdyakov of these three we must say a few words of old grigory we have said something already he was firm and determined and went blindly and obstinately for his object if once he had been brought by any reasons and they were often very illogical ones to believe that it was immutably right he was honest and incorruptible his wife marfa ignatyevna had obeyed her husband's will implicitly all her life yet she had pestered him terribly after the emancipation of the serfs she was set on leaving fyodor pavlovitch and opening a little shop in moscow with their small savings but grigory decided then once for all that the woman's talking nonsense for every woman is dishonest and that they ought not to leave their old master whatever he might be for that was now their duty do you understand what duty is he asked marfa ignatyevna i understand what duty means grigory vassilievitch but why it's our duty to stay here i never shall understand marfa answered firmly well don't understand then but so it shall be and you hold your tongue and so it was they did not go away and fyodor pavlovitch promised them a small sum for wages and paid it regularly grigory knew too that he had an indisputable influence over his master it was true and he was aware of it fyodor pavlovitch was an obstinate and cunning buffoon yet though his will was strong enough in some of the affairs of life as he expressed it he found himself to his surprise extremely feeble in facing certain other emergencies he knew his weaknesses and was afraid of them there are positions in which one has to keep a sharp lookout and that's not easy without a trustworthy man and grigory was a most trustworthy man many times in the course of his life fyodor pavlovitch had only just escaped a sound thrashing through grigory's intervention and on each occasion the old servant gave him a good lecture but it wasn't only thrashings that fyodor pavlovitch was afraid of there were graver occasions and very subtle and complicated ones when fyodor pavlovitch could not have explained the extraordinary craving for some one faithful and devoted which sometimes unaccountably came upon him all in a moment it was almost a morbid condition corrupt and often cruel in his lust like some noxious insect fyodor pavlovitch was sometimes in moments of drunkenness overcome by superstitious terror and a moral convulsion which took an almost physical form my soul's simply quaking in my throat at those times he used to say at such moments he liked to feel that there was near at hand in the lodge if not in the room a strong faithful man virtuous and unlike himself who had seen all his debauchery and knew all his secrets but was ready in his devotion to overlook all that not to oppose him above all not to reproach him or threaten him with anything either in this world or in the next and in case of need to defend him from whom from somebody unknown but terrible and dangerous what he needed was to feel that there was another man an old and tried friend that he might call him in his sick moments merely to look at his face or perhaps exchange some quite irrelevant words with him and if the old servant were not angry he felt comforted and if he were angry he was more dejected it happened even very rarely however that fyodor pavlovitch went at night to the lodge to wake grigory and fetch him for a moment 
when the old man came fyodor pavlovitch would begin talking about the most trivial matters and would soon let him go again sometimes even with a jest and after he had gone fyodor pavlovitch would get into bed with a curse and sleep the sleep of the just something of the same sort had happened to fyodor pavlovitch on alyosha's arrival alyosha pierced his heart by living with him seeing everything and blaming nothing moreover alyosha brought with him something his father had never known before a complete absence of contempt for him and an invariable kindness a perfectly natural unaffected devotion to the old man who deserved it so little all this was a complete surprise to the old profligate who had dropped all family ties it was a new and surprising experience for him who had till then loved nothing but evil when alyosha had left him he confessed to himself that he had learnt something he had not till then been willing to learn i have mentioned already that grigory had detested adelaida ivanovna the first wife of fyodor pavlovitch and the mother of dmitri and that he had on the contrary protected sophia ivanovna the poor crazy woman against his master and any one who chanced to speak ill or lightly of her his sympathy for the unhappy wife had become something sacred to him so that even now twenty years after he could not bear a slighting allusion to her from any one and would at once check the offender externally grigory was cold dignified and taciturn and spoke weighing his words without frivolity it was impossible to tell at first sight whether he loved his meek obedient wife but he really did love her and she knew it marfa ignatyevna was by no means foolish she was probably indeed cleverer than her husband or at least more prudent than he in worldly affairs and yet she had given in to him in everything without question or complaint ever since her marriage and respected him for his spiritual superiority it was remarkable how little they spoke to one another in the course of their lives and only of the most necessary daily affairs the grave and dignified grigory thought over all his cares and duties alone so that marfa ignatyevna had long grown used to knowing that he did not need her advice she felt that her husband respected her silence and took it as a sign of her good sense he had never beaten her but once and then only slightly once during the year after fyodor pavlovitch's marriage with adelaevna ivanovna the village girls and women at that time serfs were called together before the house to sing and dance they were beginning in the green meadows when marfa at that time a young woman skipped forward and danced the russian dance not in the village fashion but as she had danced it when she was a servant in the service of the rich miusov family in their private theatre where the actors were taught to dance by a dancing master from moscow grigory saw how his wife danced and an hour later at home in their cottage he gave her a lesson pulling her hair a little but there it ended the beating was never repeated and marfa ignatyevna gave up dancing god had not blessed them with children one child was born but it died grigory was fond of children and was not ashamed of showing it when adelaida ivanovna had run away grigory took dmitri then a child of three years old combed his hair and washed him in a tub with his own hands and looked after him for almost a year afterwards he had looked after ivan and alyosha for which the general's widow had rewarded him with a slap in the face but i have already related all that the only happiness his own child had brought him had been in the anticipation of its birth when it was born he was overwhelmed with grief and horror the baby had six fingers grigory was so crushed by this that he was not only silent till the day of the christening but kept away in the garden it was spring and he spent three days digging the kitchen garden 
the third day was fixed for christening the baby meantime grigory had reached a conclusion going into the cottage where the clergy were assembled and the guests had arrived including fyodor pavlovitch who was to stand godfather he suddenly announced that the baby ought not to be christened at all he announced this quietly briefly forcing out his words and gazing with dull intentness at the priest why not asked the priest with good-humoured surprise because it's a dragon muttered grigory a dragon what dragon grigory did not speak for some time it's a confusion of nature he muttered vaguely but firmly and obviously unwilling to say more they laughed and of course christened the poor baby grigory prayed earnestly at the font but his opinion of the new-born child remained unchanged yet he did not interfere in any way as long as the sickly infant lived he scarcely looked at it tried indeed not to notice it and for the most part kept out of the cottage but when at the end of a fortnight the baby died of thrush he himself laid the child in its little coffin looked at it in profound grief and when they were filling up the shallow little grave he fell on his knees and bowed down to the earth he did not for years afterwards mention his child nor did marfa speak of the baby before him and even if grigory were not present she never spoke of it above a whisper marfa observed that from the day of the burial he devoted himself to religion and took to reading the lives of the saints for the most part sitting alone and in silence and always putting on his big round silver-rimmed spectacles he rarely read aloud only perhaps in lent he was fond of the book of job and had somehow got hold of a copy of the sayings and sermons of the god-fearing father isaac the syrian which he read persistently for years together understanding very little of it but perhaps prizing and loving it the more for that of late he had begun to listen to the doctrines of the sect of flagellants settled in the neighbourhood he was evidently shaken by them but judged it unfitting to go over to the new faith his habit of theological reading gave him an expression of still greater gravity he was perhaps predisposed to mysticism and the birth of his deformed child and its death had as though by special design been accompanied by another strange and marvellous event which as he said later had left a stamp upon his soul it happened that on the very night after the burial of his child marfa was awakened by the wail of a new-born baby she was frightened and waked her husband he listened and said he thought it was more like some one groaning it might be a woman he got up and dressed it was a rather warm night in may as he went down the steps he distinctly heard groans coming from the garden but the gate from the yard into the garden was locked at night and there was no other way of entering it for it was enclosed all around by a strong high fence going back into the house grigory lighted a lantern took the garden key and taking no notice of the hysterical fears of his wife who was still persuaded that she heard a child crying and that it was her own baby crying and calling for her went into the garden in silence there he heard at once that the groans came from the bath-house that stood near the garden gate and that they were the groans of a woman opening the door of the bath-house he saw a sight which petrified him an idiot girl who wandered about the streets and was known to the whole town by the nickname of lizaveta smerdyaschaya stinking lizaveta had got into the bath-house and had just given birth to a child she lay dying with the baby beside her she said nothing for she had never been able to speak but her story needs a chapter to itself end of section fourteen
Section fifteen of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book three, chapter two. Lizaveta. There was one circumstance which struck Grigory particularly and confirmed a very unpleasant and revolting suspicion this lizaveta was a dwarfish creature not five foot within a wee bit as many of the pious old women said pathetically about her after her death her broad healthy red face had a look of blank idiocy and the fixed stare in her eyes was unpleasant in spite of their meek expression she wandered about summer and winter alike barefooted wearing nothing but a hempen smock her coarse almost black hair curled like lamb's wool and formed a sort of huge cap on her head it was always crusted with mud and had leaves bits of stick and shavings clinging to it as she always slept on the ground and in the dirt her father a homeless sickly drunkard called Ilya, had lost everything and lived many years as a workman with some well-to-do tradespeople her mother had long been dead spiteful and diseased Ilya used to beat Lizaveta inhumanly whenever she returned to him, but she rarely did so, for everyone in the town was ready to look after her as being an idiot, and so specially dear to God. Ilya's employers, and many others in the town, especially of the tradespeople, tried to clothe her better, and always rigged her out with high boots and sheepskin coat for the winter but although she allowed them to dress her up without resisting she usually went away preferably to the cathedral porch and taking off all that had been given her kerchief sheepskin skirt or boots she left them there and walked away barefoot in her smock as before it happened on one occasion that a new governor of the province making a tour of inspection in our town saw lizaveta and was wounded in his tenderest susceptibilities and though he was told she was an idiot he pronounced that for a young woman of twenty to wander about in nothing but a smock was a breach of the proprieties and must not occur again but the governor went his way and lizaveta was left as she was at last her father died which made her even more acceptable in the eyes of the religious persons of the town as an orphan in fact every one seemed to like her even the boys did not tease her and the boys of our town especially the schoolboys are a mischievous set she would walk into strange houses and no one drove her away every one was kind to her and gave her something if she were given a copper she would take it and at once drop it in the alms jug of the church or prison if she were given a roll or bun in the market she would hand it to the first child she met sometimes she would stop one of the richest ladies in the town and give it to her and the lady would be pleased to take it she herself never tasted anything but black bread and water if she went into an expensive shop where there were costly goods or money lying about no one kept watch on her for they knew that if she saw thousands of roubles overlooked by them she would not have touched a farthing she scarcely ever went to church she slept either in the church porch or climbed over a hurdle there are many hurdles instead of fences to this day in our town into a kitchen garden she used at least once a week to turn up at home that is at the house of her father's former employers and in the winter went there every night and slept either in the passage or the cowhouse people were amazed that she could stand such a life but she was accustomed to it and although she was so tiny she was of a robust constitution some of the townspeople declared that she did all this only from pride but that is hardly credible she could hardly speak and only from time to time uttered an inarticulate grunt how could she have been proud it happened one clear warm moonlight night in september many years ago five or six drunken revellers were returning from the club at a very late hour according to our provincial notions they passed through the back way which led between the back gardens of the houses with hurdles on either side 
this way leads out on to the bridge over the long stinking pool which we were accustomed to call a river among the nettles and burdocks under the hurdle our revelers saw lizaveta asleep they stopped to look at her laughing and began jesting with unbridled licentiousness it occurred to one young gentleman to make the whimsical inquiry whether any one could possibly look upon such an animal as a woman and so forth they all pronounced with lofty repugnance that it was impossible but fyodor pavlovitch who was among them sprang forward and declared that it was by no means impossible and that indeed there was a certain piquancy about it and so on it is true that at that time he was overdoing his part as a buffoon he liked to put himself forward and entertain the company ostensibly on equal terms of course though in reality he was on a servile footing with them it was just at the time when he had received news of his first wife's death in petersburg and with crape upon his hat was drinking and behaving so shamelessly that even the most reckless among us were shocked at the sight of him the revellers of course laughed at this unexpected opinion and one of them even began challenging him to act upon it the others repelled the idea even more emphatically though still with the utmost hilarity and at last they went on their way later on fyodor pavlovitch swore that he had gone with them and perhaps it was so no one knows for certain and no one ever knew but five or six months later all the town was talking with intense and sincere indignation of lizaveta's condition and trying to find out who was the miscreant who had wronged her then suddenly a terrible rumor was all over the town that this miscreant was no other than fyodor pavlovitch who set the rumor going of that drunken band five had left the town and the only one still among us was an elderly and much respected civil councillor the father of grown-up daughters who could hardly have spread the tale even if there had been any foundation for it but rumor pointed straight at fyodor pavlovitch and persisted in pointing at him of course this was no great grievance to him he would not have troubled to contradict a set of tradespeople in those days he was proud and did not condescend to talk except in his own circle of the officials and nobles whom he entertained so well at the time grigory stood up for his master vigorously he provoked quarrels and altercations in defence of him and succeeded in bringing some people round to his side it's the wench's own fault he asserted and the culprit was carp a dangerous convict who had escaped from prison and whose name was well known to us as he had hidden in our town this conjecture sounded plausible for it was remembered that carp had been in the neighbourhood just at that time in the autumn and had robbed three people but this affair and all the talk about it did not estrange popular sympathy from the poor idiot she was better looked after than ever a well-to-do merchant's widow named kondratyev arranged to take her into her house at the end of april meaning not to let her go out until after the confinement they kept a constant watch over her but in spite of their vigilance she escaped on the very last day and made her way into fyodor pavlovitch's garden how in her condition she managed to climb over the high strong fence remained a mystery some maintained that she must have been lifted over by somebody others hinted at something more uncanny the most likely explanation is that it happened naturally that lizaveta accustomed to clambering over hurdles to sleep in gardens had somehow managed to climb this fence in spite of her condition and had leapt down injuring herself grigory rushed to marfa and sent her to lizaveta while he ran to fetch an old midwife who lived close by they saved the baby but lizaveta died at dawn grigory took the baby brought it home and making his wife sit down put it on her lap a child of god an orphan is akin to all he said and to us above others our little lost one has sent us this who has come from the devil's son and a holy innocent 
nurse him and weep no more so marfa brought up the child he was christened pavel to which people were not slow in adding fyodorovitch son of fyodor fyodor pavlovitch did not object to any of this and thought it amusing though he persisted vigorously in denying his responsibility the townspeople were pleased at his adopting the foundling later on fyodor pavlovitch invented a surname for the child calling him smerdyakov after his mother's nickname so this smerdyakov became fyodor pavlovitch's second servant and was living in the lodge with grigory and marfa at the time our story begins he was employed as cook i ought to say something of this smerdyakov but i am ashamed of keeping my readers attention so long occupied with these common menials and i will go back to my story hoping to say more of smerdyakov in the course of it end of section fifteen Section sixteen of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book three, chapter three: The Confession of a Passionate Heart in verse. Alyosha remained for some time irresolute after hearing the command his father shouted to him from the carriage but in spite of his uneasiness he did not stand still that was not his way he went at once to the kitchen to find out what his father had been doing above then he set off trusting that on the way he would find some answer to the doubt tormenting him i hasten to add that his father's shouts commanding him to return home with his mattress and pillow did not frighten him in the least he understood perfectly that those peremptory shouts were merely a flourish to produce an effect in the same way a tradesman in our town who was celebrating his name-day with a party of friends getting angry at being refused more vodka smashed up his own crockery and furniture and tore his own and his wife's clothes and finally broke his windows all for the sake of effect next day of course when he was sober he regretted the broken cups and saucers alyosha knew that his father would let him go back to the monastery next day possibly even that evening moreover he was fully persuaded that his father might hurt any one else but would not hurt him alyosha was certain that no one in the whole world ever would want to hurt him and what is more he knew that no one could hurt him this was for him an axiom assumed once for all without question and he went his way without hesitation relying on it but at that moment an anxiety of a different sort disturbed him and worried him the more because he could not formulate it it was the fear of a woman of katerina ivanovna who had so urgently entreated him in the note handed to him by madame holikoff to come and see her about something this request and the necessity of going had at once aroused an uneasy feeling in his heart and this feeling had grown more and more painful all the morning in spite of the scenes at the hermitage and at the father superiors he was not uneasy because he did not know what she would speak of and what he must answer and he was not afraid of her simply as a woman though he knew little of women he had spent his life from early childhood till he entered the monastery entirely with women he was afraid of that woman katerina ivanovna he had been afraid of her from the first time he saw her he had only seen her two or three times and had only chanced to say a few words to her he thought of her as a beautiful proud imperious girl it was not her beauty which troubled him but something else and the vagueness of his apprehension increased the apprehension itself the girl's aims were of the noblest he knew that she was trying to save his brother dmitri simply through generosity though he had already behaved badly to her yet although alyosha recognized and did justice to all these fine and generous sentiments 
a shiver began to run down his back as soon as he drew near her house he reflected that he would not find ivan who was so intimate a friend with her for ivan was certainly now with his father dmitri he was even more certain not to find there and he had a foreboding of the reason and so his conversation would be with her alone he had a great longing to run and see his brother dmitri before that fateful interview without showing him the letter he could talk to him about it but dmitri lived a long way off and he was sure to be away from home too standing still for a minute he reached a final decision crossing himself with a rapid and accustomed gesture and at once smiling he turned resolutely in the direction of his terrible lady he knew her house if he went by the high street and then across the market-place it was a long way round though our town is small it is scattered and the houses are far apart and meanwhile his father was expecting him and perhaps had not yet forgotten his command he might be unreasonable and so he had to make haste to get there and back so he decided to take a short cut by the back way for he knew every inch of the ground this meant skirting fences climbing over hurdles and crossing other people's backyards where every one he met knew him and greeted him in this way he could reach the high street in half the time he had to pass the garden adjoining his father's and belonging to a little tumble-down house with four windows the owner of this house as alyosha knew was a bedridden old woman living with her daughter who had been a genteel maidservant in generals families in petersburg now she had been at home a year looking after her sick mother she always dressed up in fine clothes though her old mother and she had sunk into such poverty that they went every day to fyodor pavlovitch's kitchen for soup and bread which marfa gave readily yet though the young woman came up for soup she had never sold any of her dresses and one of these even had a long train a fact which alyosha had learned from rakitin who always knew everything that was going on in the town he had forgotten it as soon as he heard it but now on reaching the garden he remembered the dress with the train raised his head which had been bowed in thought and came upon something quite unexpected over the hurdle in the garden dmitri mounted on something was leaning forward gesticulating violently beckoning to him obviously afraid to utter a word for fear of being overheard alyosha ran up to the hurdle it's a good thing you looked up i was nearly shouting to you mitya said in a joyful hurried whisper climb in here quickly how splendid that you've come i was just thinking of you alyosha was delighted too but he did not know how to get over the hurdle mitya put his powerful hand under his elbow to help him jump tucking up his cassock alyosha leapt over the hurdle with the agility of a bare-legged street urchin well done now come along said mitya in an enthusiastic whisper where whispered alyosha looking about him and finding himself in a deserted garden with no one near but themselves the garden was small but the house was at least fifty paces away there's no one here why do you whisper asked alyosha why do i whisper deuce take it cried dmitri at the top of his voice you see what silly tricks nature plays one i am here in secret and on the watch i'll explain later on but knowing it's a secret i began whispering like a fool when there's no need let us go over there till then be quiet i want to kiss you glory to god in the world glory to god in me i was just repeating that sitting here before you came the garden was about three acres in extent and planted with trees only along the fence at the four sides there were apple trees maples limes and birch trees the middle of the garden was an empty grass space from which several hundredweight of hay was carried in the summer the garden was let out for a few roubles for the summer there were also plantations of raspberries and currants and gooseberries laid out along the sides a kitchen garden had been planted lately near the house dmitri led his brother to the most secluded corner of the garden 
there in the thicket of lime trees and old bushes of black currant elder snowball tree and lilac there stood a tumble-down green summer-house blackened with age its walls were of lattice-work but there was still a roof which could give shelter god knows when this summer-house was built there was a tradition that it had been put up some fifty years before by a retired colonel called von schmidt who owned the house at that time it was all in decay the floor was rotting the planks were loose the woodwork smelled musty in the summer-house there was a green wooden table fixed in the ground and round it were some green benches upon which it was still possible to sit alyosha had at once observed his brother's exhilarated condition and on entering the arbor he saw half a bottle of brandy and a wine-glass on the table that's brandy mitya laughed i see your look he's drinking again distrust the apparition distrust the worthless lying crowd and lay aside thy doubts i'm not drinking i'm only indulging as that pig your rakitin says he'll be a civil councillor one day and he'll always talk about indulging sit down i could take you in my arms alyosha and press you to my bosom till i crush you for in the whole world in reality in reality can you take it in i love no one but you he uttered the last words in a sort of exultation no one but you and one jade i have fallen in love with to my ruin but being in love doesn't mean loving you may be in love with a woman and yet hate her remember that i can talk about it gaily still sit down here by the table and i'll sit beside you and look at you and go on talking you shall keep quiet and i'll go on talking for the time has come but on reflection you know i'd better speak quietly for here here you can never tell what ears are listening i will explain everything as they say the story will be continued why have i been longing for you why have i been thirsting for you all these days and just now it's five days since i've cast anchor here because it's only to you i can tell everything because i must because i need you because to-morrow i shall fly from the clouds because to-morrow life is ending and beginning have you ever felt have you ever dreamt of falling down a precipice into a pit that's just how i'm falling but not in a dream and i'm not afraid and don't you be afraid at least i am afraid but i enjoy it it's not enjoyment though but ecstasy damn it all whatever it is a strong spirit a weak spirit a womanish spirit whatever it is let us praise nature you see what sunshine how clear the sky is the leaves are all green it's still summer four o'clock in the afternoon and the stillness where were you going i was going to father's but i meant to go to katerina ivanovna's first to her and to father oh what a coincidence why was i waiting for you hungering and thirsting for you in every cranny of my soul and even in my ribs why to send you to father and to her katerina ivanovna so as to have done with her and with father to send an angel i might have sent any one but i wanted to send an angel and here you are on your way to see father and her did you really mean to send me cried alyosha with a distressed expression stay you knew it and i see you understand it all at once but be quiet be quiet for a time don't be sorry and don't cry dmitri stood up thought a moment and put his finger to his forehead she's asked you written to you a letter or something that's why you're going to her you wouldn't be going except for that here is her note alyosha took it out of his pocket mitya looked through it quickly and you were going the back way oh gods i thank you for sending him by the back way and he came to me like the golden fish to the silly old fisherman in the fable listen alyosha listen brother now i mean to tell you everything for i must tell some one an angel in heaven i've told already but i want to tell an angel on earth you are an angel on earth you will hear and judge and forgive and that's what i need that someone above me should forgive 
listen if two people break away from everything on earth and fly off into the unknown or at least one of them and before flying off or going to ruin he comes to some one else and says do this for me some favor never asked before that could only be asked on one's deathbed would that other refuse if he were a friend or a brother i will do it but tell me what it is and make haste said alyosha make haste <laughs> don't be in a hurry alyosha you hurry and worry yourself there's no need to hurry now now the world has taken a new turning ah <sighs> alyosha what a pity you can't understand ecstasy but what am i saying to him as though you didn't understand it what an ass i am what am i saying be noble old man who says that alyosha made up his mind to wait he felt that perhaps indeed his work lay here mitya sank into thought for a moment with his elbow on the table and his head in his hand both were silent alyosha said mitya you're the only one who won't laugh i should like to begin my confession with schiller's hymn to joy an die freude i don't know german i only know it's called that don't think i'm talking nonsense because i'm drunk i'm not a bit drunk brandy's all very well but i need two bottles to make me drunk silenus with his rosy fizz upon his stumbling ass but i've not drunk a quarter of a bottle and i'm not silenus i'm not silenus though i am strong for i've made a decision once for all forgive me the pun you'll have to forgive me a lot more than puns to-day don't be uneasy i'm not spinning it out i'm talking sense and i'll come to the point in a minute i won't keep you in suspense stay how does it go he raised his head thought a minute and began with enthusiasm wild and fearful in his cavern hid the naked troglodyte and the homeless nomad wandered laying waste the fertile plain menacing with spear and arrow in the woods the hunter strayed woe to all poor wretches stranded on those cruel and hostile shores from the peak of high olympus came the mother ceres down seeking in those savage regions her lost daughter proserpine but the goddess found no refuge found no kindly welcome there and no temple bearing witness to the worship of the gods from the fields and from the vineyards came no fruits to deck the feasts only flesh of blood-stained victims smouldered on the altar fires and where'er the grieving goddess turns her melancholy gaze sunk in vilest degradation man his loathsomeness displays mitya broke into sobs and seized alyosha's hand my dear my dear in degradation in degradation now too there's a terrible amount of suffering for man on earth a terrible lot of trouble don't think i'm only a brute in an officer's uniform wallowing in dirt and drink i hardly think of anything but of that degraded man if only i'm not lying i pray god i'm not lying and showing off i think about that man because i am that man myself would he purge his soul from vileness and attain to light and worth he must turn and cling for ever to his ancient mother earth but the difficulty is how am i to cling for ever to mother earth i don't kiss her i don't cleave to her bosom am i to become a peasant or a shepherd i go on and i don't know whether i'm going to shame or to light and joy that's the trouble for everything in the world is a riddle and whenever i've happened to sink into the vilest degradation and it's always been happening i always read that poem about ceres and man has it reformed me never for i'm a karamazov for when i do leap into the pit i go headlong with my heels up and am pleased to be falling in that degrading attitude and pride myself upon it and in the very depths of that degradation i begin a hymn of praise let me be accursed let me be vile and base only let me kiss the hem of the veil in which my god is shrouded though i may be following the devil 
i am thy son o lord and i love thee and i feel the joy without which the world cannot stand joy everlasting fostereth the soul of all creation it is her secret ferment fires the cup of life with flame tis at her beck the grass has turned each blade towards the light and solar systems have evolved from chaos and dark night filling the realms of boundless space beyond the sage's sight at bounteous nature's kindly breast all things that breathe drink joy and birds and beasts and creeping things all follow where she leads her gifts to man are friends in need the wreath the foaming must to angels vision of god's throne to insects sensual lust but enough poetry i am in tears let me cry it may be foolishness that every one would laugh at but you won't laugh your eyes are shining too enough poetry i want to tell you now about the insects to whom god gave sensual lust to insects sensual lust i am that insect brother and it is said of me specially all we karamazovs are such insects and angel as you are that insect lives in you too and will stir up a tempest in your blood tempests because sensual lust is a tempest worse than a tempest beauty is a terrible and awful thing it is terrible because it has not been fathomed and never can be fathomed for god sets us nothing but riddles here the boundaries meet and all contradictions exist side by side i am not a cultivated man brother but i've thought a lot about this it's terrible what mysteries there are too many riddles weigh men down on earth we must solve them as we can and try to keep a dry skin in the water beauty i can't endure the thought that a man of lofty mind and heart begins with the ideal of the madonna and ends with the ideal of sodom what's still more awful is that a man with the ideal of sodom in his soul does not renounce the ideal of the madonna and his heart may be on fire with that ideal genuinely on fire just as in his days of youth and innocence yes man is broad too broad indeed i'd have him narrower the devil only knows what to make of it what to the mind is shameful is beauty and nothing else to the heart is there beauty in sodom believe me that for the immense mass of mankind beauty is found in sodom did you know that secret the awful thing is that beauty is mysterious as well as terrible god and the devil are fighting there and the battlefield is the heart of man but a man always talks of his own ache listen now to come to facts end of section sixteen Section 17 of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book Three, Chapter Four, The Confession of a Passionate Heart in Anecdote. I was leading a wild life then. Father said just now that I spent several thousand roubles in seducing young girls. That's a swinish invention, and there was nothing of the sort. And if there was, I didn't need money simply for that. With me, money is an accessory, the overflow of my heart, the framework. Today she would be my lady, tomorrow a wench out of the streets in her place. I entertained them both. I threw away money by the handful on music, rioting, and gypsies sometimes i gave it to the ladies too for they'll take it greedily that must be admitted and be pleased and thankful for it ladies used to be fond of me not all of them but it happened it happened 
but i always liked side paths little dark back alleys behind the main road there one finds adventures and surprises and precious metal in the dirt i am speaking figuratively brother in the town i was in there were no such back alleys in the literal sense but morally there were if you were like me you'd know what that means i loved vice i loved the ignominy of vice i loved cruelty am i not a bug am i not a noxious insect in fact a karamazov once we went a whole lot of us for a picnic in seven sledges it was dark it was winter and i began squeezing a girl's hand and forced her to kiss me she was the daughter of an official a sweet gentle submissive creature she allowed me she allowed me much in the dark she thought poor thing that i should come next day to make her an offer i was looked upon as a good match too but i didn't say a word to her for five months i used to see her in a corner at dances we were always having dances her eyes watching me i saw how they glowed with fire a fire of gentle indignation this game only tickled that insect lust i cherished in my soul five months later she married an official and left the town still angry and still perhaps in love with me now they live happily observe that i told no one i didn't boast of it though i'm full of low desires and love what's low i'm not dishonourable you're blushing your eyes flashed enough of this filth with you and all this was nothing much wayside blossoms a la paul de Kock though the cruel insect had already grown strong in my soul i've a perfect album of reminiscences brother god bless them the darlings i tried to break it off without quarrelling and i never gave them away i never bragged of one of them but that's enough you can't suppose i brought you here simply to talk of such nonsense no i'm going to tell you something more curious and don't be surprised that i'm glad to tell you instead of being ashamed you say that because i blushed alyosha said suddenly i wasn't blushing at what you were saying or at what you've done i blushed because i am the same as you are you come that's going a little too far no it's not too far said alyosha warmly obviously the idea was not a new one the ladder's the same i'm at the bottom step and you're above somewhere about the thirteenth that's how i see it but it's all the same absolutely the same in kind anyone on the bottom step is bound to go up to the top one then one ought not to step on at all anyone who can help it had better not but can you i think not hush ayasha hush darling i could kiss your hand you touch me so that rogue grushenka has an eye for men she told me once that she'd devour you one day there there i won't from this field of corruption fouled by flies let's pass to my tragedy also be fouled by flies that is by every sort of vileness although the old man told lies about my seducing innocence there really was something of the sort in my tragedy though it was only once and then it did not come off the old man who has reproached me with what never happened does not even know of this fact i never told anyone about it you're the first except ivan of course ivan knows everything he knew about it long before you but ivan's a tomb ivan's a tomb yes alyosha listened with great attention i was lieutenant in a line regiment but still i was under supervision like a kind of convict yet i was awfully well received in the little town i spent money right and left i was thought to be rich i thought so myself but i must have pleased them in other ways as well although they shook their heads over me they liked me my colonel who was an old man took a sudden dislike to me he was always down upon me but i had powerful friends and moreover all the town was on my side so he couldn't do me much harm i was in fault myself for refusing to treat him with proper respect i was proud this obstinate old fellow who was really a very good sort kind-hearted and hospitable had had two wives both dead 
his first wife who was of a humble family left a daughter as unpretentious as herself she was a young woman of four-and-twenty when i was there and was living with her father and an aunt her mother's sister the aunt was simple and illiterate the niece was simple but lively i like to say nice things about people i never knew a woman of more charming character than agafia fancy her name was agafia ivanovna and she wasn't bad-looking either in the russian style tall stout with a full figure and beautiful eyes though a rather coarse face she had not married although she had had two suitors she refused them but was as cheerful as ever i was intimate with her not in that way it was pure friendship i have often been friendly with women quite innocently i used to talk to her with shocking frankness and she only laughed many women like such freedom and she was a girl too which made it very amusing another thing one could never think of her as a young lady she and her aunt lived in her father's house with a sort of voluntary humility not putting themselves on an equality with other people she was a general favorite and of use to every one for she was a clever dressmaker she had a talent for it she gave her services freely without asking for payment but if any one offered her payment she didn't refuse the colonel of course was a very different matter he was one of the chief personages in the district he kept open house entertained the whole town gave suppers and dances at the time i arrived and joined the battalion all the town was talking of the expected return of the colonel's second daughter a great beauty who had just left a fashionable school in the capital this second daughter is katerina ivanovna and she was the child of the second wife who belonged to a distinguished general's family although as i learnt on good authority she too brought the colonel no money she had connections and that was all there may have been expectations but they had come to nothing yet when the young lady came from boarding-school on a visit the whole town revived our most distinguished ladies two excellencies and a colonel's wife and all the rest following their lead at once took her up and gave entertainments in her honour she was the belle of the balls and picnics and they got up tableau vivants in aid of distressed governesses i took no notice i went on as wildly as before and one of my exploits at the time set all the town talking i saw her eyes taking my measure one evening at the battery commander's but i didn't go up to her as though i disdained her acquaintance i did go up and speak to her at an evening party not long after she scarcely looked at me and compressed her lips scornfully wait a bit i'll have my revenge thought i i behaved like an awful fool on many occasions at that time and i was conscious of it myself what made it worse was that i felt that katenka was not an innocent boarding-school miss but a person of character proud and really high-principled above all she had education and intellect and i had neither you think i meant to make her an offer no i simply wanted to revenge myself because i was such a hero and she didn't seem to feel it meanwhile i spent my time in drink and riot till the lieutenant-colonel put me under arrest for three days just at that time father sent me six thousand roubles in return for my sending him a deed giving up all claims upon him settling our accounts so to speak and saying that i wouldn't expect anything more i didn't understand a word of it at the time until i came here alyosha till the last few days indeed perhaps even now i haven't been able to make head or tail of my money affairs with father but never mind that we'll talk of it later just as i received the money i got a letter from a friend telling me something that interested me immensely the authorities i learnt were dissatisfied with our lieutenant-colonel he was suspected of irregularities in fact his enemies were preparing a surprise for him and then the commander of the division arrived and kicked up the devil of a shindy shortly afterwards he was ordered to retire i won't tell you how it all happened he had enemies certainly suddenly there was a marked coolness in the town towards him and all his family 
his friends all turned their backs on him then i took my first step i met agafia ivanovna with whom i'd always kept up a friendship and said do you know there's a deficit of four thousand five hundred roubles of government money in your father's accounts what do you mean what makes you say so the general was here not long ago and everything was all right then it was but now it isn't she was terribly scared don't frighten me she said who told you so don't be uneasy i said i won't tell anyone you know i'm as silent as the tomb i only wanted in view of possibilities to add that when they demand that four thousand five hundred roubles from your father and he can't produce it he'll be tried and made to serve as a common soldier in his old age unless you like to send me your young lady secretly i've just had money paid me i'll give her four thousand if you like and keep the secret religiously ah you scoundrel that's what she said you wicked scoundrel how dare you she went away furiously indignant well i shouted after her once more that the secret should be kept sacred those two simple creatures agafia and her aunt i may as well say at once behaved like perfect angels all through this business they genuinely adored their katya thought her far above them and waited on her hand and foot but agafia told her of our conversation i found that out afterwards she didn't keep it back and of course that was all i wanted suddenly the new major arrived to take command of the battalion the old lieutenant-colonel was taken ill at once couldn't leave his room for two days and didn't hand over the government money dr kovchenko declared that he really was ill but i knew for a fact and had known for a long time that for the last four years the money had never been in his hands except when the commander made his visits of inspection he used to lend it to a trustworthy person a merchant of our town called trifonov an old widower with a big beard and gold-rimmed spectacles he used to go to the fair do a profitable business with the money and return the whole sum to the colonel bringing with it the present from the fair as well as interest on the loan but this time i heard all about it quite by chance from trifonov's son and heir a driveling youth and one of the most vicious in the world this time i say trifonov brought nothing back from the fair the lieutenant-colonel flew to him i've never received any money from you and couldn't possibly have received any that was all the answer he got so now our lieutenant-colonel is confined to the house with a towel round his head while they're all three busy putting ice on it and all at once an orderly arrives on the scene with the book and the order to hand over the battalion money immediately within two hours he signed the book i saw the signature in the book afterwards stood up saying he would put on his uniform ran to his bedroom loaded his double-barreled gun with a service bullet took the boot off his right foot fixed the gun against his chest and began feeling for the trigger with his foot but agafia remembering what i had told her had her suspicions she stole up and peeped into the room just in time she rushed in flung herself upon him from behind threw her arms round him and the gun went off hit the ceiling but hurt no one the others ran in took away the gun and held him by the arms i heard all about this afterwards i was at home it was getting dusk and i was just preparing to go out i had dressed brushed my hair centred my handkerchief and taken up my cap when suddenly the door opened and facing me in the room stood katerina ivanovna it's strange how things happen sometimes no one had seen her in the street so that no one knew of it in the town i lodged with two decrepit old ladies who looked after me they were the most obliging old things ready to do anything for me and at my request were as silent afterwards as two cast-iron posts of course i grasped the position at once she walked in and looked straight at me her dark eyes determined even defiant but on her lips and round her mouth i saw uncertainty 
my sister told me she began that you would give me four thousand five hundred roubles if i came to you for it myself i have come give me the money she couldn't keep it up she was breathless frightened her voice failed her and the corners of her mouth and the lines round it quivered alyosha are you listening or are you asleep mitya i know you will tell the whole truth said alyosha in agitation i am telling it if i tell the whole truth just as it happened i shan't spare myself my first idea was a karamazov one once i was bitten by a centipede brother and laid up a fortnight with fever from it well i felt a centipede biting at my heart then a noxious insect you understand i looked her up and down you've seen her she's a beauty but she was beautiful in another way then at that moment she was beautiful because she was noble and i was a scoundrel she in all the grandeur of her generosity and sacrifice for her father and i a bug and scoundrel as i was she was altogether at my mercy body and soul she was hemmed in i tell you frankly that thought that venomous thought so possessed my heart that it almost swooned with suspense it seemed as if there could be no resisting it as though i should act like a bug like a venomous spider without a spark of pity i could scarcely breathe understand i should have gone next day to ask for her hand so that it might end honourably so to speak and that nobody would or could know for though i'm a man of base desires i'm honest and at that very second some voice seemed to whisper in my ear but when you come to-morrow to make your proposal that girl won't even see you she'll order her coachman to kick you out of the yard publish it through all the town she would say i'm not afraid of you i looked at the young lady my voice had not deceived me that is how it would be not a doubt of it i could see from her face now that i should be turned out of the house my spite was roused i longed to play her the nastiest swinish cad's trick to look at her with a sneer and on the spot where she stood before me to stun her with a tone of voice that only a shop man could use four thousand what do you mean i was joking you've been counting your chickens too easily madam two hundred if you like with all my heart but four thousand is not a sum to throw away on such frivolity you've put yourself out to no purpose i should have lost the game of course she'd have run away but it would have been an infernal revenge it would have been worth it all i'd have howled with regret all the rest of my life only to have played that trick would you believe it it has never happened to me with any other woman not one to look at her at such a moment with hatred but on my oath i looked at her for three seconds or five perhaps with fearful hatred that hate which is only a hair's breadth from love from the maddest love i went to the window put my forehead against the frozen pane and i remember the ice burnt my forehead like fire i did not keep her long don't be afraid i turned round went up to the table opened the drawer and took out a banknote for five thousand roubles it was lying in a french dictionary then i showed it her in silence folded it handed it to her opened the door into the passage and stepping back made her a deep bow a most respectful a most impressive bow believe me she shuddered all over gazed at me for a second turned horribly pale white as a sheet in fact and all at once not impetuously but softly gently bowed down to my feet not a boarding-school curtsy but a russian bow with her forehead to the floor she jumped up and ran away i was wearing my sword i drew it and nearly stabbed myself with it on the spot why i don't know it would have been frightfully stupid of course i suppose it was from delight 
can you understand that one might kill oneself from delight but i didn't stab myself i only kissed my sword and put it back in the scabbard which there was no need to have told you by the way and i fancy that in telling you about my inner conflict i have laid it on rather thick to glorify myself but let it pass and to hell with all who pry into the human heart well so much for that adventure with katerina ivanovna so now ivan knows of it and you no one else dmitri got up took a step or two in his excitement pulled out his handkerchief and mopped his forehead and then sat down again not in the same place as before but on the opposite side so that alyosha had to turn quite round to face him end of section seventeen Section 18 of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book Three, Chapter Five: The Confession of a Passionate Heart Heals Up. Now, said Alyosha, I understand the first half. You understand the first half. That half is a drama, and it was played out there the second half is a tragedy and it is being acted here and i understand nothing of that second half so far said alyosha and i do you suppose i understand it stop dmitri there's one important question tell me you were betrothed you are betrothed still we weren't betrothed at once not for three months after that adventure the next day i told myself that the incident was closed concluded that there would be no sequel it seemed to me caddish to make her an offer on her side she gave no sign of life for the six weeks that she remained in the town except indeed for one action the day after her visit the maid-servant slipped round with an envelope addressed to me i tore it open it contained the change out of the banknote only four thousand five hundred roubles was needed but there was a discount of about two hundred on changing it she only sent me about two hundred and sixty i don't remember exactly but not a note not a word of explanation i searched the packet for a pencil mark n nothing well i spent the rest of the money on such an orgy that the new major was obliged to reprimand me well the lieutenant-colonel produced the battalion money to the astonishment of every one for nobody believed that he had the money untouched he no sooner paid it than he fell ill took to his bed and three weeks later softening of the brain set in and he died five days afterwards he was buried with military honors for he had not had time to receive his discharge ten days after his funeral katerina ivanovna with her aunt and sister went to moscow and behold on the very day they went away i hadn't seen them didn't see them off or take leave i received a tiny note a sheet of thin blue paper and on it only one line in pencil i will write to you wait k and that was all i'll explain the rest now in two words in moscow their fortunes changed with the swiftness of lightning and the unexpectedness of an arabian fairy tale that general's widow their nearest relation suddenly lost the two nieces who were her heiresses and next of kin both died in the same week of smallpox the old lady prostrated with grief welcomed katya as a daughter as her one hope clutched at her altered her will in katya's favor but that concerned the future meanwhile she gave her for present use eighty thousand roubles as a marriage portion to do what she liked with she was an hysterical woman i saw something of her in moscow later well suddenly i received by post four thousand five hundred roubles i was speechless with surprise as you may suppose three days later came the promised letter i have it with me now you must read it she offers to be my wife offers herself to me 
i love you madly she says even if you don't love me never mind be my husband don't be afraid i won't hamper you in any way i will be your chattel i will be the carpet under your feet i want to love you forever i want to save you from yourself alyosha i am not worthy to repeat those lines in my vulgar words and in my vulgar tone my everlastingly vulgar tone but i can never cure myself of that letter stabs me even now do you think i don't mind that i don't mind still i wrote her an answer at once as it was impossible for me to go to moscow i wrote to her with tears one thing i shall be ashamed of forever i referred to her being rich and having a dowry while i was only a stuck-up beggar i mentioned money i ought to have borne it in silence but it slipped from my pen then i wrote at once to ivan and told him all i could about it in a letter of six pages and sent him to her why do you look like that why are you staring at me yes ivan fell in love with her he's in love with her still i know that i did a stupid thing in the world's opinion but perhaps that one stupid thing may be the saving of us all now oh don't you see what a lot she thinks of ivan how she respects him when she compares us do you suppose she can love a man like me especially after all that has happened here but i am convinced that she does love a man like you and not a man like him she loves her own virtue not me the words broke involuntarily and almost malignantly from dmitri he laughed but a minute later his eyes gleamed he flushed crimson and struck the table violently with his fist i swear alyosha he cried with intense and genuine anger at himself you may not believe me but as god is holy and as christ is god i swear that though i smiled at her lofty sentiments just now i know that i am a million times baser in soul than she and that these lofty sentiments of hers are as sincere as a heavenly angel's that's the tragedy of it that i know that for certain what if any one does show off a bit don't i do it myself and yet i'm sincere i'm sincere as for ivan i can understand how he must be cursing nature now with his intellect too to see the preference given to whom to what to a monster who though he is betrothed and all eyes are fixed on him can't restrain his debaucheries and before the very eyes of his betrothed and a man like me is preferred while he is rejected and why because a girl wants to sacrifice her life and destiny out of gratitude it's ridiculous i've never said a word of this to ivan and ivan of course has never dropped a hint of the sort to me but destiny will be accomplished and the best man will hold his ground while the undeserving one will vanish into his back alley for ever his filthy back alley his beloved back alley where he is at home and where he will sink in filth and stench at his own free will and with enjoyment i've been talking foolishly i've no words left i use them at random but it will be as i have said i shall drown in the back alley and she will marry ivan stop dmitri alyosha interrupted again with great anxiety there's one thing you haven't made clear yet you are still betrothed all the same aren't you how can you break off the engagement if she your betrothed doesn't want to yes formally and solemnly betrothed it was all done on my arrival in moscow with great ceremony with icons all in fine style the general's wife blessed us and would you believe it congratulated katya you've made a good choice she said i see right through him and would you believe it she didn't like ivan and hardly greeted him i had a lot of talk with katya in moscow i told her about myself sincerely honorably she listened to everything there was sweet confusion there were tender words though there were proud words too she wrung out of me a mighty promise to reform i gave my promise and here what 
why i called to you and brought you out here to-day this very day remember it to send you this very day again to katerina ivanovna and what to tell her that i shall never come to see her again say he sends you his compliments but is that possible that's just the reason i'm sending you in my place because it's impossible and how could i tell her myself and where are you going to the back alley to grushenka then alyosha exclaimed mournfully clasping his hands can rakitin really have told the truth i thought that you had just visited her and that was all can a betrothed man pay such visits is such a thing possible and with such a betrothed and before the eyes of all the world confound it i have some honour as soon as i began visiting grushenka i ceased to be betrothed and to be an honest man i understand that why do you look at me you see i went in the first place to beat her i had heard and i know for a fact now that that captain father's agent had given grushenka an i o u of mine for her to sue me for payment so as to put an end to me they wanted to scare me i went to beat her i had had a glimpse of her before she doesn't strike one at first sight i knew about her old merchant who's lying ill now paralyzed but he's leaving her a decent little sum i knew too that she was fond of money that she hoarded it and lent it at a wicked rate of interest that she's a merciless cheat and swindler i went to beat her and i stayed the storm broke it struck me down like the plague i'm plague-stricken still and i know that everything is over that there will never be anything more for me the cycle of the ages is accomplished that's my position and though i'm a beggar as fate would have it i had three thousand just then in my pocket i drove with grushenka to Makro, a place twenty-five versts from here i got gypsies there and champagne and made all the peasants there drunk on it and all the women and girls i sent the thousands flying in three days time i was stripped bare but a hero do you suppose the hero had gained his end not a sign of it from her i tell you that rogue grushenka has a supple curve all over her body you can see it in her little foot even in her little toe i saw it and kissed it but that was all i swear i'll marry you if you like she said you're a beggar you know say that you won't beat me and will let me do anything i choose and perhaps i will marry you she laughed and she's laughing still dmitri leapt up with a sort of fury he seemed all at once as though he were drunk his eyes became suddenly bloodshot and do you really mean to marry her at once if she will and if she won't i shall stay all the same i'll be the porter at her gate alyosha he cried he stopped short before him and taking him by the shoulders began shaking him violently do you know you innocent boy that this is all delirium senseless delirium for there's a tragedy here let me tell you alexey that i may be a low man with low and degraded passions but a thief and a pickpocket dmitri karamazov never can be well then let me tell you that i am a thief and a pickpocket that very morning just before i went to beat grushenka katerina ivanovna sent for me and in strict secrecy why i don't know i suppose she had some reason asked me to go to the chief town of the province and to post three thousand roubles to agafia ivanovna in moscow so that nothing should be known of it in the town here so i had that three thousand roubles in my pocket when i went to see grushenka and it was that money we spent at Makro. afterwards i pretended i had been to the town but did not show her the post-office receipt i said i had sent the money and would bring the receipt and so far i haven't brought it i've forgotten it 
now what do you think you're going to her to-day to say he sends his compliments and she'll ask you what about the money you might still have said to her he's a degraded sensualist and a low creature with uncontrolled passions he didn't send your money then but wasted it because like a low brute he couldn't control himself but still you might have added he isn't a thief though here is your three thousand he sends it back send it yourself to agafia ivanovna but he told me to say he sends his compliments but as it is she will ask but where is the money mitya you are unhappy yes but not as unhappy as you think don't worry yourself to death with despair what do you suppose i'd shoot myself because i can't get three thousand to pay back that's just it i shan't shoot myself i haven't the strength now afterwards perhaps but now i'm going to grushenka i don't care what happens and what then i'll be her husband if she deigns to have me and when lovers come i'll go to the next room i'll clean her friends galoshes blow up their samovar run their errands katerina ivanovna will understand it all alyosha said solemnly she'll understand how great this trouble is and will forgive she has a lofty mind and no one could be more unhappy than you she'll see that for herself she won't forgive everything said dmitri with a grin there's something in it brother that no woman could forgive do you know what would be the best thing to do what pay back the three thousand where can we get it from i say i have two thousand ivan will give you another thousand that makes three take it and pay it back and when would you get it your three thousand you're not of age besides and you must you absolutely must take my farewell to her to-day with the money or without it for i can't drag on any longer things have come to such a pass to-morrow is too late i shall send you to father to father yes to father first ask him for three thousand but mitya he won't give it as though he would i know he won't do you know the meaning of despair alexey yes listen legally he owes me nothing i've had it all from him i know that but morally he owes me something doesn't he you know he started with twenty-eight thousand of my mother's money and made a hundred thousand with it let him give me back only three out of the twenty-eight thousand and he'll draw my soul out of hell and it will atone for many of his sins for that three thousand i give you my solemn word i'll make an end of everything and he shall hear nothing more of me for the last time i give him the chance to be a father tell him god himself sends him this chance mitya he won't give it for anything i know he won't i know it perfectly well now especially that's not all i know something more now only a few days ago perhaps only yesterday he found out for the first time in earnest underline in earnest that grushenka is really perhaps not joking and really means to marry me he knows her nature he knows the cat and do you suppose he's going to give me money to help to bring that about when he's crazy about her himself and that's not all either i can tell you more than that i know that for the last five days he has had three thousand drawn out of the bank changed into notes of a hundred roubles packed into a large envelope sealed with five seals and tied across with red tape you see how well i know all about it on the envelope is written to my angel grushenka when she will come to me he scrawled it himself in silence and in secret and no one knows that the money's there except the valet smerdyakov whom he trusts like himself so now he has been expecting grushenka for the last three or four days he hopes she'll come for the money he has sent her word of it and she has sent him word that perhaps she'll come and if she does go to the old man can i marry her after that 
do you understand now why i'm here in secret and what i'm on the watch for for her yes for her foma has a room in the house of these sluts here foma comes from our parts he was a soldier in our regiment he does jobs for them he's watchman at night and goes grouse shooting in the daytime and that's how he lives i've established myself in his room neither he nor the women of the house know the secret that is that i am on the watch here no one but smerdyakov knows then no one else he will let me know if she goes to the old man it was he told you about the money then yes it's a dead secret even ivan doesn't know about the money or anything the old man is sending ivan to chermashnia on a two or three days journey a purchaser has turned up for the copse he'll give eight thousand for the timber so the old man keeps asking ivan to help him by going to arrange it it will take him two or three days that's what the old man wants so that grushenka can come while he's away then he's expecting grushenka to-day no she won't come to-day there are signs she's certain not to come cried mitya suddenly smerdyakov thinks so too father's drinking now he's sitting at table with ivan go to him alyosha and ask for the three thousand mitya dear what's the matter with you cried alyosha jumping up from his place and looking keenly at his brother's frenzied face for one moment the thought struck him that dmitri was mad what is it i'm not insane said dmitri looking intently and earnestly at him no fear i am sending you to father and i know what i'm saying i believe in miracles in miracles in a miracle of divine providence god knows my heart he sees my despair he sees the whole picture surely he won't let something awful happen alyosha i believe in miracles go i am going tell me will you wait for me here yes i know it will take some time you can't go at him point blank he's drunk now i'll wait three hours four five six seven only remember you must go to katerina ivanovna to-day if it has to be at midnight with the money or without the money and say he sends his compliments to you i want you to say that verse to her he sends his compliments to you mitya and what if grushenka comes to-day if not to-day to-morrow or the next day grushenka i shall see her i shall rush out and prevent it and if if there's an if it will be murder i couldn't endure it who will be murdered the old man i shan't kill her brother what are you saying oh i don't know i don't know perhaps i shan't kill and perhaps i shall i'm afraid that he will suddenly become so loathsome to me with his face at that moment i hate his ugly throat his nose his eyes his shameless snigger i feel a physical repulsion that's what i'm afraid of that's what may be too much for me i'll go mitya i believe that god will order things for the best that nothing awful may happen and i will sit and wait for the miracle and if it doesn't come to pass alyosha went thoughtfully towards his father's house End of section 18section 19 of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book 3 chapter 6 smerdyakov he did in fact find his father still at table though there was a dining-room in the house the table was laid as usual in the drawing-room which was the largest room and furnished with old-fashioned ostentation the furniture was white and very old upholstered in old red silky material in the spaces between the windows there were mirrors in elaborate white and gilt frames of old-fashioned carving on the walls covered with white paper which was torn in many places 
there hung two large portraits one of some prince who had been governor of the district thirty years before and the other of some bishop also long since dead in the corner opposite the door there were several icons before which a lamp was lighted at nightfall not so much for devotional purposes as to light the room fyodor pavlovitch used to go to bed very late at three or four o'clock in the morning and would wander about the room at night or sit in an armchair thinking this had become a habit with him he often slept quite alone in the house sending his servants to the lodge but usually smerdyakov remained sleeping on a bench in the hall when alyosha came in dinner was over but coffee and preserves had been served fyodor pavlovitch liked sweet things with brandy after dinner ivan was also at table sipping coffee the servants grigory and smerdyakov were standing by both the gentlemen and the servants seemed in singularly good spirits fyodor pavlovitch was roaring with laughter before he entered the room alyosha heard the shrill laugh he knew so well and could tell from the sound of it that his father had only reached the good-humoured stage and was far from being completely drunk here he is here he is yelled fyodor pavlovitch highly delighted at seeing alyosha join us sit down coffee is a lenten dish but it's hot and good i don't offer you brandy you're keeping the fast but would you like some no i'd better give you some of our famous liqueur smerdyakov go to the cupboard the second shelf on the right here are the keys look sharp alyosha began refusing the liqueur never mind if you won't have it we will said fyodor pavlovitch beaming but stay have you dined yes answered alyosha who had in truth only eaten a piece of bread and drunk a glass of kvass in the father superior's kitchen though i should be pleased to have some hot coffee bravo my darling he'll have some coffee does it want warming no it's boiling it's capital coffee smerdyakov's making my smerdyakov's an artist at coffee and at fish patties and at fish soup too you must come one day and have some fish soup let me know beforehand but stay didn't i tell you this morning to come home with your mattress and pillow and all have you brought your mattress <laughs> no i haven't said alyosha smiling too ah but you were frightened you were frightened this morning weren't you there my darling i couldn't do anything to vex you do you know ivan i can't resist the way he looks one straight in the face and laughs it makes me laugh all over i'm so fond of him alyosha let me give you my blessing a father's blessing alyosha rose but fyodor pavlovitch had already changed his mind no no he said i'll just make the sign of the cross over you for now sit still now we've a treat for you in your own line too it'll make you laugh balaam's ass has begun talking to us here and how he talks how he talks balaam's ass it appeared was the valet smerdyakov he was a young man of about four-and-twenty remarkably unsociable and taciturn not that he was shy or bashful on the contrary he was conceited and seemed to despise everybody but we must pause to say a few words about him now he was brought up by grigory and marfa but the boy grew up with no sense of gratitude as grigory expressed it he was an unfriendly boy and seemed to look at the world mistrustfully in his childhood he was very fond of hanging cats and burying them with great ceremony he used to dress up in a sheet as though it were a surplice and sang and waved some object over the dead cat as though it were a censer all this he did on the sly with the greatest secrecy grigory caught him once at this diversion and gave him a sound beating he shrank into a corner and sulked there for a week he doesn't care for you or me the monster grigory used to say to marfa and he doesn't care for any one are you a human being he said addressing the boy directly you're not a human being you grew from the mildew in the bathhouse that's what you are smerdyakov it appeared afterwards could never forgive him those words 
grigory taught him to read and write and when he was twelve years old began teaching him the scriptures but this teaching came to nothing at the second or third lesson the boy suddenly grinned what's that for asked grigory looking at him threateningly from under his spectacles oh nothing god created light on the first day and the sun moon and stars on the fourth day where did the light come from on the first day grigory was thunderstruck the boy looked sarcastically at his teacher there was something positively condescending in his expression grigory could not restrain himself i'll show you where he cried and gave the boy a violent slap on the cheek the boy took the slap without a word but withdrew into his corner again for some days a week later he had his first attack of the disease to which he was subject all the rest of his life epilepsy when fyodor pavlovitch heard of it his attitude to the boy seemed changed at once till then he had taken no notice of him though he never scolded him and always gave him a kopeck when he met him sometimes when he was in good humor he would send the boy something sweet from his table but as soon as he heard of his illness he showed an active interest in him sent for a doctor and tried remedies but the disease turned out to be incurable the fits occurred on an average once a month but at various intervals the fits varied too in violence some were light and some were very severe fyodor pavlovitch strictly forbade grigory to use corporal punishment to the boy and began allowing him to come upstairs to him he forbade him to be taught anything whatever for a time too one day when the boy was about fifteen fyodor pavlovitch noticed him lingering by the bookcase and reading the titles through the glass fyodor pavlovitch had a fair number of books over a hundred but no one ever saw him reading he at once gave smerdyakov the key of the bookcase come read you shall be my librarian you'll be better sitting reading than hanging about the courtyard come read this and fyodor pavlovitch gave him evenings in a cottage near dikanka he read a little but didn't like it he did not once smile and ended by frowning why isn't it funny asked fyodor pavlovitch smerdyakov did not speak answer stupid it's all untrue mumbled the boy with a grin then go to the devil you have the soul of a lackey stay here's smaragdov's universal history that's all true read that but smerdyakov did not get through ten pages of smaragdov he thought it dull so the bookcase was closed again shortly afterwards marfa and grigory reported to fyodor pavlovitch that smerdyakov was gradually beginning to show an extraordinary fastidiousness he would sit before his soup take up his spoon and look into the soup bend over it examine it take a spoonful and hold it to the light what is it a beetle grigory would ask a fly perhaps observed marfa the squeamish youth never answered but he did the same with his bread his meat and everything he ate he would hold a piece on his fork to the light scrutinize it microscopically and only after long deliberation decide to put it in his mouth ah what fine gentleman's airs grigory muttered looking at him when fyodor pavlovitch heard of this development in smerdyakov he determined to make him his cook and sent him to moscow to be trained he spent some years there and came back remarkably changed in appearance he looked extraordinarily old for his age his face had grown wrinkled yellow and strangely emasculate in character he seemed almost exactly the same as before he went away he was just as unsociable and showed not the slightest inclination for any companionship in moscow too as we heard afterwards he had always been silent moscow itself had little interest for him he saw very little there and took scarcely any notice of anything he went once to the theatre but returned silent and displeased with it on the other hand 
he came back to us from moscow well dressed in a clean coat and clean linen he brushed his clothes most scrupulously twice a day invariably and was very fond of cleaning his smart calf boots with a special english polish so that they shone like mirrors he turned out a first-rate cook fyodor pavlovitch paid him a salary almost the whole of which smerdyakov spent on clothes pomade perfumes and such things but he seemed to have as much contempt for the female sex as for men he was discreet almost unapproachable with them fyodor pavlovitch began to regard him rather differently his fits were becoming more frequent and on the days he was ill marfa cooked which did not suit fyodor pavlovitch at all why are your fits getting worse asked fyodor pavlovitch looking askance at his new cook would you like to get married shall i find you a wife but smerdyakov turned pale with anger and made no reply fyodor pavlovitch left him with an impatient gesture the great thing was that he had absolute confidence in his honesty it happened once when fyodor pavlovitch was drunk that he dropped in the muddy courtyard three hundred rouble notes which he had only just received he only missed them next day and was just hastening to search his pockets when he saw the notes lying on the table where had they come from smerdyakov had picked them up and brought them in the day before well my lad i've never met anyone like you fyodor pavlovitch said shortly and gave him ten roubles we may add that he not only believed in his honesty but had for some reason a liking for him although the young man looked as morosely at him as at every one and was always silent he rarely spoke if it had occurred to any one to wonder at the time what the young man was interested in and what was in his mind it would have been impossible to tell by looking at him yet he used sometimes to stop suddenly in the house or even in the yard or street and would stand still for ten minutes lost in thought a physiognomist studying his face would have said that there was no thought in it no reflection but only a sort of contemplation there is a remarkable picture by the painter kramskoy called contemplation there is a forest in winter and on a roadway through the forest in absolute solitude stands a peasant in a torn kaftan and bark shoes he stands as it were lost in thought yet he is not thinking he is contemplating if any one touched him he would start and look at one as though awakening and bewildered it's true he would come to himself immediately but if he were asked what he had been thinking about he would remember nothing yet probably he has hidden within himself the impression which had dominated him during the period of contemplation those impressions are dear to him and no doubt he hoards them imperceptibly and even unconsciously how and why of course he does not know either he may suddenly after hoarding impressions for many years abandon everything and go off to jerusalem on a pilgrimage for his soul's salvation or perhaps he will suddenly set fire to his native village and perhaps do both there are a good many contemplatives among the peasantry well smerdyakov was probably one of them and he probably was greedily hoarding up his impressions hardly knowing why end of section 19section 20 of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book 3 chapter 7 the controversy but balaam's ass had suddenly spoken the subject was a strange one grigory had gone in the morning to make purchases and had heard from the shopkeeper lukyanov the story of a russian soldier which had appeared in the newspaper of that day 
this soldier had been taken prisoner in some remote part of asia and was threatened with an immediate agonizing death if he did not renounce christianity and follow islam he refused to deny his faith and was tortured flayed alive and died praising and glorifying christ grigory had related the story at table fyodor pavlovitch always liked over the dessert after dinner to laugh and talk if only with grigory this afternoon he was in a particularly good-humoured and expansive mood sipping his brandy and listening to the story he observed that they ought to make a saint of a soldier like that and to take his skin to some monastery that would make the people flock and bring the money in grigory frowned seeing that fyodor pavlovitch was by no means touched but as usual was beginning to scoff at that moment smerdyakov who was standing by the door smiled smerdyakov often waited at table towards the end of dinner and since ivan's arrival in our town he had done so every day what are you grinning at asked fyodor pavlovitch catching the smile instantly and knowing that it referred to grigory well my opinion is smerdyakov began suddenly and unexpectedly in a loud voice that if that laudable soldier's exploit was so very great there would have been to my thinking no sin in it if he had on such an emergency renounced so to speak the name of christ and his own christening to save by that same his life for good deeds by which in the course of years to expiate his cowardice how could it not be a sin you're talking nonsense for that you'll go straight to hell and be roasted there like mutton put in fyodor pavlovitch it was at this point that alyosha came in and fyodor pavlovitch as we have seen was highly delighted at his appearance we're on your subject your subject he chuckled gleefully making alyosha sit down to listen as for mutton that's not so and there'll be nothing there for this and there shouldn't be either if it's according to justice smerdyakov maintained stoutly how do you mean according to justice fyodor pavlovitch cried still more gaily nudging alyosha with his knee he's a rascal that's what he is burst from grigory he looked smerdyakov wrathfully in the face as for being a rascal wait a little grigory vassilievitch answered smerdyakov with perfect composure you'd better consider yourself that once i am taken prisoner by the enemies of the christian race and they demand from me to curse the name of god and to renounce my holy christening i am fully entitled to act by my own reason since there would be no sin in it but you've said that before don't waste words prove it cried fyodor pavlovitch soup maker muttered grigory contemptuously as for being a soup maker wait a bit too and consider for yourself grigory vassilievitch without abusing me for as soon as i say to those enemies no i'm not a christian and i curse my true god then at once by god's high judgment i become immediately and specially anathema accursed and am cut off from the holy church exactly as though i were a heathen so that at that very instant not only when i say it aloud but when i think of saying it before a quarter of a second has passed i am cut off is that so or not grigory vassilievitch he addressed grigory with obvious satisfaction though he was really answering fyodor pavlovitch's questions and was well aware of it and intentionally pretending that grigory had asked the questions ivan cried fyodor pavlovitch suddenly stoop down for me to whisper he's got this all up for your benefit he wants you to praise him praise him ivan listened with perfect seriousness to his father's excited whisper stay smerdyakov be quiet a minute cried fyodor pavlovitch once more ivan your ear again ivan bent down again with a perfectly grave face i love you as i do alyosha don't think i don't love you some brandy yes but you're rather drunk yourself thought ivan looking steadily at his father he was watching smerdyakov with great curiosity you're anathema accursed as it is 
gregory suddenly burst out and how dare you argue you rascal after that if don't scold him gregory don't scold him fyodor pavlovitch cut him short you should wait grigory vassilievitch if only a short time and listen for i haven't finished all i had to say for at the very moment i become accursed at that same highest moment i become exactly like a heathen and my christening is taken off me and becomes of no avail isn't that so make haste and finish my boy fyodor pavlovitch urged him sipping from his wine-glass with relish and if i've ceased to be a christian then i told no lie to the enemy when they asked whether i was a christian or not a christian seeing i had already been relieved by god himself of my christianity by reason of the thought alone before i had time to utter a word to the enemy and if i have already been discharged in what manner and with what sort of justice can i be held responsible as a christian in the other world for having denied christ when through the very thought alone before denying him i had been relieved from my christening if i'm no longer a christian then i can't renounce christ for i've nothing then to renounce who will hold an unclean tatar responsible grigory vassilievitch even in heaven for not having been born a christian and who would punish him for that considering that you can't take two skins off one ox for god almighty himself even if he did make the tatar responsible when he dies would give him the smallest possible punishment i imagine since he must be punished judging that he is not to blame if he has come into the world an unclean heathen from heathen parents the lord god can't surely take a tatar and say he was a christian that would mean that the almighty would tell a real untruth and can the lord of heaven and earth tell a lie even in one word grigory was thunderstruck and looked at the orator his eyes nearly starting out of his head though he did not clearly understand what was said he had caught something in this rigmarole and stood looking like a man who has just hit his head against a wall fyodor pavlovitch emptied his glass and went off into his shrill laugh alyosha alyosha what do you say to that ah you casuist he must have been with the jesuits somewhere ivan oh you stinking jesuit who taught you but you're talking nonsense you casuist nonsense 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 don't cry grigory we'll reduce him to smoke and ashes in a moment tell me this o oh ass you may be right before your enemies but you have renounced your faith all the same in your own heart and you say yourself that in that very hour you became anathema accursed and if once you're anathema they won't pat you on the head for it in hell what do you say to that my fine jesuit there is no doubt that i have renounced it in my own heart but there was no special sin in that or if there was sin it was the most ordinary how's that the most ordinary you lie accursed one hissed grigory consider yourself grigory vassilievitch smerdyakov went on staid and unruffled conscious of his triumph but as it were generous to the vanquished foe consider yourself grigory vassilievitch it is said in the scripture that if you have faith even as a mustard seed and bid a mountain move into the sea it will move without the least delay at your bidding well grigory vassilievitch if i'm without faith and you have so great a faith that you are continually swearing at me you try yourself telling this mountain not to move into the sea for that's a long way off but even to our stinking little river which runs at the bottom of the garden you'll see for yourself that it won't budge but will remain just where it is however much you shout at it and that shows grigory vassilievitch that you haven't faith in the proper manner and only abuse others about it again taking into consideration that no one in our day not only you but actually no one from the highest person to the lowest peasant can shove mountains into the sea 
except perhaps some one man in the world or at most two and they most likely are saving their souls in secret somewhere in the egyptian desert so you wouldn't find them if so it be if all the rest have no faith will god curse all the rest that is the population of the whole earth except about two hermits in the desert and in his well-known mercy will he not forgive one of them and so i'm persuaded that though i may once have doubted i shall be forgiven if i shed tears of repentance stay cried fyodor pavlovitch in a transport of delight so you do suppose there are two who can move mountains ivan make a note of it write it down there you have the russian all over you're quite right in saying it's characteristic of the people's faith ivan assented with an approving smile you agree then it must be so if you agree it's true isn't it alyosha that's the russian faith all over isn't it no smerdyakov has not the russian faith at all said alyosha firmly and gravely i'm not talking about his faith i mean those two in the desert only that idea surely that's russian isn't it yes that's purely russian said alyosha smiling your words are worth a gold piece o oh ass and i'll give it to you to-day but as to the rest you talk nonsense 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 let me tell you stupid that we here are all of little faith only from carelessness because we haven't time things are too much for us and in the second place the lord god has given us so little time only twenty-four hours in the day so that one hasn't even time to get sleep enough much less to repent of one's sins while you have denied your faith to your enemies when you'd nothing else to think about but to show your faith so i consider brother that it constitutes a sin constitute a sin it may but consider yourself grigory vassilievitch that it only extenuates it if it does constitute if i had believed then in very truth as i ought to have believed then it really would have been sinful if i had not faced tortures for my faith and had gone over to the pagan mohammedan faith but of course it wouldn't have come to torture then because i should only have had to say at that instant to the mountain move and crush the tormentor and it would have moved and at the very instant have crushed him like a black beetle and i should have walked away as though nothing had happened praising and glorifying god but suppose at that very moment i had tried all that and cried to that mountain crush these tormentors and it hadn't crushed them how could i have helped doubting pray at such a time and at such a dread hour of mortal terror and apart from that i should know already that i could not attain to the fullness of the kingdom of heaven for since the mountain had not moved at my word they could not think very much of my faith up aloft and there could be no very great reward awaiting me in the world to come so why should i let them flay the skin off me as well and to no good purpose for even though they had flayed my skin half off my back even then the mountain would not have moved at my word or at my cry and at such a moment not only doubt might come over one but one might lose one's reason from fear so that one would not be able to think at all and therefore how should i be particularly to blame if not seeing my advantage or reward there or here i should at least save my skin and so trusting fully in the grace of the lord i should cherish the hope that i might be altogether forgiven end of section twenty Section twenty one of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book three, chapter eight. Over the Brandy. The controversy was over, but, strange to say, Fyodor Pavlovitch, who had been so gay, suddenly began frowning 
he frowned and gulped brandy and it was already a glass too much get along with you jesuits he cried to the servants go away smerdyakov i'll send you the gold piece i promised you to-day but be off don't cry grigory go to marfa she'll comfort you and put you to bed the rascals won't let us sit in peace after dinner he snapped peevishly as the servants promptly withdrew at his word smerdyakov always pokes himself in now after dinner it's you he's so interested in what have you done to fascinate him he added to ivan nothing whatever answered ivan he's pleased to have a high opinion of me he's a lackey and a mean soul raw material for revolution however when the time comes for revolution there will be others and better ones but there will be some like him as well his kind will come first and better ones after and when will the time come the rocket will go off and fizzle out perhaps the peasants are not very fond of listening to these soup makers so far ah brother but a balaam's ass like that thinks and thinks and the devil knows where he gets to he's storing up ideas said ivan smiling you see i know he can't bear me nor any one else even you though you fancy that he has a high opinion of you worse still with alyosha he despises alyosha but he doesn't steal that's one thing and he's not a gossip he holds his tongue and doesn't wash our dirty linen in public he makes capital fish pasties too but damn him is he worth talking about so much of course he isn't but as for the ideas he may be hatching the russian peasant generally speaking needs thrashing that i've always maintained our peasants are swindlers and don't deserve to be pitied and it's a good thing they're still flogged sometimes russia is rich in birches if they destroyed the forests it would be the ruin of russia i stand up for the clever people we've left off thrashing the peasants we've grown so clever but they go on thrashing themselves and a good thing too for with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you again or how does it go anyhow it will be measured but russia's all swinishness my dear if you only knew how i hate russia that is not russia but all this vice but maybe i mean russia tout cela c'est de la cochonnerie do you know what i like i like wit you've had another glass that's enough wait a bit i'll have one more and then another and then i'll stop no stay you interrupted me at macro i was talking to an old man and he told me there's nothing we like so much as sentencing girls to be thrashed and we always give the lads the job of thrashing them and the girl he has thrashed to-day the young man will ask in marriage to-morrow so it quite suits the girls too he said there's a set of desades for you but it's clever anyway shall we go over and have a look at it eh alyosha are you blushing don't be bashful child i'm sorry i didn't stay to dinner at the superiors and tell the monks about the girls at macro alyosha don't be angry that i offended your superior this morning i lost my temper if there is a god if he exists then of course i'm to blame and i shall have to answer for it but if there isn't a god at all what do they deserve your fathers it's not enough to cut their heads off for they keep back progress would you believe it ivan that that lacerates my sentiments no you don't believe it as i see from your eyes you believe what people say that i'm nothing but a buffoon alyosha do you believe that i'm nothing but a buffoon no i don't believe it and i believe you don't and that you speak the truth you look sincere and you speak sincerely but not ivan ivan's supercilious i'd make an end of your monks though all the same i'd take all that mystic stuff and suppress it once for all all over russia so as to bring all the fools to reason and the gold and the silver that would flow into the mint but why suppress it asked ivan 
that truth may prevail that's why well if truth were to prevail you know you'd be the first to be robbed and suppressed ah i dare say you're right <laughs> i'm an ass burst out fyodor pavlovitch striking himself lightly on the forehead well your monastery may stand then alyosha if that's how it is and we clever people will sit snug and enjoy our brandy you know ivan it must have been so ordained by the almighty himself ivan speak is there a god or not stay speak the truth speak seriously why are you laughing again i'm laughing that you should have made a clever remark just now about smerdyakov's belief in the existence of two saints who could move mountains why am i like him now then very much well that shows i'm a russian too and i have a russian characteristic and you may be caught in the same way though you are a philosopher shall i catch you what do you bet that i'll catch you to-morrow speak all the same is there a god or not only be serious i want you to be serious now no there is no god alyosha is there a god there is ivan and is there immortality of some sort just a little just a tiny bit there is no immortality either none at all none at all there's absolute nothingness then perhaps there's just something anything is better than nothing absolute nothingness alyosha is there immortality there is god and immortality god and immortality in god is immortality mm, it's more likely ivan's right good lord to think what faith what force of all kinds man has lavished for nothing on that dream and for how many thousand years who is it laughing at man ivan for the last time once for all is there a god or not i ask for the last time and for the last time there is not who is laughing at mankind ivan it must be the devil said ivan smiling and the devil does he exist no there's no devil either it's a pity damn it all what wouldn't i do to the man who first invented god hanging on a bitter aspen tree would be too good for him there would have been no civilization if they hadn't invented god wouldn't there have been without god no and there would have been no brandy either but i must take your brandy away from you anyway stop 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 dear boy one more little glass i've hurt alyosha's feelings you're not angry with me alyosha my dear little alexey no i am not angry i know your thoughts your heart is better than your head my heart better than my head is it oh lord and that from you ivan do you love alyosha yes you must love him fyodor pavlovitch was by this time very drunk listen alyosha i was rude to your elder this morning but i was excited but there's wit in that elder don't you think ivan very likely there is there is il y a du piron là dedans he's a jesuit a russian one that is as he's an honourable person there's a hidden indignation boiling within him at having to pretend and affect holiness but of course he believes in god not a bit of it didn't you know why he tells everyone so himself that is not everyone but all the clever people who come to him he said straight out to governor schultz not long ago credo but i don't know in what really he really did but i respect him there's something of mephistopheles about him or rather of the hero of our time arbanin or what's his name you see he's a sensualist 
he's such a sensualist that i should be afraid for my daughter or my wife if she went to confess to him you know when he begins telling stories the year before last he invited us to tea tea with liqueur the ladies sent him liqueur and began telling us about old times till we nearly split our sides especially how he once cured a paralyzed woman if my legs were not bad i know a dance i could dance you he said and what do you say to that i've plenty of tricks in my time said he he did dernadov the merchant out of sixty thousand what he stole it he brought him the money as a man he could trust saying take care of it for me friend there'll be a police search at my place to-morrow and he kept it you have given it to the church he declared i said to him you're a scoundrel i said no said he i'm not a scoundrel but i'm broad-minded but that wasn't he that was someone else i've muddled him with someone else without noticing it come another glass and that's enough take away the bottle ivan i've been telling lies why didn't you stop me ivan and tell me i was lying i knew you'd stop of yourself that's a lie you did it from spite from simple spite against me you despise me you have come to me and despised me in my own house well i'm going away you've had too much brandy i've begged you for christ's sake to go to chermashnia for a day or two and you don't go i'll go to-morrow if you're so set upon it you won't go you want to keep an eye on me that's what you want spiteful fellow that's why you won't go the old man persisted he had reached that state of drunkenness when the drunkard who has till then been inoffensive tries to pick a quarrel and to assert himself why are you looking at me why do you look like that your eyes look at me and say you ugly drunkard your eyes are mistrustful they're contemptuous you've come here with some design alyosha here looks at me and his eyes shine alyosha doesn't despise me alexey you mustn't love ivan don't be ill-tempered with my brother leave off attacking him alyosha said emphatically oh all right Ugh, my head aches take away the brandy ivan it's the third time i've told you he mused and suddenly a slow cunning grin spread over his face don't be angry with a feeble old man ivan i know you don't love me but don't be angry all the same you've nothing to love me for you go to chermashnia i'll come to you myself and bring you a present i'll show you a little wench there i've had my eye on her a long time she's still running about barefoot don't be afraid of barefooted wenches don't despise them they're pearls and he kissed his hand with a smack to my thinking he revived at once seeming to grow sober the instant he touched on his favorite topic to my thinking ah you boys you children little sucking pigs to my thinking i never thought a woman ugly in my life that's been my rule can you understand that how could you understand it you've milk in your veins not blood you're not out of your shells yet my rule has been that you can always find something devilishly interesting in every woman that you wouldn't find in any other only one must know how to find it that's the point that's a talent to my mind there are no ugly women the very fact that she is a woman is half the battle but how could you understand that even in vieille fille even in them you may discover something that makes you simply wonder that men have been such fools as to let them grow old without noticing them barefooted girls or unattractive ones you must take by surprise didn't you know that you must astound them till they're fascinated upset ashamed that such a gentleman should fall in love with such a little slut it's a jolly good thing that there always are and will be masters and slaves in the world so there always will be a little maid of all work and her master and you know that's all that's needed for happiness stay listen alyosha 
i always used to surprise your mother but in a different way i paid no attention to her at all but all at once when the minute came i'd be all devotion to her crawl on my knees kiss her feet and i always always i remember it as though it were to-day reduced her to that tinkling quiet nervous queer little laugh it was peculiar to her i knew her attacks always used to begin like that the next day she would begin shrieking hysterically and this little laugh was not a sign of delight though it made a very good counterfeit that's the great thing to know how to take every one once Belyevsky, he was a handsome fellow and rich used to like to come here and hang about her suddenly gave me a slap in the face in her presence and she such a mild sheep why i thought she would have knocked me down for that blow how she set on me you're beaten beaten now she said you've taken a blow from him you have been trying to sell me to him she said and how dared he strike you in my presence don't dare come near me again never never run at once challenge him to a duel i took her to the monastery then to bring her to her senses the holy fathers prayed her back to reason but i swear by god ayasha i never insulted the poor crazy girl only once perhaps in the first year then she was very fond of praying she used to keep the feasts of our lady particularly and used to turn me out of her room then i'll knock that mysticism out of her thought i here said i you see your holy image here it is here i take it down you believe it's miraculous but here i'll spit on it directly and nothing will happen to me for it when she saw it good lord i thought she would kill me but she only jumped up wrung her hands then suddenly hid her face in them began trembling all over and fell on the floor fell all of a heap alyosha alyosha what's the matter the old man jumped up in alarm from the time he had begun speaking about his mother a change had gradually come over alyosha's face he flushed crimson his eyes glowed his lips quivered the old sot had gone spluttering on noticing nothing till the moment when something very strange happened to alyosha precisely what he was describing in the crazy woman was suddenly repeated with alyosha he jumped up from his seat exactly as his mother was said to have done wrung his hands hid his face in them and fell back in his chair shaking all over in an hysterical paroxysm of sudden violent silent weeping his extraordinary resemblance to his mother particularly impressed the old man ivan ivan water quickly it's like her exactly as she used to be then his mother spurt some water on him from your mouth that's what i used to do to her he's upset about his mother his mother he muttered to ivan but she was my mother too i believe his mother was she not said ivan with uncontrolled anger and contempt the old man shrank before his flashing eyes but something very strange had happened though only for a second it really seemed to have escaped the old man's mind that alyosha's mother actually was the mother of ivan too your mother he muttered not understanding what do you mean what mother are you talking about was she why damn it of course she was yours too damn it my mind has never been so darkened before excuse me why i was thinking ivan <laughs> he stopped a broad drunken half senseless grin overspread his face at that moment a fearful noise and clamour was heard in the hall there were violent shouts the door was flung open and dmitri burst into the room the old man rushed to ivan in terror he'll kill me he'll kill me don't let him get at me he screamed clinging to the skirt of ivan's coat End of section 21。section 22 of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book Three, Chapter Nine: The Sensualists. Grigory and Smerdyakov ran into the room after Dmitri. They had been struggling with him in the passage, refusing to admit him, acting on instructions given them by Fyodor Pavlovitch some days before. Taking advantage of the fact that Dmitri stopped a moment on entering the room to look about him, Grigory ran round the table, closed the double doors on the opposite side of the room leading to the inner apartments, and stood before the closed doors, stretching wide his arms, prepared to defend the entrance, so to speak, with the last drop of his blood. Seeing this, Dmitri uttered a scream rather than a shout, and rushed at Grigory then she's there she's hidden there out of the way scoundrel he tried to pull grigory away but the old servant pushed him back beside himself with fury dmitri struck out and hit grigory with all his might the old man fell like a log and dmitri leaping over him broke in the door smerdyakov remained pale and trembling at the other end of the room huddling close to fyodor pavlovitch she's here shouted dmitri i saw her turn towards the house just now but i couldn't catch her where is she where is she that shout she's here produced an indescribable effect on fyodor pavlovitch all his terror left him hold him hold him he cried and dashed after dmitri meanwhile grigory had got up from the floor but still seemed stunned ivan and alyosha ran after their father in the third room something was heard to fall on the floor with a ringing crash it was a large glass vase not an expensive one on a marble pedestal which dmitri had upset as he ran past it at him shouted the old man help ivan and alyosha caught the old man and were forcibly bringing him back why do you run after him he'll murder you outright ivan cried wrathfully at his father ivan alyosha she must be here grushenka's here he said he saw her himself running he was choking he was not expecting grushenka at the time and the sudden news that she was here made him beside himself he was trembling all over he seemed frantic but you've seen for yourself that she hasn't come cried ivan but she may have come by that other entrance you know that entrance is locked and you have the key dmitri suddenly reappeared in the drawing-room he had of course found the other entrance locked and the key actually was in fyodor pavlovitch's pocket the windows of all the rooms were also closed so grushenka could not have come in anywhere nor have run out anywhere hold him shrieked fyodor pavlovitch as soon as he saw him again he's been stealing money in my bedroom and tearing himself from ivan he rushed again at dmitri but dmitri threw up both hands and suddenly clutched the old man by the two tufts of hair that remained on his temples tugged at them and flung him with a crash on the floor he kicked him two or three times with his heel in the face the old man moaned shrilly ivan though not so strong as dmitri threw his arms round him and with all his might pulled him away alyosha helped him with his slender strength holding dmitri in front madman you've killed him cried ivan serve him right shouted dmitri breathlessly if i haven't killed him i'll come again and kill him you can't protect him dmitri go away at once cried alyosha commandingly alexey you tell me it's only you i can believe was she here just now or not i saw her myself creeping this way by the fence from the lane i shouted she ran away i swear she's not been here and no one expected her but i saw her so she must i'll find out at once where she is good-bye alexey not a word to aesop about the money now but go to katerina ivanovna at once and be sure to say he sends his compliments to you compliments his compliments just compliments and farewell describe the scene to her 
meanwhile ivan and grigory had raised the old man and seated him in an armchair his face was covered with blood but he was conscious and listened greedily to dmitri's cries he was still fancying that grushenka really was somewhere in the house dmitri looked at him with hatred as he went out i don't repent shedding your blood he cried beware old man beware of your dream for i have my dream too i curse you and disown you altogether he ran out of the room she's here she must be here smerdyakov smerdyakov the old man wheezed scarcely audibly beckoning to him with his finger no she's not here you old lunatic ivan shouted at him angrily here he's fainting water a towel make haste smerdyakov smerdyakov ran for water at last they got the old man undressed and put him to bed they wrapped a wet towel round his head exhausted by the brandy by his violent emotion and the blows he had received he shut his eyes and fell asleep as soon as his head touched the pillow ivan and alyosha went back to the drawing-room smerdyakov removed the fragments of the broken vase while grigory stood by the table looking gloomily at the floor shouldn't you put a wet bandage on your head and go to bed too alyosha said to him we'll look after him my brother gave you a terrible blow on the head he's insulted me grigory articulated gloomily and distinctly he's insulted his father not only you observed ivan with a forced smile i used to wash him in his tub he's insulted me repeated grigory damn it all if i hadn't pulled him away perhaps he'd have murdered him it wouldn't take much to do for aesop would it whispered ivan to alyosha god forbid cried alyosha why should he forbid ivan went on in the same whisper with a malignant grimace one reptile will devour the other and serve them both right too alyosha shuddered of course i won't let him be murdered as i didn't just now stay here alyosha i'll go for a turn in the yard my head's begun to ache alyosha went to his father's bedroom and sat by his bedside behind the screen for about an hour the old man suddenly opened his eyes and gazed for a long while at alyosha evidently remembering and meditating all at once his face betrayed extraordinary excitement alyosha he whispered apprehensively where's ivan in the yard he's got a headache he's on the watch give me that looking-glass it stands over there give it me alyosha gave him a little round folding looking-glass which stood on the chest of drawers the old man looked at himself in it his nose was considerably swollen and on the left side of his forehead there was a rather large crimson bruise what does ivan say alyosha my dear my only son i'm afraid of ivan i'm more afraid of ivan than the other you're the only one i'm not afraid of don't be afraid of ivan either he is angry but he'll defend you alyosha and what of the other he's run to grushenka my angel tell me the truth was she here just now or not no one has seen her it was a mistake she has not been here you know mitya wants to marry her to marry her she won't marry him she won't she won't she won't she won't on any account the old man fairly fluttered with joy as though nothing more comforting could have been said to him in his delight he seized alyosha's hand and pressed it warmly to his heart tears positively glittered in his eyes that image of the mother of god of which i was telling you just now he said take it home and keep it for yourself and i'll let you go back to the monastery i was joking this morning don't be angry with me my head aches alyosha alyosha comfort my heart be an angel and tell me the truth you're still asking whether she has been here or not alyosha said sorrowfully no 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 i believe you i'll tell you what it is 
you go to grushenka yourself or see her somehow make haste and ask her see for yourself which she means to choose him or me eh what can you if i see her i'll ask her alyosha muttered embarrassed no she won't tell you the old man interrupted she's a rogue she'll begin kissing you and say that it's you she wants she's a deceitful shameless hussy you mustn't go to her you mustn't no father and it wouldn't be suitable it wouldn't be right at all where was he sending you just now he shouted go as he ran away to katerina ivanovna for money to ask her for money no not for money he's no money not a farthing i'll settle down for the night and think things over and you can go perhaps you'll meet her only be sure to come to me to-morrow in the morning be sure to i have a word to say to you to-morrow will you come yes when you come pretend you've come of your own accord to ask after me don't tell anyone i told you to don't say a word to ivan very well good-bye my angel you stood up for me just now i shall never forget it i've a word to say to you to-morrow but i must think about it and how do you feel now i shall get up to-morrow and go out perfectly well perfectly well crossing the yard alyosha found ivan sitting on the bench at the gateway he was sitting writing something in pencil in his notebook alyosha told ivan that their father had waked up was conscious and had let him go back to sleep at the monastery alyosha i should be very glad to meet you to-morrow morning said ivan cordially standing up his cordiality was a complete surprise to alyosha i shall be at the holokoffs to-morrow answered alyosha i may be at katerina ivanovna's too if i don't find her now but you're going to her now anyway for that compliments and farewell said ivan smiling alyosha was disconcerted i think i quite understand his exclamations just now and part of what went before dmitri has asked you to go to her and say that he well in fact takes his leave of her brother how will all this horror end between father and dmitri exclaimed alyosha one can't tell for certain perhaps in nothing it may all fizzle out that woman is a beast in any case we must keep the old man indoors and not let dmitri in the house brother let me ask one thing more has any man a right to look at other men and decide which is worthy to live why bring in the question of worth the matter is most often decided in men's hearts on other grounds much more natural and as for rights who has not the right to wish not for another man's death what even if for another man's death why lie to oneself since all men live so and perhaps cannot help living so are you referring to what i said just now that one reptile will devour the other in that case let me ask you do you think me like dmitri capable of shedding aesop's blood murdering him eh what are you saying ivan such an idea never crossed my mind i don't think dmitri is capable of it either thanks if only for that smiled ivan be sure i should always defend him but in my wishes i reserve myself full latitude in this case good-bye till to-morrow don't condemn me and don't look on me as a villain he added with a smile they shook hands warmly as they had never done before alyosha felt that his brother had taken the first step towards him and that he had certainly done this with some definite motive end of section twenty two Section twenty three of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book three, chapter ten. 
both together alyosha left his father's house feeling even more exhausted and dejected in spirit than when he had entered it his mind too seemed shattered and unhinged while he felt that he was afraid to put together the disjointed fragments and form a general idea from all the agonizing and conflicting experiences of the day he felt something bordering upon despair which he had never known till then towering like a mountain above all the rest stood the fatal insoluble question how would things end between his father and his brother dmitri with this terrible woman now he had himself been a witness of it he had been present and seen them face to face yet only his brother dmitri could be made unhappy terribly completely unhappy there was trouble awaiting him it appeared too that there were other people concerned far more so than alyosha could have supposed before there was something positively mysterious in it too ivan had made a step towards him which was what alyosha had been long desiring yet now he felt for some reason that he was frightened at it and these women strange to say that morning he had set out for katerina ivanovna's in the greatest embarrassment now he felt nothing of the kind on the contrary he was hastening there as though expecting to find guidance from her yet to give her this message was obviously more difficult than before the matter of the three thousand was decided irrevocably and dmitri feeling himself dishonored and losing his last hope might sink to any depth he had moreover told him to describe to katerina ivanovna the scene which had just taken place with his father it was by now seven o'clock and it was getting dark as alyosha entered the very spacious and convenient house in the high street occupied by katerina ivanovna alyosha knew that she lived with two aunts one of them a woman of little education was that aunt of her half-sister agafia ivanovna who had looked after her in her father's house when she came from boarding-school the other aunt was a moscow lady of style and consequence though in straitened circumstances it was said that they both gave way in everything to katerina ivanovna and that she only kept them with her as chaperons katerina ivanovna herself gave way to no one but her benefactress the general's widow who had been kept by illness in moscow and to whom she was obliged to write twice a week a full account of all her doings when alyosha entered the hall and asked the maid who opened the door to him to take his name up it was evident that they were already aware of his arrival possibly he had been noticed from the window at least alyosha heard a noise caught the sound of flying footsteps and rustling skirts two or three women perhaps had run out of the room alyosha thought it strange that his arrival should cause such excitement he was conducted however to the drawing-room at once it was a large room elegantly and amply furnished not at all in provincial style there were many sofas lounges settees big and little tables there were pictures on the walls vases and lamps on the tables masses of flowers and even an aquarium in the window it was twilight and rather dark alyosha made out a silk mantle thrown down on the sofa where people had evidently just been sitting and on a table in front of the sofa were two unfinished cups of chocolate cakes a glass saucer with blue raisins and another with sweetmeats alyosha saw that he had interrupted visitors and frowned but at that instant the portiere was raised and with rapid hurrying footsteps katerina ivanovna came in holding out both hands to alyosha with the radiant smile of delight at the same instant a servant brought in two lighted candles and set them on the table thank god at last you have come too i've been simply praying for you all day sit down alyosha had been struck by katerina ivanovna's beauty when three weeks before dmitri had first brought him at katerina ivanovna's special request to be introduced to her there had been no conversation between them at that interview however supposing alyosha to be very shy katerina ivanovna had talked all the time to dmitri 
to spare him alyosha had been silent but he had seen a great deal very clearly he was struck by the imperiousness proud ease and self-confidence of the haughty girl and all that was certain alyosha felt that he was not exaggerating it he thought her great glowing black eyes were very fine especially with her pale even rather sallow longish face but in those eyes and in the lines of her exquisite lips there was something with which his brother might well be passionately in love but which perhaps could not be loved for long he expressed this thought almost plainly to dmitri when after the visit his brother besought and insisted that he should not conceal his impressions on seeing his betrothed you'll be happy with her but perhaps not tranquilly happy quite so brother such people remain always the same they don't yield to fate so you think i shan't love her for ever no perhaps you will love her for ever but perhaps you won't always be happy with her alyosha had given his opinion at the time blushing and angry with himself for having yielded to his brother's entreaties and put such foolish ideas into words for his opinion had struck him as awfully foolish immediately after he had uttered it he felt ashamed too of having given so confident an opinion about a woman it was with the more amazement that he felt now at the first glance at katerina ivanovna as she ran into him that he had perhaps been utterly mistaken this time her face was beaming with spontaneous good-natured kindliness and direct warm-hearted sincerity the pride and haughtiness which had struck alyosha so much before was only betrayed now in a frank generous energy and a sort of bright strong faith in herself alyosha realized at the first glance at the first word that all the tragedy of her position in relation to the man she loved so dearly was no secret to her that she perhaps already knew everything positively everything and yet in spite of that there was such brightness in her face such faith in the future alyosha felt at once that he had gravely wronged her in his thoughts he was conquered and captivated immediately besides all this he noticed at her first words that she was in great excitement an excitement perhaps quite exceptional and almost approaching ecstasy i was so eager to see you because i can learn from you the whole truth from you and no one else i have come muttered alyosha confusedly i he sent me ah he sent you i foresaw that now i know everything everything cried katerina ivanovna her eyes flashing wait a moment alexey fyodorovitch i'll tell you why i've been so longing to see you you see i know perhaps far more than you do yourself and there's no need for you to tell me anything i'll tell you what i want from you i want to know your own last impression of him i want you to tell me most directly plainly coarsely even oh as coarsely as you like what you thought of him just now and of his position after your meeting with him to-day that will perhaps be better than if i had a personal explanation with him as he does not want to come to me do you understand what i want from you now tell me simply tell me every word of the message he sent you with i knew he would send you he told me to give you his compliments and to say that he would never come again but to give you his compliments his compliments was that what he said his own expression yes accidentally perhaps he made a mistake in the word perhaps he did not use the right word no he told me precisely to repeat that word he begged me two or three times not to forget to say so katerina ivanovna flushed hotly help me now alexey fyodorovitch now i really need your help i'll tell you what i think and you must simply say whether it's right or not listen if he had sent me his compliments in passing without insisting on your repeating the words without emphasizing them that would be the end of everything 
but if he particularly insisted on those words if he particularly told you not to forget to repeat them to me then perhaps he was in excitement beside himself he had made his decision and was frightened at it he wasn't walking away from me with a resolute step but leaping headlong the emphasis on that phrase may have been simply bravado yes yes cried alyosha warmly i believe that is it and if so he's not altogether lost i can still save him stay did he not tell you anything about money about three thousand roubles he did speak about it and it's that more than anything that's crushing him he said he had lost his honour and that nothing matters now alyosha answered warmly feeling a rush of hope in his heart and believing that there really might be a way of escape and salvation for his brother but do you know about the money he added and suddenly broke off i've known of it a long time i telegraphed to moscow to inquire and heard long ago that the money had not arrived he hadn't sent the money but i said nothing last week i learnt that he was still in need of money my only object in all this was that he should know to whom to turn and who was his true friend no he won't recognize that i am his truest friend he won't know me and looks on me merely as a woman i've been tormented all the week trying to think how to prevent him from being ashamed to face me because he spent that three thousand let him feel ashamed of himself let him be ashamed of other people's knowing but not of my knowing he can tell god everything without shame why is it he still does not understand how much i am ready to bear for his sake why why doesn't he know me how dare he not know me after all that has happened i want to save him forever let him forget me as his betrothed and here he fears that he is dishonoured in my eyes why he wasn't afraid to be open with you alexey fyodorovitch how is it that i don't deserve the same the last words she uttered in tears tears gushed from her eyes i must tell you alyosha began his voice trembling too what happened just now between him and my father and he described the whole scene how dmitri had sent him to get the money how he had broken in knocked his father down and after that had again specially and emphatically begged him to take his compliments and farewell he went to that woman alyosha added softly and do you suppose that i can't put up with that woman does he think i can't but he won't marry her she suddenly laughed nervously could such a passion last for ever in a karamazov it's passion not love he won't marry her because she won't marry him again katerina ivanovna laughed strangely he may marry her said alyosha mournfully looking down he won't marry her i tell you that girl is an angel do you know that do you know that katerina ivanovna exclaimed suddenly with extraordinary warmth she is one of the most fantastic of fantastic creatures i know how bewitching she is but i know too that she is kind firm and noble why do you look at me like that alexey fyodorovitch perhaps you are wondering at my words perhaps you don't believe me agrafena alexandrovna my angel she cried suddenly to some one peeping into the next room come in to us this is a friend this is alyosha he knows all about our affairs show yourself to him i've only been waiting behind the curtain for you to call me said a soft one might even say sugary feminine voice the portiere was raised and grushenka herself smiling and beaming came up to the table a violent revulsion passed over alyosha he fixed his eyes on her and could not take them off here she was that awful woman the beast as ivan had called her half an hour before and yet one would have thought the creature standing before him most simple and ordinary a good-natured kind woman handsome certainly but so like other handsome ordinary women it is true she was very very good-looking with that russian beauty so passionately loved by many men 
she was a rather tall woman though a little shorter than katerina ivanovna who was exceptionally tall she had a full figure with soft as it were noiseless movements softened to a peculiar over sweetness like her voice she moved not like katerina ivanovna with a vigorous bold step but noiselessly her feet made absolutely no sound on the floor she sank softly into a low chair softly rustling her sumptuous black silk dress and delicately nestling her milk-white neck and broad shoulders in a costly cashmere shawl she was twenty-two years old and her face looked exactly that age she was very white in the face with a pale pink tint on her cheeks the modelling of her face might be said to be too broad and the lower jaw was set a trifle forward her upper lip was thin but the slightly prominent lower lip was at least twice as full and looked pouting but her magnificent abundant dark brown hair her sable-coloured eyebrows and charming grey-blue eyes with their long lashes would have made the most indifferent person meeting her casually in a crowd in the street stop at the sight of her face and remember it long after what struck alyosha most in that face was its expression of childlike good-nature there was a childlike look in her eyes a look of childish delight she came up to the table beaming with delight and seeming to expect something with childish impatient and confiding curiosity the light in her eyes gladdened the soul alyosha felt that there was something else in her which he could not understand or would not have been able to define and which yet perhaps unconsciously affected him it was that softness that voluptuousness of her bodily movements that cat-like noiselessness yet it was a vigorous ample body under the shawl could be seen full broad shoulders a high still quite girlish bosom her figure suggested the lines of the venus of milo though already in somewhat exaggerated proportions that could be divined connoisseurs of russian beauty could have foretold with certainty that this fresh still youthful beauty would lose its harmony by the age of thirty would spread that the face would become puffy and that wrinkles would very soon appear upon her forehead and round the eyes the complexion would grow coarse and red perhaps in fact that it was the beauty of the moment the fleeting beauty which is so often met with in russian women alyosha of course did not think of this but though he was fascinated yet he wondered with an unpleasant sensation and as it were regretfully why she drawled in that way and could not speak naturally she did so evidently feeling there was a charm in the exaggerated honeyed modulation of the syllables it was of course only a bad underbred habit that showed bad education and a false idea of good manners and yet this intonation and manner of speaking impressed alyosha as almost incredibly incongruous with the childishly simple and happy expression of her face the soft babyish joy in her eyes katerina ivanovna at once made her sit down in an armchair facing alyosha and ecstatically kissed her several times on her smiling lips she seemed quite in love with her this is the first time we've met alexey fyodorovitch she said rapturously i wanted to know her to see her i wanted to go to her but i'd no sooner expressed the wish than she came to me i knew we should settle everything together everything my heart told me so i was begged not to take the step but i foresaw it would be a way out of the difficulty and i was not mistaken grushenka has explained everything to me told me all she means to do she flew here like an angel of goodness and brought us peace and joy you did not disdain me sweet excellent young lady drawled grushenka in her sing-song voice still with the same charming smile of delight don't dare to speak to me like that you sorceress you witch disdain you 
here i must kiss your lower lip once more it looks as though it were swollen and now it will be more so and more and more look how she laughs alexey fyodorovitch it does one's heart good to see the angel alyosha flushed and faint imperceptible shivers kept running down him you make so much of me dear young lady and perhaps i am not at all worthy of your kindness not worthy she's not worthy of it katerina ivanovna cried again with the same warmth you know alexey fyodorovitch we're fanciful we're self-willed but proudest of the proud in our little heart we're noble we're generous alexey fyodorovitch let me tell you we have only been unfortunate we were too ready to make every sacrifice for an unworthy perhaps or fickle man there was one man one an officer too we loved him we sacrificed everything to him that was long ago five years ago and he has forgotten us he has married now he is a widower he has written he is coming here and do you know we've loved him none but him all this time and we've loved him all our life he will come and grushenka will be happy again for the last five years she's been wretched but who can reproach her who can boast of her favour only that bedridden old merchant but he is more like her father her friend her protector he found her then in despair in agony deserted by the man she loved she was ready to drown herself then but the old merchant saved her saved her you defend me very kindly dear young lady you're in a great hurry about everything grushenka drawled again defend you is it for me to defend you should i dare to defend you grushenka angel give me your hand look at that charming soft little hand alexey fyodorovitch look at it it has brought me happiness and has lifted me up and i'm going to kiss it outside and inside here 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 and three times she kissed the certainly charming though rather fat hand of grushenka in a sort of rapture she held out her hand with a charming musical nervous little laugh watched the sweet young lady and obviously liked having her hand kissed perhaps there's rather too much rapture thought alyosha he blushed he felt a peculiar uneasiness at heart the whole time you won't make me blush dear young lady kissing my hand like this before alexey fyodorovitch do you think i meant to make you blush said katerina ivanovna somewhat surprised ah my dear how little you understand me yes and you too perhaps quite misunderstand me dear young lady maybe i'm not so good as i seem to you i've a bad heart i will have my own way i fascinated poor dmitri fyodorovitch that day simply for fun but now you'll save him you've given me your word you'll explain it all to him you'll break to him that you have long loved another man who is now offering you his hand oh no i didn't give you my word to do that it was you kept talking about that i didn't give you my word then i didn't quite understand you said katerina ivanovna slowly turning a little pale you promised oh no angel lady i've promised nothing grushenka interrupted softly and evenly still with the same gay and simple expression you see at once dear young lady what a wilful wretch i am compared with you if i want to do a thing i do it i may have made you some promise just now but now again i'm thinking i may take to mitya again i liked him very much once liked him for almost a whole hour now maybe i shall go and tell him to stay with me from this day forward you see i'm so changeable just now you said something quite different katerina ivanovna whispered faintly ah just now 
but you know i'm such a soft-hearted silly creature only think what he's gone through on my account what if when i go home i feel sorry for him what then i never expected ah young lady how good and generous you are compared with me now perhaps you won't care for a silly creature like me now you know my character give me your sweet little hand angelic lady she said tenderly and with a sort of reverence took katerina ivanovna's hand here dear young lady i'll take your hand and kiss it as you did mine you kissed mine three times but i ought to kiss yours three hundred times to be even with you well but let that pass and then it shall be as god wills perhaps i shall be your slave entirely and want to do your bidding like a slave let it be as god wills without any agreements and promises what a sweet hand what a sweet hand you have you sweet young lady you incredible beauty she slowly raised the hands to her lips with the strange object indeed of being even with her in kisses katerina ivanovna did not take her hand away she listened with timid hope to the last words though grushenka's promise to do her bidding like a slave was very strangely expressed she looked intently into her eyes she still saw in those eyes the same simple-hearted confiding expression the same bright gaiety she's perhaps too naive thought katerina ivanovna with a gleam of hope grushenka meanwhile seemed enthusiastic over the sweet hand she raised it deliberately to her lips but she held it for two or three minutes near her lips as though reconsidering something do you know angel lady she suddenly drawled in an even more soft and sugary voice do you know after all i think i won't kiss your hand and she laughed a little merry laugh as you please what's the matter with you said katerina ivanovna starting suddenly so that you may be left to remember that you kissed my hand but i didn't kiss yours there was a sudden gleam in her eyes she looked with awful intentness at katerina ivanovna insolent creature cried katerina ivanovna as though suddenly grasping something she flushed all over and leapt up from her seat grushenka too got up but without haste so i shall tell mitya how you kissed my hand but i didn't kiss yours at all and how he will laugh vile slut go away ah for shame young lady ah for shame that's unbecoming for you dear young lady a word like that go away you're a creature for sale screamed katerina ivanovna every feature was working in her utterly distorted face for sale indeed you used to visit gentlemen in the dusk for money once you brought your beauty for sale you see i know katerina ivanovna shrieked and would have rushed at her but alyosha held her with all his strength not a step not a word don't speak don't answer her she'll go away she'll go at once at that instant katerina ivanovna's two aunts ran in at her cry and with them a maidservant all hurried to her i will go away said grushenka taking up her mantle from the sofa alyosha darling see me home go away go away make haste cried alyosha clasping his hands imploringly dear little alyosha see me home i've got a pretty little story to tell you on the way i got up this scene for your benefit alyosha see me home dear you'll be glad of it afterwards alyosha turned away wringing his hands grushenka ran out of the house laughing musically katerina ivanovna went into a fit of hysterics 
she sobbed and was shaken with convulsions every one fussed round her i warned you said the elder of her aunts i tried to prevent your doing this you're too impulsive how could you do such a thing you don't know these creatures and they say she's worse than any of them you are too self-willed she's a tigress yelled katerina ivanovna why did you hold me alexey fyodorovitch i'd have beaten her beaten her she could not control herself before alyosha perhaps she did not care to indeed she ought to be flogged in public on a scaffold alyosha withdrew towards the door but my god cried katerina ivanovna clasping her hands he 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 could be so dishonourable so inhuman why he told that creature what happened on that fatal accursed day you brought your beauty for sale dear young lady she knows it your brother's a scoundrel alexey fyodorovitch alyosha wanted to say something but he couldn't find a word his heart ached go away alexey fyodorovitch it's shameful it's awful for me to-morrow i beg you on my knees come to-morrow don't condemn me forgive me i don't know what i shall do with myself now alyosha walked out into the street reeling he could have wept as she did suddenly he was overtaken by the maid the young lady forgot to give you this letter from madame holikoff it's been left with us since dinner-time alyosha took the little pink envelope mechanically and put it almost unconsciously into his pocket End of section 23section twenty four of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book three chapter eleven another reputation ruined it was not much more than three-quarters of a mile from the town to the monastery alyosha walked quickly along the road at that hour deserted it was almost night and too dark to see anything clearly at thirty paces ahead there were cross-roads half-way a figure came into sight under a solitary willow at the cross-roads as soon as alyosha reached the cross-roads the figure moved out and rushed at him shouting savagely your money or your life so it's you mitya cried alyosha in surprise violently startled however <laughs> you didn't expect me i wondered where to wait for you by her house there are three ways from it and i might have missed you at last i thought of waiting here for you had to pass here there's no other way to the monastery come tell me the truth crush me like a beetle but what's the matter nothing brother it's the fright you gave me oh dmitri father's blood just now alyosha began to cry he had been on the verge of tears for a long time and now something seemed to snap in his soul you almost killed him cursed him and now here you're making jokes your money or your life well what of that it's not seemly is that it not suitable in my position no i only stay look at the night you see what a dark night what clouds what a wind has risen i hid here under the willow waiting for you and as god's above i suddenly thought why go on in misery any longer what is there to wait for here i have a willow a handkerchief a shirt i can twist them into a rope in a minute and braces besides and why go on burdening the earth dishonouring it with my vile presence and then i heard you coming heavens it was as though something flew down to me suddenly so there is a man then whom i love here he is that man my dear little brother whom i love more than anyone in the world the only one i love in the world and i loved you so much so much at that moment that i thought i'll fall on his neck at once then a stupid idea struck me to have a joke with you and scare you i shouted like a fool your money forgive my foolery 
it was only nonsense and there's nothing unseemly in my soul damn it all tell me what's happened what did she say strike me crush me don't spare me was she furious no not that there was nothing like that mitya there i found them both there both whom grushenka at katerina ivanovna's dmitri was struck dumb impossible he cried you're raving grushenka with her alyosha described all that had happened from the moment he went into katerina ivanovna's he was ten minutes telling his story he can't be said to have told it fluently and consecutively but he seemed to make it clear not omitting any word or action of significance and vividly describing often in one word his own sensations dmitri listened in silence gazing at him with a terrible fixed stare but it was clear to alyosha that he understood it all and had grasped every point but as the story went on his face became not merely gloomy but menacing he scowled he clenched his teeth and his fixed stare became still more rigid more concentrated more terrible when suddenly with incredible rapidity his wrathful savage face changed his tightly compressed lips parted and dmitri fyodorovitch broke into uncontrolled spontaneous laughter he literally shook with laughter for a long time he could not speak so she wouldn't kiss her hand so she didn't kiss it so she ran away he kept exclaiming with hysterical delight insolent delight it might have been called if it had not been so spontaneous so the other one called her tigress and a tigress she is so she ought to be flogged on a scaffold yes yes so she ought that's just what i think she ought to have been long ago it's like this brother let her be punished but i must get better first i understand the queen of impudence that's her all over you saw her all over in that hand kissing the she-devil she's magnificent in her own line so she ran home i'll go ah, i'll run to her alyosha don't blame me i agree that hanging is too good for her but katerina ivanovna exclaimed alyosha sorrowfully i see her too i see right through her as i've never done before it's a regular discovery of the four continents of the world that is of the five what a thing to do that's just like katya who was not afraid to face a coarse unmannerly officer and risk a deadly insult on a generous impulse to save her father but the pride the recklessness the defiance of fate the unbounded defiance you say that aunt tried to stop her that aunt you know is overbearing herself she's the sister of the general's widow in moscow and even more stuck up than she but her husband was caught stealing government money he lost everything his estate and all and the proud wife had to lower her colors and hasn't raised them since so she tried to prevent katya but she wouldn't listen to her she thinks she can overcome everything that everything will give way to her she thought she could bewitch grushenka if she liked and she believed it herself she plays a part to herself and whose fault is it do you think she kissed grushenka's hand first on purpose with a motive no she really was fascinated by grushenka that's to say not by grushenka but by her own dream her own delusion because it was her dream her delusion alyosha darling how did you escape from them those women did you pick up your cassock and run <laughs> brother you don't seem to have noticed how you've insulted katerina ivanovna by telling grushenka about that day and she flung it in her face just now that she had gone to gentlemen in secret to sell her beauty brother what could be worse than that insult what worried alyosha more than anything was that incredible as it seemed his brother appeared pleased at katerina ivanovna's humiliation bah dmitri frowned fiercely and struck his forehead with his hand he only now realized it 
though alyosha had just told him of the insult and katerina ivanovna's cry your brother is a scoundrel yes perhaps i really did tell grushenka about that fatal day as katya calls it yes i did tell her i remember it was that time at Macro. i was drunk the gypsies were singing but i was sobbing i was sobbing then kneeling and praying to katya's image and grushenka understood it she understood it all then i remember she cried herself damn it all but it's bound to be so now then she cried but now the dagger in the heart that's how women are he looked down and sank into thought yes i am a scoundrel a thorough scoundrel he said suddenly in a gloomy voice it doesn't matter whether i cried or not i'm a scoundrel tell her i accept the name if that's any comfort come that's enough good-bye it's no use talking it's not amusing you go your way and i mine and i don't want to see you again except as a last resource good-bye alexey he warmly pressed alyosha's hand and still looking down without raising his head as though tearing himself away turned rapidly towards the town alyosha looked after him unable to believe he would go away so abruptly stay alexey one more confession to you alone cried dmitri suddenly turning back look at me look at me well you see here here there's terrible disgrace in store for me as he said here dmitri struck his chest with his fist with a strange air as though the dishonor lay precisely on his chest in some spot in a pocket perhaps or hanging round his neck you know me now a scoundrel an avowed scoundrel but let me tell you that i've never done anything before and never shall again anything that can compare in baseness with the dishonor which i bear now at this very minute on my breast here here which will come to pass though i'm perfectly free to stop it i can stop it or carry it through note that well let me tell you i shall carry it through i shan't stop it i told you everything just now but i didn't tell you this because even i had not brass enough for it i can still pull up if i do i can give back the full half of my lost honor to-morrow but i shan't pull up i shall carry out my base plan and you can bear witness that i told you so beforehand darkness and destruction no need to explain you'll find out in due time the filthy back alley and the she-devil good-bye don't pray for me i'm not worth it and there's no need no need at all i don't need it away and he suddenly retreated this time finally alyosha went towards the monastery what i shall never see him again what is he saying he wondered wildly why i shall certainly see him to-morrow i shall look him up i shall make a point of it what does he mean he went round the monastery and crossed the pine wood to the hermitage the door was open to him though no one was admitted at that hour there was a tremor in his heart as he went into father zosima's cell why why had he gone forth why had he sent him into the world here was peace here was holiness but there was confusion there was darkness in which one lost one's way and went astray at once in the cell he found the novice porfiry and father paisi who came every hour to inquire after father zosima alyosha learnt with alarm that he was getting worse and worse even his usual discourse with the brothers could not take place that day as a rule every evening after service the monks flocked into father zosima's cell and all confessed aloud their sins of the day their sinful thoughts and temptations even their disputes if there had been any some confessed kneeling the elder absolved reconciled exhorted imposed penance blessed and dismissed them 
it was against this general confession that the opponents of elders protested maintaining that it was a profanation of the sacrament of confession almost a sacrilege though this was quite a different thing they even represented to the diocesan authorities that such confessions attained no good object but actually to a large extent led to sin and temptation many of the brothers disliked going to the elder and went against their own will because every one went and for fear they should be accused of pride and rebellious ideas people said that some of the monks agreed beforehand saying i'll confess i lost my temper with you this morning and you confirm it simply in order to have something to say alyosha knew that this actually happened sometimes he knew too that there were among the monks some who deeply resented the fact that letters from relations were habitually taken to the elder to be opened and read by him before those to whom they were addressed it was assumed of course that all this was done freely and in good faith by way of voluntary submission and salutary guidance but in fact there was sometimes no little insincerity and much that was false and strained in this practice yet the older and more experienced of the monks adhered to their opinion arguing that for those who have come within these walls sincerely seeking salvation such obedience and sacrifice will certainly be salutary and of great benefit those on the other hand who find it irksome and repine are no true monks and have made a mistake in entering the monastery their proper place is in the world even in the temple one cannot be safe from sin and the devil so it was no good taking it too much into account he is weaker a drowsiness has come over him father paisi whispered to alyosha as he blessed him it's difficult to rouse him and he must not be roused he waked up for five minutes sent his blessing to the brothers and begged their prayers for him at night he intends to take the sacrament again in the morning he remembered you alexey he asked whether you had gone away and was told that you were in the town i blessed him for that work he said his place is there not here for a while those were his words about you he remembered you lovingly with anxiety do you understand how he honored you but how is it that he has decided that you shall spend some time in the world he must have foreseen something in your destiny understand alexey that if you return to the world it must be to do the duty laid upon you by your elder and not for frivolous vanity and worldly pleasures father paisi went out alyosha had no doubt that father zasima was dying though he might live another day or two alyosha firmly and ardently resolved that in spite of his promises to his father the holocausts and katerina ivanovna he would not leave the monastery next day but would remain with his elder to the end his heart glowed with love and he reproached himself bitterly for having been able for one instant to forget him whom he had left in the monastery on his deathbed and whom he honored above every one in the world he went into father zasima's bedroom knelt down and bowed to the ground before the elder who slept quietly without stirring with regular hardly audible breathing and a peaceful face alyosha returned to the other room where father zasima had received his guests in the morning taking off his boots he lay down on the hard narrow leathern sofa which he had long used as a bed bringing nothing but a pillow the mattress about which his father had shouted to him that morning he had long forgotten to lie on he took off his cassock which he used as a covering but before going to bed he fell on his knees and prayed a long time in his fervent prayer he did not beseech god to lighten his darkness but only thirsted for the joyous emotion which always visited his soul after the praise and adoration of which his evening prayer usually consisted that joy always brought him light untroubled sleep as he was praying he suddenly felt in his pocket 
the little pink note the servant had handed him as he left katerina ivanovna's he was disturbed but finished his prayer then after some hesitation he opened the envelope in it was a letter to him signed by lise the young daughter of madame holikoff who had laughed at him before the elder in the morning alexey fyodorovitch she wrote i am writing to you without any one's knowledge even mamma's and i know how wrong it is but i cannot live without telling you the feeling that has sprung up in my heart and this no one but us two must know for a time but how am i to say what i want so much to tell you paper they say does not blush but i assure you it's not true and that it's blushing just as i am now all over dear alyosha i love you i've loved you from my childhood since our moscow days when you were very different from what you are now and i shall love you all my life my heart has chosen you to unite our lives and pass them together till our old age of course on condition that you will leave the monastery as for our age we will wait for the time fixed by the law by that time i shall certainly be quite strong i shall be walking and dancing there can be no doubt of that you see how i've thought of everything there's only one thing i can't imagine what you'll think of me when you read this i'm always laughing and being naughty i made you angry this morning but i assure you before i took up my pen i prayed before the image of the mother of god and now i'm praying and almost crying my secret is in your hands when you come to-morrow i don't know how i shall look at you ah alexey fyodorovitch what if i can't restrain myself like a silly and laugh when i look at you as i did to-day you'll think i'm a nasty girl making fun of you and you won't believe my letter and so i beg you dear one if you've any pity for me when you come to-morrow don't look me straight in the face for if i meet your eyes it will be sure to make me laugh especially as you'll be in that long gown i feel cold all over when i think of it so when you come don't look at me at all for a time look at mamma or at the window here i've written you a love letter oh dear what have i done alyosha don't despise me and if i've done something very horrid and wounded you forgive me now the secret of my reputation ruined perhaps forever is in your hands i shall certainly cry to-day good-bye till our meeting our awful meeting please p s alyosha you must 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 come please alyosha read the note in amazement read it through twice thought a little and suddenly laughed a soft sweet laugh he started that laugh seemed to him sinful but a minute later he laughed again just as softly and happily he slowly replaced the note in the envelope crossed himself and lay down the agitation in his heart passed at once god have mercy upon all of them have all these unhappy and turbulent souls in thy keeping and set them in the right path all ways are thine save them according to thy wisdom thou art love thou wilt send joy to all alyosha murmured crossing himself and falling into peaceful sleep end of section 24section 25 of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book four lacerations chapter one father ferapont alyosha was roused early before daybreak father zosima woke up feeling very weak though he wanted to get out of bed and sit up in a chair his mind was quite clear his face looked very tired yet bright and almost joyful it wore an expression of gaiety kindness and cordiality maybe i shall not live through the coming day he said to alyosha 
then he desired to confess and take the sacrament at once he always confessed to father paisi after taking the communion the service of extreme unction followed the monks assembled and the cell was gradually filled up by the inmates of the hermitage meantime it was daylight people began coming from the monastery after the service was over the elder desired to kiss and take leave of every one as the cell was so small the earlier visitors withdrew to make room for others alyosha stood beside the elder who was seated again in his armchair he talked as much as he could though his voice was weak it was fairly steady i've been teaching you so many years and therefore i've been talking aloud so many years that i've got into the habit of talking and so much so that it's almost more difficult for me to hold my tongue than to talk even now in spite of my weakness dear fathers and brothers he jested looking with emotion at the group round him Alyosha remembered afterwards something of what he said to them but though he spoke out distinctly and his voice was fairly steady his speech was somewhat disconnected he spoke of many things he seemed anxious before the moment of death to say everything he had not said in his life and not simply for the sake of instructing them but as though thirsting to share with all men and all creation his joy and ecstasy and once more in his life to open his whole heart love one another fathers said father zosima as far as alyosha could remember afterwards love god's people because we have come here and shut ourselves within these walls we are no holier than those who are outside but on the contrary from the very fact of coming here each of us has confessed to himself that he is worse than others than all men on earth and the longer the monk lives in his seclusion the more keenly he must recognize that else he would have had no reason to come here when he realizes that he is not only worse than others but that he is responsible to all men for all and everything for all human sins national and individual only then the aim of our seclusion is attained for know dear ones that every one of us is undoubtedly responsible for all men and everything on earth not merely through the general sinfulness of creation but each one personally for all mankind and every individual man this knowledge is the crown of life for the monk and for every man for monks are not a special sort of men but only what all men ought to be only through that knowledge our heart grows soft with infinite universal inexhaustible love then every one of you will have the power to win over the whole world by love and to wash away the sins of the world with your tears each of you keep watch over your heart and confess your sins to yourself unceasingly be not afraid of your sins even when perceiving them if only there be penitence but make no conditions with god again i say be not proud be proud neither to the little nor to the great hate not those who reject you who insult you who abuse and slander you hate not the atheists the teachers of evil the materialists and i mean not only the good ones for there are many good ones among them especially in our day hate not even the wicked ones remember them in your prayers thus save o lord all those who have none to pray for them save too all those who will not pray and add it is not in pride that i make this prayer o lord for i am lower than all men love god's people let not strangers draw away the flock for if you slumber in your slothfulness and disdainful pride or worse still in covetousness they will come from all sides and draw away your flock expound the gospel to the people unceasingly be not extortionate do not love gold and silver do not hoard them have faith cling to the banner and raise it on high but the elder spoke more disconnectedly than alyosha reported his words afterwards sometimes he broke off altogether as though to take breath and recover his strength but he was in a sort of ecstasy 
they heard him with emotion though many wondered at his words and found them obscure afterwards all remembered those words when alyosha happened for a moment to leave the cell he was struck by the general excitement and suspense in the monks who were crowding about it this anticipation showed itself in some by anxiety in others by devout solemnity all were expecting that some marvel would happen immediately after the elder's death their suspense was from one point of view almost frivolous but even the most austere of the monks were affected by it father Parisi's face looked the gravest of all alyosha was mysteriously summoned by a monk to see rakitin who had arrived from town with a singular letter for him from madame holikoff in it she informed alyosha of a strange and very opportune incident it appeared that among the women who had come on the previous day to receive father zasima's blessing there had been an old woman from the town a sergeant's widow called prohorovna she had inquired whether she might pray for the rest of the soul of her son vasenka who had gone to irkutsk and had sent her no news for over a year to which father zasima had answered sternly forbidding her to do so and saying that to pray for the living as though they were dead was a kind of sorcery he afterwards forgave her on account of her ignorance and added as though reading the book of the future this was madame holikoff's expression words of comfort that her son vasya was certainly alive and he would either come himself very shortly or send a letter and that she was to go home and expect him and would you believe it exclaimed madame holikoff enthusiastically the prophecy has been fulfilled literally indeed and more than that scarcely had the old woman reached home when they gave her a letter from siberia which had been awaiting her but that was not all in the letter written on the road from ekaterinenburg vasya informed his mother that he was returning to russia with an official and that three weeks after her receiving the letter he hoped to embrace his mother madame holikoff warmly entreated alyosha to report this new miracle of prediction to the superior and all the brotherhood all all ought to know of it she concluded the letter had been written in haste the excitement of the writer was apparent in every line of it but alyosha had no need to tell the monks for all knew of it already rakitin had commissioned the monk who brought his message to inform most respectfully his reverence father Paisi, that he rakitin has a matter to speak of with him of such gravity that he dare not defer it for a moment and humbly begs forgiveness for his presumption as the monk had given the message to father Paisi before that to alyosha the latter found after reading the letter there was nothing left for him to do but to hand it to father Paisi in confirmation of the story and even that austere and cautious man though he frowned as he read the news of the miracle could not completely restrain some inner emotion his eyes gleamed and a grave and solemn smile came into his lips we shall see greater things broke from him we shall see greater things greater things yet the monks around repeated but father Paisi, frowning again begged all of them at least for a time not to speak of the matter till it be more fully confirmed seeing there is so much credulity among those of this world and indeed this might well have chanced naturally he added prudently as it were to satisfy his conscience though scarcely believing his own disavowal a fact his listeners very clearly perceived within the hour the miracle was of course known to the whole monastery and many visitors who had come for the mass no one seemed more impressed by it than the monk who had come the day before from st sylvester from the little monastery of obdorsk in the far north it was he who had been standing near madame holikoff the previous day and had asked father zasima earnestly referring to the healing of the lady's daughter how can you presume to do such things he was now somewhat puzzled and did not know whom to believe 
the evening before he had visited father Ferraplot in his cell apart behind the apiary and had been greatly impressed and overawed by the visit this father Ferraplot was that aged monk so devout in fasting and observing silence who has been mentioned already as antagonistic to father zassima and the whole institution of elders which he regarded as a pernicious and frivolous innovation he was a very formidable opponent although from his practice of silence he scarcely spoke a word to any one what made him formidable was that a number of monks fully shared his feeling and many of the visitors looked upon him as a great saint and ascetic although they had no doubt that he was crazy but it was just his craziness attracted them father Ferraplot never went to see the elder though he lived in the hermitage they did not worry him to keep its regulations and this too because he behaved as though he were crazy he was seventy-five or more and he lived in a corner beyond the apiary in an old decaying wooden cell which had been built long ago for another great ascetic father Yona, who had lived to be a hundred and five and of whose saintly doings many curious stories were still extant in the monastery and the neighbourhood father Ferraplot had succeeded in getting himself installed in this same solitary cell seven years previously it was simply a peasant's hut though it looked like a chapel for it contained an extraordinary number of icons with lamps perpetually burning before them which men brought to the monastery as offerings to god father Ferraplot had been appointed to look after them and keep the lamps burning it was said and indeed it was true that he ate only two pounds of bread in three days the beekeeper who lived close by the apiary used to bring him the bread every three days and even to this man who waited upon him father Ferraplot rarely uttered a word the four pounds of bread together with the sacrament bread regularly sent him on sundays after the late mass by the father superior made up his weekly rations the water in his jug was changed every day he rarely appeared at mass visitors who came to do him homage saw him sometimes kneeling all day long at prayer without looking round if he addressed them he was brief abrupt strange and almost always rude on very rare occasions however he would talk to visitors but for the most part he would utter some one strange saying which was a complete riddle and no entreaties would induce him to pronounce a word in explanation he was not a priest but a simple monk there was a strange belief chiefly however among the most ignorant that father Ferraplot had communication with heavenly spirits and would only converse with them and so was silent with men the monk from obdorsk having been directed to the apiary by the beekeeper who was also a very silent and surly monk went to the corner where father Ferraplot's cell stood maybe he will speak as you are a stranger and maybe you'll get nothing out of him the beekeeper had warned him the monk as he related afterwards approached in the utmost apprehension it was rather late in the evening father Ferraplot was sitting at the door of his cell on a low bench a huge old elm was lightly rustling overhead there was an evening freshness in the air the monk from obdorsk bowed down before the saint and asked his blessing do you want me to bow down to you monk said father Ferraplot. get up the monk got up blessing be blessed sit beside me where have you come from what most struck the poor monk was the fact that in spite of his strict fasting and great age father Ferraplot still looked a vigorous old man he was tall held himself erect and had a thin but fresh and healthy face there was no doubt he still had considerable strength he was of athletic build in spite of his great age he was not even quite gray and still had very thick hair and a full beard both of which had once been black his eyes were gray large and luminous but strikingly prominent he spoke with a broad accent 
he was dressed in a peasant's long reddish coat of coarse convict cloth as it used to be called and had a stout rope round his waist his throat and chest were bare beneath his coat his shirt of the coarsest linen showed almost black with dirt not having been changed for months they said that he wore irons weighing thirty pounds under his coat his stockingless feet were thrust in old slippers almost dropping to pieces from the little obdorsk monastery from st sylvester the monk answered humbly whilst his keen and inquisitive but rather frightened little eyes kept watch on the hermit i have been at your sylvester's i used to stay there is sylvester well the monk hesitated you are a senseless lot how do you keep the fasts our dietary is according to the ancient conventual rules during lent there are no meals provided for monday wednesday and friday for tuesday and thursday we have white bread stewed fruit with honey wild berries or salt cabbage and wholemeal stirabout on saturday white cabbage soup noodles with peas kasha all with hemp oil on weekdays we have dried fish and kasha with the cabbage soup from monday till saturday evening six whole days in holy week nothing is cooked and we have only bread and water and that sparingly if possible not taking food every day just the same as is ordered for first week in lent on good friday nothing is eaten in the same way on the saturday we have to fast till three o'clock and then take a little bread and water and drink a single cup of wine on holy thursday we drink wine and have something cooked without oil or not cooked at all inasmuch as the laodicean council lays down for holy thursday it is unseemly by remitting the fast on the holy thursday to dishonor the whole of lent that is how we keep the fast but what is that compared with you holy father added the monk growing more confident for all the year round even at easter you take nothing but bread and water and what we should eat in two days lasts you full seven it's truly marvellous your great abstinence and mushrooms asked father Ferapont suddenly mushrooms repeated the surprised monk yes i can give up their bread not needing it at all and go away into the forest and live there on the mushrooms or the berries but they can't give up their bread here wherefore they are in bondage to the devil nowadays the unclean deny that there is need of such fasting haughty and unclean is their judgment ach true sighed the monk and have you seen devils among them asked Ferapont among them among whom asked the monk timidly i went to the father superior on trinity sunday last year i haven't been since i saw a devil sitting on one man's chest hiding under his cassock only his horns poked out another had one peeping out of his pocket with such sharp eyes he was afraid of me another settled in the unclean belly of one another was hanging round a man's neck and so he was carrying him about without seeing him you can see spirits the monk inquired i tell you i can see i can see through them when i was coming out from the superiors i saw one hiding from me behind the door and a big one a yard and a half or more high with a thick long gray tail and the tip of his tail was in the crack of the door and i was quick and slammed the door pinching his tail in it he squealed and began to struggle and i made the sign of the cross over him three times and he died on the spot like a crushed spider he must have rotted there in the corner and be stinking but they don't see they don't smell it it's a year since i have been there i reveal it to you as you are a stranger your words are terrible but holy and blessed father said the monk growing bolder and bolder is it true as they noise abroad even to distant lands about you that you are in continual communication with the holy ghost he does fly down at times how does he fly down in what form as a bird the holy ghost in the form of a dove 
there's the holy ghost and there's the holy spirit the holy spirit can appear as other birds sometimes as a swallow sometimes a goldfinch and sometimes as a blue tit how do you know him from an ordinary tit he speaks how does he speak in what language human language and what does he tell you why to-day he told me that a fool would visit me and would ask me unseemly questions you want to know too much monk terrible are your words most holy and blessed father the monk shook his head but there was a doubtful look in his frightened little eyes do you see this tree asked father Fairpont after a pause i do blessed father you think it's an elm but for me it has another shape what sort of shape inquired the monk after a pause of vain expectation it happens at night you see those two branches in the night it is christ holding out his arms to me and seeking me with those arms i see it clearly and tremble it's terrible terrible what is there terrible if it's christ himself why he'll snatch me up and carry me away alive in the spirit and glory of elijah haven't you heard he will take me in his arms and bear me away though the monk returned to the cell he was sharing with one of the brothers in considerable perplexity of mind he still cherished at heart a greater reverence for father Ferapont than for father zassima he was strongly in favor of fasting and it was not strange that one who kept so rigid a fast as father Ferapont should see marvels his words seemed certainly queer but god only could tell what was hidden in those words and were not worse words and acts commonly seen in those who have sacrificed their intellects for the glory of god the pinching of the devil's tail he was ready and eager to believe and not only in the figurative sense besides he had before visiting the monastery a strong prejudice against the institution of elders which he only knew of by hearsay and believed to be a pernicious innovation before he had been long at the monastery he had detected the secret murmurings of some shallow brothers who disliked the institution he was besides a meddlesome inquisitive man who poked his nose into everything this was why the news of the fresh miracle performed by father zassima reduced him to extreme perplexity alyosha remembered afterwards how their inquisitive guest from obdorsk had been continually flitting to and fro from one group to another listening and asking questions among the monks that were crowding within and without the elder's cell but he did not pay much attention to him at the time and only recollected it afterwards he had no thought to spare for it indeed for when father zossima feeling tired again had gone back to bed he thought of alyosha as he was closing his eyes and sent for him alyosha ran at once there was no one else in the cell but father paisi father yosef and the novice porfiry the elder opening his weary eyes and looking intently at alyosha asked him suddenly are your people expecting you my son alyosha hesitated haven't they need of you didn't you promise some one yesterday to see them to-day i did promise to my father my brothers others too you see you must go don't grieve be sure i shall not die without your being by to hear my last word to you i will say that word my son it will be my last gift to you to you dear son because you love me but now go to keep your promise alyosha immediately obeyed though it was hard to go but the promise that he should hear his last word on earth that it should be the last gift to him alyosha sent a thrill of rapture through his soul he made haste that he might finish what he had to do in the town and return quickly father paisi too uttered some words of exhortation which moved and surprised him greatly 
he spoke as they left the cell together remember young man unceasingly father paisi began without preface that the science of this world which has become a great power has especially in the last century analyzed everything divine handed down to us in the holy books after this cruel analysis the learned of this world have nothing left of all that was sacred of old but they have only analyzed the parts and overlooked the whole and indeed their blindness is marvellous yet the whole still stands steadfast before their eyes and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it has it not lasted nineteen centuries is it not still a living a moving power in the individual soul and in the masses of people it is still as strong and living even in the souls of atheists who have destroyed everything for even those who have renounced christianity and attack it in their inmost being still follow the christian ideal for hitherto neither their subtlety nor the ardor of their hearts has been able to create a higher ideal of man and of virtue than the ideal given by christ of old when it has been attempted the result has been only grotesque remember this especially young man since you are being sent into the world by your departing elder maybe remembering this great day you will not forget my words uttered from the heart for your guidance seeing you are young and the temptations of the world are great and beyond your strength to endure well now go my orphan with these words father paisi blessed him as alyosha left the monastery and thought them over he suddenly realized that he had met a new and unexpected friend a warmly loving teacher in this austere monk who had hitherto treated him sternly it was as though father zassima had bequeathed him to him at his death and perhaps that's just what had passed between them alyosha thought suddenly the philosophic reflections he had just heard so unexpectedly testified to the warmth of father paisi's heart he was in haste to arm the boy's mind for conflict with temptation and to guard the young soul left in his charge with the strongest defence he could imagine end of section twenty five Section twenty six of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book four, chapter two. At his father's. First of all, Alyosha went to his father. On the way, he remembered that his father had insisted the day before that he should come without his brother Ivan seeing him why so alyosha wondered suddenly even if my father has something to say to me alone why should i go in unseen most likely in his excitement yesterday he meant to say something different he decided yet he was very glad when marfa ignatyevna who opened the garden gate to him grigory it appeared was ill in bed in the lodge told him in answer to his question that ivan fyodorovitch had gone out two hours ago and my father he is up taking his coffee marfa answered somewhat dryly alyosha went in the old man was sitting alone at the table wearing slippers and a little old overcoat he was amusing himself by looking through some accounts rather inattentively however he was quite alone in the house for smerdyakov too had gone out marketing though he had got up early and was trying to put a bold face on it he looked tired and weak his forehead upon which huge purple bruises had come out during the night was bandaged with a red handkerchief his nose too had swollen terribly in the night and some smaller bruises covered it in patches giving his whole face a peculiarly spiteful and irritable look the old man was aware of this and turned a hostile glance on alyosha as he came in the coffee is cold he cried harshly i won't offer you any i've ordered nothing but a lenten fish soup to-day and i don't invite anyone to share it 
why have you come to find out how you are said alyosha yes besides i told you to come yesterday it's all of no consequence you need not have troubled but i knew you'd come poking in directly he said this with almost hostile feeling at the same time he got up and looked anxiously in the looking-glass perhaps for the fortieth time that morning at his nose he began to binding his red handkerchief more becomingly on his forehead red's better it's just like the hospital in a white one he observed sententiously well how are things over there how is your elder he is very bad he may die to-day answered alyosha but his father had not listened and had forgotten his own question at once ivan's gone out he said suddenly he is doing his utmost to carry off mitch's betrothed that's what he is staying here for he added maliciously and twisting his mouth looked at alyosha surely he did not tell you so asked alyosha yes he did long ago would you believe it he told me three weeks ago you don't suppose he too came to murder me do you he must have had some object in coming what do you mean why do you say such things said alyosha troubled he doesn't ask for money it's true but yet he won't get a farthing from me i intend living as long as possible you may as well know my dear alexey fyodorovitch and so i need every farthing and the longer i live the more i shall need it he continued pacing from one corner of the room to the other keeping his hands in the pockets of his loose greasy overcoat made of yellow cotton material i can still pass for a man at five-and-fifty but i want to pass for one for another twenty years as i get older you know i shan't be a pretty object the wenches won't come to me of their own accord so i shall want my money so i am saving up more and more simply for myself my dear son alexey fyodorovitch you may as well know for i mean to go on in my sins to the end let me tell you for sin is sweet all abuse it but all men live in it only others do it on the sly and i openly and so all the other sinners fall upon me for being so simple and your paradise alexey fyodorovitch is not to my taste let me tell you that and it's not the proper place for a gentleman your paradise even if it exists i believe that i fall asleep and don't wake up again and that's all you can pray for my soul if you like and if you don't want to don't damn you that's my philosophy ivan talked well here yesterday though we were all drunk ivan is a conceited coxcomb but he has no particular learning nor education either he sits silent and smiles at one without speaking that's what pulls him through alyosha listened to him in silence why won't he talk to me if he does speak he gives himself airs your ivan is a scoundrel and i'll marry grushenka in a minute if i want to for if you've money alexey fyodorovitch you have only to want a thing and you can have it that's what ivan is afraid of he's on the watch to prevent me getting married and that's why he is egging on mitya to marry grushenka himself he hopes to keep me from grushenka by that as though i should leave him my money if i don't marry her besides if mitya marries grushenka ivan will carry off his rich betrothed that's what he's reckoning on he is a scoundrel your ivan how cross you are it's because of yesterday you had better lie down said alyosha there you say that the old man observed suddenly as though it had struck him for the first time and i am not angry with you but if ivan said it i should be angry with him it is only with you i have good moments else you know i am an ill-natured man you are not ill-natured but distorted said alyosha with a smile listen i meant this morning to get that ruffian mitya locked up and i don't know now what i shall decide about it 
of course in these fashionable days fathers and mothers are looked upon as a prejudice but even now the law does not allow you to drag your old father about by the hair to kick him in the face in his own house and brag of murdering him outright all in the presence of witnesses if i liked i could crush him and could have him locked up at once for what he did yesterday then you don't mean to take proceedings ivan has dissuaded me i shouldn't care about ivan but there's another thing and bending down to alyosha he went on in a confidential half-whisper if i send the ruffian to prison she'll hear of it and run to see him at once but if she hears that he has beaten me a weak old man within an inch of my life she may give him up and come to me for that's her way everything by contraries i know her through and through won't you have a drop of brandy take some cold coffee and i'll pour a quarter of a glass of brandy into it it's delicious my boy no thank you i'll take that roll with me if i may said alyosha and taking a halfpenny french roll he put it in the pocket of his cassock and you'd better not have brandy either he suggested apprehensively looking into the old man's face you are quite right it irritates my nerves instead of soothing them only one little glass i'll get it out of the cupboard he unlocked the cupboard poured out a glass drank it then locked the cupboard and put the key back in his pocket that's enough one glass won't kill me you see you are in a better humor now said alyosha smiling hmm. i love you even without the brandy but with scoundrels i am a scoundrel ivan is not going to chemashnya why is that he wants to spy how much i give grushenka if she comes they are all scoundrels but i don't recognize ivan i don't know him at all where does he come from he is not one of us in soul as though i'd leave him anything i shan't leave a will at all you may as well know and i'll crush mitya like a beetle i squash black beetles at night with my slipper they squelch when you tread on them and your mitya will squelch too your mitya for you love him yes you love him and i am not afraid of your loving him but if ivan loved him i should be afraid for myself at his loving him but ivan loves nobody ivan is not one of us people like ivan are not our sort my boy they are like a cloud of dust when the wind blows the dust will be gone i had a silly idea in my head when i told you to come to-day i wanted to find out from you about mitya if i were to hand him over a thousand or maybe two now would the beggarly wretch agree to take himself off altogether for five years or better still thirty-five and without krushenka and give her up once for all eh i'll i'll ask him muttered alyosha if you would give him three thousand perhaps he that's nonsense you needn't ask him now no need i've changed my mind it was a nonsensical idea of mine i won't give him anything not a penny i want my money myself cried the old man waving his hand i'll crush him like a beetle without it don't say anything to him or else he will begin hoping there's nothing for you to do here you needn't stay is that betrothed of his katerina ivanovna whom he has kept so carefully hidden from me all this time going to marry him or not you went to see her yesterday i believe nothing will induce her to abandon him there you see how dearly these fine young ladies love a rake and a scoundrel they are poor creatures i tell you those pale young ladies very different from ah, if i had his youth and the looks i had then for i was better looking than he at eight-and-twenty i'd have been a conquering hero just as he is he is a low cad but he shan't have grushenka anyway he shan't i'll crush him his anger had returned with the last words you can go there's nothing for you to do here to-day he snapped harshly 
alyosha went up to say good-bye to him and kissed him on the shoulder what's that for the old man was a little surprised we shall see each other again or do you think we shan't not at all i didn't mean anything nor did i i did not mean anything said the old man looking at him listen listen he shouted after him make haste and come again and i'll have a fish soup for you a fine one not like to-day be sure to come come to-morrow do you hear to-morrow and as soon as alyosha had gone out of the door he went to the cupboard again and poured out another half-glass i won't have more he muttered clearing his throat and again he locked the cupboard and put the key in his pocket then he went into his bedroom lay down on the bed exhausted and in one minute he was asleep end of section twenty six Section twenty seven of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book four, chapter three. A meeting with the schoolboys. Thank goodness he did not ask me about Grushenka, thought Alyosha, as he left his father's house and turned towards Madame Holokov's or i might have to tell him of my meeting with grushenka yesterday alyosha felt painfully that since yesterday both combatants had renewed their energies and that their hearts had grown hard again father is spiteful and angry he's made some plan and will stick to it and what of dmitri he too will be harder than yesterday he too must be spiteful and angry and he too no doubt has made some plan oh i must succeed in finding him to-day whatever happens but alyosha had not long to meditate an incident occurred on the road which though apparently of little consequence made a great impression on him just after he had crossed the square and turned the corner coming out into mihilovsky street which is divided by a small ditch from the high street our whole town is intersected by ditches he saw a group of schoolboys between the ages of nine and twelve at the bridge they were going home from school some with their bags on their shoulders others with leather satchels slung across them some in short jackets others in little overcoats some even had those high boots with creases round the ankles such as little boys spoilt by rich fathers love to wear the whole group was talking eagerly about something apparently holding a council alyosha had never from his moscow days been able to pass children without taking notice of them and although he was particularly fond of children of three or thereabout he liked schoolboys of ten and eleven too and so anxious as he was to-day he wanted at once to turn aside to talk to them he looked into their excited rosy faces and noticed at once that all the boys had stones in their hands behind the ditch some thirty paces away there was another schoolboy standing by a fence he too had a satchel at his side he was about ten years old pale delicate-looking and with sparkling black eyes he kept an attentive and anxious watch on the other six obviously his schoolfellows with whom he had just come out of school but with whom he had evidently had a feud alyosha went up and addressing a fair curly-headed rosy boy in a black jacket observed when i used to wear a satchel like yours i always used to carry it on my left side so as to have my right hand free but you've got yours on your right side so it will be awkward for you to get at it alyosha had no art or premeditation in beginning with this practical remark but it is the only way for a grown-up person to get at once into confidential relations with a child or still more with a group of children one must begin in a serious business-like way so as to be on a perfectly equal footing alyosha understood it by instinct but he is left-handed another a fine healthy-looking boy of eleven answered promptly all the others stared at alyosha he even throws stones with his left hand observed a third 
at that instant a stone flew into the group but only just grazed the left-handed boy though it was well and vigorously thrown by the boy standing the other side of the ditch give it him hit him back smurov they all shouted but smurov the left-handed boy needed no telling and at once revenged himself he threw a stone but it missed the boy and hit the ground the boy the other side of the ditch the pocket of whose coat was visibly bulging with stones flung another stone at the group this time it flew straight at alyosha and hit him painfully on the shoulder he aimed it at you he meant it for you you are karamazov karamazov the boys shouted laughing come all throw at him at once and six stones flew at the boy one struck the boy on the head and he fell down but at once leapt up and began ferociously returning their fire both sides threw stones incessantly many of the group had their pockets full too what are you about aren't you ashamed six against one why you'll kill him cried alyosha he ran forward and met the flying stones to screen the solitary boy three or four ceased throwing for a minute he began first cried a boy in a red shirt in an angry childish voice he is a beast he stabbed krasotkin in class the other day with a penknife it bled krasotkin wouldn't tell tales but he must be thrashed but what for i suppose you tease him there he sent a stone in your back again he knows you cried the children it's you he's throwing at now not us come all of you at him again don't miss smurov and again a fire of stones and a very vicious one began the boy the other side of the ditch was hit in the chest he screamed began to cry and ran away uphill towards mihailovsky street they all shouted aha he's funking he is running away wisp of toe you don't know what a beast he is karamazov killing is too good for him said the boy in the jacket with flashing eyes he seemed to be the eldest what's wrong with him asked alyosha is he a tell-tale or what the boys looked at one another as though derisively are you going that way to mihailovsky the same boy went on catch him up you see he's stopped again he's waiting and looking at you he is looking at you the other boys chimed in you ask him does he like a disheveled wisp of tow do you hear ask him that there was a general burst of laughter alyosha looked at them and they at him don't go near him he'll hurt you cried smurov in a warning voice i shan't ask him about the wisp of tow for i expect you tease him with that question somehow but i'll find out from him why you hate him so find out then find out cried the boys laughing alyosha crossed the bridge and walked uphill by the fence straight towards the boy you'd better look out the boys called after him he won't be afraid of you he will stab you in a minute on the sly as he did krasotkin the boy waited for him without budging coming up to him alyosha saw facing him a child of about nine years old he was an undersized weakly boy with a thin pale face with large dark eyes that gazed at him vindictively he was dressed in a rather shabby old overcoat which he had monstrously outgrown his bare arms stuck out beyond his sleeves there was a large patch on the right knee of his trousers and in his right boot just at the toe there was a big hole in the leather carefully blackened with ink both the pockets of his greatcoat were weighed down with stones alyosha stopped two steps in front of him looking inquiringly at him the boy seeing at once from alyosha's eyes that he wouldn't beat him became less defiant and addressed him first i am alone and there are six of them i'll beat them all alone he said suddenly with flashing eyes i think one of the stones must have hurt you badly observed alyosha but i hit smurov on the head cried the boy they told me that you know me 
and that you threw a stone at me on purpose said alyosha the boy looked darkly at him i don't know you do you know me alyosha continued let me alone the boy cried irritably but he did not move as though he were expecting something and again there was a vindictive light in his eyes very well i am going said alyosha only i don't know you and i don't tease you they told me how they tease you but i don't want to tease you good-bye monk in silk trousers cried the boy following alyosha with the same vindictive and defiant expression and he threw himself into an attitude of defence feeling sure that now alyosha would fall upon him but alyosha turned looked at him and walked away he had not gone three steps before the biggest stone the boy had in his pocket hit him a painful blow in the back so you'll hit a man from behind they tell the truth then when they say that you attack on the sly said alyosha turning round again this time the boy threw a stone savagely right into alyosha's face but alyosha just had time to guard himself and the stone struck him on the elbow aren't you ashamed what have i done to you he cried the boy waited in silent defiance certain that now alyosha would attack him seeing that even now he would not his rage was like a little wild beast's he flew at alyosha himself and before alyosha had time to move the spiteful child had seized his left hand with both of his and bit his middle finger he fixed his teeth in it and it was ten seconds before he let go alyosha cried out with pain and pulled his finger away with all his might the child let go at last and retreated to his former distance alyosha's finger had been badly bitten to the bone close to the nail it began to bleed alyosha took out his handkerchief and bound it tightly round his injured hand he was a full minute bandaging it the boy stood waiting all the time at last alyosha raised his gentle eyes and looked at him very well he said you see how badly you've bitten me that's enough isn't it now tell me what have i done to you the boy stared in amazement though i don't know you and it's the first time i've seen you alyosha went on with the same serenity yet i must have done something to you you wouldn't have hurt me like this for nothing so what have i done how have i wronged you tell me instead of answering the boy broke into a loud tearful wail and ran away alyosha walked slowly after him towards mihailovsky street and for a long time he saw the child running in the distance as fast as ever not turning his head and no doubt still keeping up his tearful wail he made up his mind to find him out as soon as he had time and to solve this mystery just now he had not the time end of section twenty seven Section twenty eight of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book four, chapter four. At the Holokovs. Alyosha soon reached Madame Holokov's house, a handsome stone house of two stories, one of the finest in our town though madame holikoff spent most of her time in another province where she had an estate or in moscow where she had a house of her own yet she had a house in our town too inherited from her forefathers the estate in our district was the largest of her three estates yet she had been very little in our province before this time she ran out to alyosha in the hall did you get my letter about the new miracle she spoke rapidly and nervously yes did you show it to every one he restored the son to his mother he is dying to-day said alyosha i have heard i know oh how i long to talk to you to you or some one about all this 
no to you to you and how sorry i am i can't see him the whole town is in excitement they are all suspense but now do you know katerina ivanovna is here now ah that's lucky cried alyosha then i shall see her here she told me yesterday to be sure to come and see her to-day i know i know all i've heard exactly what happened yesterday and the atrocious behaviour of that creature c'est tragique and if i'd been in her place i don't know what i should have done and your brother dmitri fyodorovitch what do you think of him my goodness alexey fyodorovitch i am forgetting only fancy your brother is in there with her not that dreadful brother who was so shocking yesterday but the other ivan fyodorovitch he is sitting with her talking they are having a serious conversation if you could only imagine what's passing between them now it's awful i tell you it's lacerating it's like some incredible tale of horror they are ruining their lives for no reason any one can see they both recognize it and revel in it i've been watching for you i've been thirsting for you it's too much for me that's the worst of it i'll tell you all about it presently but now i must speak of something else the most important thing i had quite forgotten what's most important tell me why has lise been in hysterics as soon as she heard you were here she began to be hysterical mamma it's you who are hysterical now not i lise's voice caroled through a tiny crack of the door at the side her voice sounded as though she wanted to laugh but was doing her utmost to control it alyosha at once noticed the crack and no doubt lise was peeping through it but that he could not see and no wonder lise no wonder your caprices will make me hysterical too but she is so ill alexey fyodorovitch she has been so ill all night feverish and moaning i could hardly wait for the morning and for herzenstube to come he says that he can make nothing of it that we must wait herzenstube always comes and says that he can make nothing of it as soon as you approached the house she screamed fell into hysterics and insisted on being wheeled back into this room here mamma i didn't know he had come it wasn't on his account i wanted to be wheeled into this room that's not true lise yulia ran to tell you that alexey fyodorovitch was coming she was on the lookout for you my darling mamma it's not at all clever of you but if you want to make up for it and say something very clever dear mamma you'd better tell our honoured visitor alexey fyodorovitch that he has shown his want of wit by venturing to us after what happened yesterday and although every one is laughing at him please you go too far i declare i shall have to be severe who laughs at him i am so glad he has come i need him i can't do without him oh alexey fyodorovitch i am exceedingly unhappy but what's the matter with you mamma darling ah your caprices lise your fidgetiness your illness that awful night of fever that awful everlasting herzenstube everlasting everlasting that's the worst of it everything in fact everything even that miracle too oh how it has upset me how it has shattered me that miracle dear alexey fyodorovitch and that tragedy in the drawing-room it's more than i can bear i warn you i can't bear it a comedy perhaps not a tragedy tell me will father zossima live till to-morrow will he oh my god what is happening to me every minute i close my eyes and see that it's all nonsense all nonsense i should be very grateful alyosha interrupted suddenly if you could give me a clean rag to bind up my finger with i have hurt it and it's very painful alyosha unbound his bitten finger the handkerchief was soaked with blood madame holikoff screamed and shut her eyes good heavens what a wound how awful but as soon as lise saw alyosha's finger through the crack she flung the door wide open come come here she cried imperiously no nonsense now good heavens why did you stand there saying nothing about it all this time he might have bled to death mamma how did you do it 
water water you must wash it first of all simply hold it in cold water to stop the pain and keep it there keep it there make haste mamma some water in a slop basin but do make haste she finished nervously she was quite frightened at the sight of alyosha's wound shouldn't we send for herzenstube cried madame holikoff mamma you'll be the death of me your herzenstube will come and say that he can make nothing of it water water mamma for goodness sake go yourself and hurry yulia she is such a slow coach and never can come quickly make haste mamma or i shall die why it's nothing much cried alyosha frightened at this alarm yulia ran in with water and alyosha put his finger in it some lint mamma for mercy's sake bring some lint and that muddy caustic lotion for wounds what's it called we've got some you know where the bottle is mamma it's in your bedroom in the right-hand cupboard there's a big bottle of it there with the lint i'll bring everything in a minute lise only don't scream and don't fuss you see how bravely alexey fyodorovitch bears it where did you get such a dreadful wound alexey fyodorovitch madame holikoff hastened away this was all lise was waiting for first of all answer the question where did you get hurt like this she asked alyosha quickly and then i'll talk to you about something quite different well instinctively feeling that the time of her mother's absence was precious for her alyosha hastened to tell her of his enigmatic meeting with the schoolboys in the fewest words possible lise clasped her hands at his story how can you and in that dress too associate with schoolboys she cried angrily as though she had a right to control him you are nothing but a boy yourself if you can do that a perfect boy but you must find out for me about that horrid boy and tell me all about it for there's some mystery in it now for the second thing but first a question does the pain prevent you talking about utterly unimportant things but talking sensibly of course not and i don't feel much pain now that's because your finger is in the water it must be changed directly for it will get warm in a minute yulia bring some ice from the cellar and another basin of water now she is gone i can speak will you give me the letter i sent you yesterday dear alexey fyodorovitch be quick for mamma will be back in a minute and i don't want i haven't got the letter that's not true you have i knew you would say that you've got it in that pocket i've been regretting that joke all night give me back the letter at once give it me i've left it at home but you can't consider me as a child a little girl after that silly joke i beg your pardon for that silliness but you must bring me the letter if you really haven't got it bring it to-day you must you must to-day i can't possibly for i am going back to the monastery and i shan't come and see you for the next two days three or four perhaps for father zasima four days what nonsense listen did you laugh at me very much i didn't laugh at all why not because i believed all you said you are insulting me not at all as soon as i read it i thought that all that would come to pass for as soon as father zasima dies i am to leave the monastery then i shall go back and finish my studies and when you reach the legal age we will be married i shall love you though i haven't had time to think about it i believe i couldn't find a better wife than you and father zasima tells me i must marry but i am a cripple wheeled about in a chair laughed lise flushing crimson i'll wheel you about myself but i'm sure you'll get well by then but you are mad said lise nervously to make all this nonsense out of a joke here's mamma very apropos perhaps mamma how slow you always are how can you be so long and here's yulia with the ice oh lise don't scream above all things don't scream that scream drives me how can i help it when you put the lint in another place i've been hunting and hunting i do believe you did it on purpose but i couldn't tell that he would come with a bad finger or else perhaps i might have done it on purpose my darling mamma you begin to say really witty things never mind my being witty but i must say you show nice feeling for alexey fyodorovitch's sufferings 
oh my dear alexey fyodorovitch what's killing me is no one thing in particular not herzenstube but everything together that's what is too much for me that's enough mamma enough about herzenstube lise laughed gaily make haste with the lint and the lotion mamma that's simply goulard's water alexey fyodorovitch i remember the name now but it's a splendid lotion would you believe it mamma on the way here he had a fight with the boys on the street and it was a boy bit his finger isn't he a child a child himself is he fit to be married after that for only fancy he wants to be married mamma just think of him married wouldn't it be funny wouldn't it be awful and lise kept laughing her thin hysterical giggle looking slyly at alyosha but why married lise what makes you talk of such a thing it's quite out of place and perhaps the boy was rabid why mamma as though there were rabid boys why not lise as though i had said something stupid your boy might have been bitten by a mad dog and he would become mad and bite anyone near him how well she has bandaged it alexey fyodorovitch i couldn't have done it do you still feel the pain it's nothing much now you don't feel afraid of water asked lise come that's enough lise perhaps i really was rather too quick talking of the boy being rabid but you pounced upon it at once katerina ivanovna has only just heard that you are here alexey fyodorovitch she simply rushed at me she's dying to see you dying ach mamma go to them yourself he can't go just now he is in too much pain not at all i can go quite well said alyosha what you are going away is that what you say well when i've seen them i'll come back here and we can talk as much as you like but i should like to see katerina ivanovna at once for i am very anxious to be back at the monastery as soon as i can mamma take him away quickly alexey fyodorovitch don't trouble to come and see me afterwards but go straight back to your monastery and a good riddance i want to sleep i didn't sleep all night ah lise you are only making fun but how i wish you would sleep cried madame holikoff i don't know what i've done i'll stay another three minutes five if you like muttered alyosha even five do take him away quickly mamma he is a monster lise you are crazy let us go alexey fyodorovitch she is too capricious to-day i am afraid to cross her oh the trouble one has with nervous girls perhaps she really will be able to sleep after seeing you how quickly you have made her sleepy and how fortunate it is ah oh, mamma how sweetly you talk i must kiss you for it mamma and i kiss you too lise listen alexey fyodorovitch madame holikoff began mysteriously and importantly speaking in a rapid whisper i don't want to suggest anything i don't want to lift the veil you will see for yourself what's going on it's appalling it's the most fantastic farce she loves your brother ivan and she is doing her utmost to persuade herself she loves your brother dmitri it's appalling i'll go in with you and if they don't turn me out i'll stay to the end end of section twenty eight Section twenty nine of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book four, chapter five. A laceration in the drawing room. But in the drawing room the conversation was already over. Katerina Ivanovna was greatly excited, though she looked resolute. At the moment Alyosha and Madame Holikoff entered, Ivan Fyodorovitch stood up to take leave. His face was rather pale, and Alyosha looked at him anxiously. For this moment was to solve a doubt, a harassing enigma which had for some time haunted Alyosha. During the preceding month it had been several times suggested to him that his brother Ivan was in love with Katerina Ivanovna, and, what was more, that he meant to carry her off from Dmitri 
until quite lately the idea seemed to alyosha monstrous though it worried him extremely he loved both his brothers and dreaded such rivalry between them meantime dmitri had said outright on the previous day that he was glad that ivan was his rival and that it was a great assistance to him dmitri in what way did it assist him to marry grushenka but that alyosha considered the worst thing possible besides all this alyosha had till the evening before implicitly believed that katerina ivanovna had a steadfast and passionate love for dmitri but he had only believed it till the evening before he had fancied too that she was incapable of loving a man like ivan and that she did love dmitri and loved him just as he was in spite of all the strangeness of such a passion but during yesterday's scene with grushenka another idea had struck him the word lacerating which madame holikoff had just uttered almost made him start because half waking up towards daybreak that night he had cried out laceration laceration probably applying it to his dream he had been dreaming all night of the previous day's scene at katerina ivanovna's now alyosha was impressed by madame holikoff's blunt and persistent assertion that katerina ivanovna was in love with ivan and only deceived herself through some sort of pose from self-laceration and tortured herself by her pretended love for dmitri from some fancied duty of gratitude yes he thought perhaps the whole truth lies in those words but in that case what was ivan's position alyosha felt instinctively that a character like katerina ivanovna's must dominate and she could only dominate some one like dmitri and never a man like ivan for dmitri might at last submit to her domination to his own happiness which was what alyosha would have desired but ivan no ivan could not submit to her and such submission would not give him happiness alyosha could not help believing that of ivan and now all these doubts and reflections flitted through his mind as he entered the drawing-room another idea too forced itself upon him what if she loved neither of them neither ivan nor dmitri it must be noted that alyosha felt as it were ashamed of his own thoughts and blamed himself when they kept recurring to him during the last month what do i know about love and women and how can i decide such questions he thought reproachfully after such doubts and surmises and yet it was impossible not to think about it he felt instinctively that this rivalry was of immense importance in his brother's lives and that a great deal depended upon it one reptile will devour the other ivan had pronounced the day before speaking in anger of his father and dmitri so ivan looked upon dmitri as a reptile and perhaps had long done so was it perhaps since he had known katerina ivanovna that phrase had of course escaped ivan unawares yesterday but that only made it more important if he felt like that what chance was there of peace were there not on the contrary new grounds for hatred and hostility in their family and with which of them was alyosha to sympathize and what was he to wish for each of them he loved them both but what could he desire for each in the midst of these conflicting interests he might go quite astray in this maze and alyosha's heart could not endure uncertainty because his love was always of an active character he was incapable of passive love if he loved any one he set to work at once to help him and to do so he must know what he was aiming at he must know for certain what was best for each and having ascertained this it was natural for him to help them both but instead of a definite aim he found nothing but uncertainty and perplexity on all sides it was lacerating as was said just now but what could he understand even in this laceration he did not understand the first word in this perplexing maze seeing alyosha katerina ivanovna said quickly and joyfully to ivan who had already got up to go a minute stay another minute i want to hear the opinion of this person here whom i trust absolutely don't go away she added addressing madame holikoff 
she made alyosha sit down beside her and madame holikoff sat opposite by ivan you are all my friends here all i have in the world my dear friends she began warmly in a voice which quivered with genuine tears of suffering and alyosha's heart warmed to her at once you alexey fyodorovitch were witness yesterday of that abominable scene and saw what i did you did not see it ivan fyodorovitch he did what he thought of me yesterday i don't know i only know one thing that if it were repeated to-day this minute i should express the same feelings again as yesterday the same feelings the same words the same actions you remember my actions alexey fyodorovitch you checked me in one of them as she said that she flushed and her eyes shone i must tell you that i can't get over it listen alexey fyodorovitch i don't even know whether i still love him i feel pity for him and that is a poor sign of love if i loved him if i still loved him perhaps i shouldn't be sorry for him now but should hate him her voice quivered and tears glittered on her eyelashes alyosha shuddered inwardly that girl is truthful and sincere he thought and she does not love dmitri any more that's true that's true cried madame holikoff wait dear i haven't told you the chief the final decision i came to during the night i feel that perhaps my decision is a terrible one for me but i foresee that nothing will induce me to change it nothing it will be so all my life my dear kind ever faithful and generous adviser the one friend i have in the world ivan fyodorovitch with his deep insight into the heart approves and commends my decision he knows it yes i approve of it ivan assented in a subdued but firm voice but i should like alyosha too ah oh, alexey fyodorovitch forgive my calling you simply alyosha i should like alexey fyodorovitch too to tell me before my two friends whether i am right i feel instinctively that you alyosha my dear brother for you are a dear brother to me she said again ecstatically taking his cold hand in her hot one i foresee that your decision your approval will bring me peace in spite of all my sufferings for after your words i shall be calm and submit i feel that i don't know what you are asking me said alyosha flushing i only know that i love you and at this moment wish for your happiness more than my own but i know nothing about such affairs something impelled him to add hurriedly in such affairs alexey fyodorovitch in such affairs the chief thing is honour and duty and something higher i don't know what but higher perhaps even than duty i am conscious of this irresistible feeling in my heart and it compels me irresistibly but it may all be put in two words i've already decided even if he marries that creature she began solemnly whom i never never can forgive even then i will not abandon him henceforward i will never never abandon him she cried breaking into a sort of pale hysterical ecstasy not that i would run after him continually get in his way and worry him oh no i will go away to another town where you like but i will watch over him all my life i will watch over him all my life unceasingly when he becomes unhappy with that woman and that is bound to happen quite soon let him come to me and he will find a friend a sister only a sister of course and so for ever but he will learn at least that that sister is really his sister who loves him and has sacrificed all her life to him i will gain my point i will insist on his knowing me and confiding entirely in me without reserve she cried in a sort of frenzy i will be a god to whom he can pray and that at least he owes me for his treachery and for what i have suffered yesterday through him and let him see that all my life i will be true to him and the promise i gave him in spite of his being untrue and betraying me i will i will become nothing but a means for his happiness or how shall i say an instrument a machine for his happiness and that 
for my whole life my whole life and that he may see that all his life that's my decision ivan fyodorovitch fully approves me she was breathless she had perhaps intended to express her idea with more dignity art and naturalness but her speech was too hurried and crude it was full of youthful impulsiveness it betrayed that she was still smarting from yesterday's insult and that her pride craved satisfaction she felt this herself her face suddenly darkened an unpleasant look came into her eyes alyosha at once saw it and felt a pang of sympathy his brother ivan made it worse by adding i've only expressed my own view he said from anyone else this would have been affected and overstrained but from you no any other woman would have been wrong but you are right i don't know how to explain it but i see that you are absolutely genuine and therefore you are right but that's only for the moment and what does this moment stand for nothing but yesterday's insult madame holikoff obviously had not intended to interfere but she could not refrain from this very just comment quite so quite so cried ivan with peculiar eagerness obviously annoyed at being interrupted in any one else this moment would be only due to yesterday's impression and would be only a moment but with katerina ivanovna's character that moment will last all her life what for any one else would be only a promise is for her an everlasting burdensome grim perhaps but unflagging duty and she will be sustained by the feeling of this duty being fulfilled your life katerina ivanovna will henceforth be spent in painful brooding over your own feelings your own heroism and your own suffering but in the end that suffering will be softened and will pass into sweet contemplation of the fulfilment of a bold and proud design yes proud it certainly is and desperate in any case but a triumph for you and the consciousness of it will at last be a source of complete satisfaction and will make you resigned to everything else this was unmistakably said with some malice and obviously with intention even perhaps with no desire to conceal that he spoke ironically and with intention oh dear how mistaken it all is madame holikoff cried again alexey fyodorovitch you speak i want dreadfully to know what you will say cried katerina ivanovna and burst into tears alyosha got up from the sofa it's nothing nothing she went on through her tears i'm upset i didn't sleep last night but by the side of two such friends as you and your brother i still feel strong for i know you two will never desert me unluckily i am obliged to return to moscow perhaps to-morrow and to leave you for a long time and unluckily it's unavoidable ivan said suddenly to-morrow to moscow her face was suddenly contorted but but dear me how fortunate she cried in a voice suddenly changed in one instant there was no trace left of her tears she underwent an instantaneous transformation which amazed alyosha instead of a poor insulted girl weeping in a sort of laceration he saw a woman completely self-possessed and even exceedingly pleased as though something agreeable had just happened oh not fortunate that i am losing you of course not she corrected herself suddenly with a charming society smile such a friend as you are could not suppose that i am only too unhappy at losing you she rushed impulsively at ivan and seizing both his hands pressed them warmly but what is fortunate is that you will be able in moscow to see auntie and agafia and to tell them all the horror of my present position you can speak with complete openness to agafia but spare dear auntie you will know how to do that you can't think how wretched i was yesterday and this morning wondering how i could write them that dreadful letter for one can never tell such things in a letter now it will be easy for me to write for you will see them and explain everything oh how glad i am but i am only glad of that believe me of course no one can take your place i will run at once to write the letter she finished suddenly and took a step as though to go out of the room 
and what about alyosha and his opinion which you were so desperately anxious to hear cried madame holikoff there was a sarcastic angry note in her voice i had not forgotten that cried katerina ivanovna coming to a sudden standstill and why are you so antagonistic at such a moment she added with warm and bitter reproachfulness what i said i repeat i must have his opinion more than that i must have his decision as he says so it shall be you see how anxious i am for your words alexey fyodorovitch but what's the matter i couldn't have believed it i can't understand it alyosha cried suddenly in distress what what he is going to moscow and you cry out that you are glad you said that on purpose and you begin explaining that you are not glad of that but sorry to be losing a friend but that was acting too you were playing a part as in a theatre in a theatre what what do you mean exclaimed katerina ivanovna profoundly astonished flushing crimson and frowning though you assure him you are sorry to lose a friend in him you persist in telling him to his face that it's fortunate he is going said alyosha breathlessly he was standing at the table and did not sit down what are you talking about i don't understand i don't understand myself i seemed to see in a flash i know i'm not saying it properly but i'll say it all the same alyosha went on in the same shaking and broken voice what i see is that perhaps you don't love dmitri at all and never have from the beginning and dmitri too has never loved you and only esteems you i really don't know how i dare to say all this but somebody must tell the truth for nobody here will tell the truth what truth cried katerina ivanovna and there was an hysterical ring in her voice i'll tell you alyosha went on with desperate haste as though he were jumping from the top of a house call dmitri i will fetch him and let him come here and take your hand and take ivan's and join your hands for you're torturing ivan simply because you love him and torturing him because you love dmitri through self-laceration with an unreal love because you've persuaded yourself alyosha broke off and was silent you 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 are a little religious idiot that's what you are katerina ivanovna snapped her face was white and her lips were moving with anger ivan suddenly laughed and got up his hat was in his hand you are mistaken my good alyosha he said with an expression alyosha had never seen in his face before an expression of youthful sincerity and strong irresistibly frank feeling katerina ivanovna has never cared for me she has known all the time that i cared for her though i never said a word of my love to her she knew but she didn't care for me i have never been her friend either not for one moment she is too proud to need my friendship she kept me at her side as a means of revenge she revenged with me and on me all the insults which she has been continually receiving from dmitri ever since their first meeting for even that first meeting has rankled in her heart as an insult that's what her heart is like she has talked to me of nothing but her love for him i am going now but believe me katerina ivanovna you really love him and the more he insults you the more you love him that's your laceration you love him just as he is you love him for insulting you if he reformed you'd give him up at once and cease to love him but you need him so as to contemplate continually your heroic fidelity and to reproach him for infidelity and it all comes from your pride oh there's a great deal of humiliation and self-abasement about it but it all comes from pride i am too young and i've loved you too much i know that i ought not to say this that it would be more dignified on my part simply to leave you and it would be less offensive for you but i am going far away and shall never come back it is forever i don't want to sit beside a laceration but i don't know how to speak now i've said everything good-bye katerina ivanovna 
you can't be angry with me for i am a hundred times more severely punished than you if only by the fact that i shall never see you again good-bye i don't want your hand you have tortured me too deliberately for me to be able to forgive you at this moment i shall forgive you later but now i don't want your hand den dank dame beger ich nicht he added with a forced smile showing however that he could read schiller and read him till he knew him by heart which alyosha would never have believed he went out of the room without saying good-bye even to his hostess madame holikoff alyosha clasped his hands ivan he cried desperately after him come back ivan no nothing will induce him to come back now he cried again regretfully realizing it but it's my fault my fault i began it ivan spoke angrily wrongly unjustly and angrily he must come back here come back alyosha kept exclaiming frantically katerina ivanovna went suddenly into the next room you have done no harm you behaved beautifully like an angel madame holikoff whispered rapidly and ecstatically to alyosha i will do my utmost to prevent ivan fyodorovitch from going her face beamed with delight to the great distress of alyosha but katerina ivanovna suddenly returned she had two hundred rouble notes in her hand i have a great favour to ask of you alexey fyodorovitch she began addressing alyosha with an apparently calm and even voice as though nothing had happened a week yes i think it was a week ago dmitri fyodorovitch was guilty of a hasty and unjust action a very ugly action there is a low tavern here and in it he met that discharged officer that captain whom your father used to employ in some business dmitri fyodorovitch somehow lost his temper with this captain seized him by the beard and dragged him out into the street and for some distance along it in that insulting fashion and i am told that his son a boy quite a child who is at the school here saw it and ran beside them crying and begging for his father appealing to every one to defend him while every one laughed you must forgive me alexey fyodorovitch i cannot think without indignation of that disgraceful action of his one of those actions of which only dmitri fyodorovitch would be capable in his anger and in his passions i can't describe it even i can't find my words i've made inquiries about his victim and find he is quite a poor man his name is snegiryov he did something wrong in the army and was discharged i can't tell you what and now he has sunk into terrible destitution with his family an unhappy family of sick children and i believe an insane wife he has been living here a long time he used to work as a copying clerk but now he is getting nothing i thought if you that is i thought i don't know i am so confused you see i wanted to ask you my dear alexey fyodorovitch to go to him to find some excuse to go to them i mean to that captain oh goodness how badly i explain it and delicately carefully as only you know how to alyosha blushed manage to give him this assistance these two hundred roubles he will be sure to take it i mean persuade him to take it or rather what do i mean you see it's not by way of compensation to prevent him from taking proceedings for i believe he meant to but simply a token of sympathy of a desire to assist him from me dmitri fyodorovitch is betrothed not from himself but you know i would go myself but you'll know how to do it ever so much better he lives in lake street in the house of a woman called kalmikov for god's sake alexey fyodorovitch do it for me and now now i am rather tired good-bye she turned and disappeared behind the portiere so quickly that alyosha had not time to utter a word though he wanted to speak he longed to beg her pardon to blame himself to say something for his heart was full and he could not bear to go out of the room without it but madame holikoff took him by the hand and drew him along with her in the hall she stopped him again as before she is proud she is struggling with herself but kind charming generous she exclaimed in a half whisper 
oh how i love her especially sometimes and how glad i am again of everything dear alexey fyodorovitch you didn't know but i must tell you that we all all both her aunts i and all of us lise even have been hoping and praying for nothing for the last month but that she may give up your favorite dmitri who takes no notice of her and does not care for her and may marry ivan fyodorovitch such an excellent and cultivated young man who loves her more than anything in the world we are in a regular plot to bring it about and i am even staying on here perhaps on that account but she has been crying she has been wounded again cried alyosha never trust a woman's tears alexey fyodorovitch i am never for the women in such cases i am always on the side of the men mamma you are spoiling him lise's little voice cried from behind the door no it was all my fault i am horribly to blame alyosha repeated unconsoled hiding his face in his hands in an agony of remorse for his indiscretion quite the contrary you behaved like an angel like an angel i am ready to say so a thousand times over mamma how has he behaved like an angel lise's voice was heard again i somehow fancied all at once alyosha went on as though he had not heard lise that she loved ivan and so i said that stupid thing what will happen now to whom to whom cried lise mamma you really want to be the death of me i ask you and you don't answer at the moment the maid ran in katerina ivanovna is ill she is crying struggling hysterics what is the matter cried lise in a tone of real anxiety mamma i shall be having hysterics and not she lise for mercy's sake don't scream don't persecute me at your age one can't know everything that grown-up people know i'll come and tell you everything you ought to know oh mercy on us i am coming i am coming hysterics is a good sign alexey fyodorovitch it's an excellent thing that she is hysterical that's just as it ought to be in such cases i am always against the woman against all these feminine tears and hysterics run and say yulia that i'll fly to her as for ivan fyodorovitch's going away like that it's her own fault but he won't go away please for mercy's sake don't scream oh yes you are not screaming it's i am screaming forgive your mamma but i am delighted 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 did you notice alexey fyodorovitch how young how young ivan fyodorovitch was just now when he went out when he said all that and went out i thought he was so learned such a savant and all of a sudden he behaved so warmly openly and youthfully with such youthful inexperience and it was all so fine like you and the way he repeated that german verse it was just like you but i must fly i must fly alexey fyodorovitch make haste to carry out her commission and then make haste back please do you want anything now for mercy's sake don't keep alexey fyodorovitch a minute he will come back to you at once madame holakoff at last ran off before leaving alyosha would have opened the door to see lise on no account cried lise on no account now speak through the door how have you come to be an angel that's the only thing i want to know for an awful piece of stupidity lise good-bye don't dare to go away like that lise was beginning lise i have a real sorrow i will be back directly but i have a great great sorrow and he ran out of the room End of section 29《セクション30》of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book Four, Chapter Six: A Laceration in the Cottage. He certainly was really grieved in a way he had seldom been before. He had rushed in like a fool and meddled in what? In a love affair 
but what do i know about it what can i tell about such things he repeated to himself for the hundredth time flushing crimson oh being ashamed would be nothing shame is the only punishment i deserve the trouble is i shall certainly have caused more unhappiness and father zosima sent me to reconcile and bring them together is this the way to bring them together then he suddenly remembered how he had tried to join their hands and he felt fearfully ashamed again though i acted quite sincerely i must be more sensible in the future he concluded suddenly and did not even smile at his conclusion katerina ivanovna's commission took him to lake street and his brother dmitri lived close by in a turning out of lake street alyosha decided to go to him in any case before going to the captain though he had a presentiment that he would not find his brother he suspected that he would intentionally keep out of his way now but he must find him anyhow time was passing the thought of his dying elder had not left alyosha for one minute from the time he set off from the monastery there was one point which interested him particularly about katerina ivanovna's commission when she had mentioned the captain's son the little schoolboy who had run beside his father crying the idea had at once struck alyosha that this must be the schoolboy who had bitten his finger when he alyosha asked him what he had done to hurt him now alyosha felt practically certain of this though he could not have said why thinking of another subject was a relief and he resolved to think no more about the mischief he had done and not to torture himself with remorse but to do what he had to do let come what would at that thought he was completely comforted turning to the street where dmitri lodged he felt hungry and taking out of his pocket the roll he had brought from his father's he ate it it made him feel stronger dmitri was not at home the people of the house an old cabinet-maker his son and his old wife looked with positive suspicion at alyosha he hasn't slept here for the last three nights maybe he has gone away the old man said in answer to alyosha's persistent inquiries alyosha saw that he was answering in accordance with instructions when he asked whether he were not at grushenka's or in hiding at foma's alyosha spoke so freely on purpose all three looked at him in alarm they are fond of him they are doing their best for him thought alyosha that's good at last he found the house in lake street it was a decrepit little house sunk on one side with three windows looking into the street and with a muddy yard in the middle of which stood a solitary cow he crossed the yard and found the door opening into the passage on the left of the passage lived the old woman of the house with her old daughter both seemed to be deaf in answer to his repeated inquiry for the captain one of them at last understood that he was asking for their lodgers and pointed to a door across the passage the captain's lodging turned out to be a simple cottage room alyosha had his hand on the iron latch to open the door when he was struck by the strange hush within yet he knew from katerina ivanovna's words that the man had a family either they are all asleep or perhaps they have heard me coming and are waiting for me to open the door i had better knock first and he knocked an answer came but not at once after an interval of perhaps ten seconds who's there shouted someone in a loud and very angry voice then alyosha opened the door and crossed the threshold he found himself in a regular peasant's room though it was large it was cumbered up with domestic belongings of all sorts and there were several people in it on the left was a large russian stove from the stove to the window on the left was a string running across the room and on it there were rags hanging there was a bedstead against the wall on each side right and left covered with knitted quilts on the one on the left was a pyramid of four print-covered pillows each smaller than the one beneath on the other there was only one very small pillow the opposite corner was screened off by a curtain or a sheet hung on a string behind this curtain could be seen a bed made up on a bench and a chair 
the rough square table of plain wood had been moved into the middle window the three windows which consisted each of four tiny greenish mildewy panes gave little light and were close shut so that the room was not very light and rather stuffy on the table was a frying pan with the remains of some fried eggs a half-eaten piece of bread and a small bottle with a few drops of vodka a woman of genteel appearance wearing a cotton gown was sitting on a chair by the bed on the left her face was thin and yellow and her sunken cheeks betrayed at the first glance that she was ill but what struck alyosha most was the expression in the poor woman's eyes a look of surprised inquiry and yet of haughty pride and while he was talking to her husband her big brown eyes moved from one speaker to the other with the same haughty and questioning expression beside her at the window stood a young girl rather plain with scanty reddish hair poorly but very neatly dressed she looked disdainfully at alyosha as he came in beside the other bed was sitting another female figure she was a very sad sight a young girl of about twenty but hunchback and crippled with withered legs as alyosha was told afterwards her crutches stood in the corner close by the strikingly beautiful and gentle eyes of this poor girl looked with mild serenity at alyosha a man of forty-five was sitting at the table finishing the fried eggs he was spare small and weakly built he had reddish hair and a scanty light-coloured beard very much like a wisp of tow this comparison and the phrase a wisp of tow flashed at once into alyosha's mind for some reason he remembered it afterwards it was obviously this gentleman who had shouted to him as there was no other man in the room but when alyosha went in he leapt up from the bench on which he was sitting and hastily wiping his mouth with a ragged napkin darted up to alyosha it's a monk come to beg for the monastery a nice place to come to the girl standing in the left corner said aloud the man spun round instantly towards her and answered her in an excited and breaking voice no varvara you are wrong allow me to ask he turned again to alyosha what has brought you to our retreat alyosha looked attentively at him it was the first time he had seen him there was something angular flurried and irritable about him though he had obviously just been drinking he was not drunk there was extraordinary impudence in his expression and yet strange to say at the same time there was fear he looked like a man who had long been kept in subjection and had submitted to it and now had suddenly turned and was trying to assert himself or better still like a man who wants dreadfully to hit you but is horribly afraid you will hit him in his words and in the intonation of his shrill voice there was a sort of crazy humour at times spiteful and at times cringing and continually shifting from one tone to another the question about our retreat he had asked as it were quivering all over rolling his eyes and skipping up so close to alyosha that he instinctively drew back a step he was dressed in a very shabby dark cotton coat patched and spotted he wore checked trousers of an extremely light colour long out of fashion and of very thin material they were so crumpled and so short that he looked as though he had grown out of them like a boy i am alexey karamazov alyosha began in reply i quite understand that sir the gentleman snapped out at once to assure him that he knew who he was already i am captain snegiryov sir but i am still desirous to know precisely what has led you oh i've come for nothing special i wanted to have a word with you if only you allow me in that case here is a chair sir kindly be seated that's what they used to say in the old comedies kindly be seated and with a rapid gesture he seized an empty chair it was a rough wooden chair not upholstered and set it for him almost in the middle of the room then taking another similar chair for himself he sat down facing alyosha so close to him that their knees almost touched 
nikolai ilyich snigiryov sir formerly a captain in the russian infantry put to shame for his vices but still a captain though i might not be one now for the way i talk for the last half of my life i've learnt to say sir it's a word you use when you've come down in the world that's very true smiled alyosha but is it used involuntarily or on purpose as god's above it's involuntary and i usen't to use it i didn't use the word sir all my life but as soon as i sank into low water i began to say sir it's the work of a higher power i see you are interested in contemporary questions but how can i have excited your curiosity living as i do in surroundings impossible for the exercise of hospitality i've come about that business about what business the captain interrupted impatiently about your meeting with my brother dmitri fyodorovitch alyosha blurted out awkwardly what meeting sir you don't mean that meeting about my wisp of toe then he moved closer so that his knees positively knocked against alyosha his lips were strangely compressed like a thread what wisp of toe muttered alyosha he is come to complain of me father cried a voice familiar to alyosha the voice of the schoolboy from behind the curtain i bit his finger just now the curtain was pulled and alyosha saw his assailant lying on a little bed made up on the bench and the chair in the corner under the icons the boy lay covered by his coat and an old wadded quilt he was evidently unwell and judging by his glittering eyes he was in a fever he looked at alyosha without fear as though he felt he was at home and could not be touched what did he bite your finger the captain jumped up from his chair was it your finger he bit yes he was throwing stones with other schoolboys there were six of them against him alone i went up to him and he threw a stone at me and then another at my head i asked him what i had done to him and then he rushed at me and bit my finger badly i don't know why i'll thrash him sir at once this minute the captain jumped up from his seat but i am not complaining at all i am simply telling you i don't want him to be thrashed besides he seems to be ill and do you suppose i'd thrash him that i'd take my ilusha and thrash him before you for your satisfaction would you like it done at once sir said the captain suddenly turning to alyosha as though he were going to attack him i am sorry about your finger sir but instead of thrashing ilusha would you like me to chop off my four fingers with this knife here before your eyes to satisfy your just wrath i should think four fingers would be enough to satisfy your thirst for vengeance you won't ask for the fifth one too he stopped short with a catch in his throat every feature in his face was twitching and working he looked extremely defiant he was in a sort of frenzy i think i understand it all now said alyosha gently and sorrowfully still keeping his seat so your boy is a good boy he loves his father and he attacked me as the brother of your assailant now i understand it he repeated thoughtfully but my brother dmitri fyodorovitch regrets his action i know that and if only it is possible for him to come to you or better still to meet you in that same place he will ask your forgiveness before every one if you wish it after pulling out my beard you mean he will ask my forgiveness and he thinks that will be a satisfactory finish doesn't he oh no on the contrary he will do anything you like and in any way you like so if i were to ask his highness to go down on his knees before me in that very tavern the metropolis it's called or in the market-place he would do it yes he would even go down on his knees you've pierced me to the heart sir touched me to tears and pierced me to the heart i am only too sensible of your brother's generosity allow me to introduce my family my two daughters and my son my litter if i die who will care for them and while i live who but they will care for a wretch like me that's a great thing the lord has ordained for every man of my sort sir for there must be some one able to love even a man like me ah that's perfectly true exclaimed alyosha 
oh do leave off playing the fool some idiot comes in and you put us to shame cried the girl by the window suddenly turning to her father with a disdainful and contemptuous air wait a little varvara cried her father speaking peremptorily but looking at her quite approvingly that's her character he said addressing alyosha again and in all nature there was not that could find favor in his eyes or rather in the feminine that could find favor in her eyes but now let me present you to my wife arina petrovna she is crippled she is forty-three she can move but very little she is of humble origin arina petrovna compose your countenance this is alexey fyodorovitch karamazov get up alexey fyodorovitch he took him by the hand and with unexpected force pulled him up you must stand up to be introduced to a lady it's not the karamazov mamma who hmm, etc but his brother radiant with modest virtues come arina petrovna come mamma first your hand to be kissed and he kissed his wife's hand respectfully and even tenderly the girl at the window turned her back indignantly on the scene an expression of extraordinary cordiality came over the haughtily inquiring face of the woman good morning sit down mr chernomazov she said karamazov mamma karamazov we are of humble origin he whispered again well karamazov or whatever it is but i always think of chernomazov sit down why has he pulled you up he calls me crippled but i am not only my legs are swollen like barrels and i am shrivelled up myself once i used to be so fat but now it's as though i had swallowed a needle we are of humble origin the captain muttered again oh father father the hunchback girl who had till then been silent on her chair said suddenly and she hid her eyes in her handkerchief buffoon blurted out the girl at the window have you heard our news said the mother pointing at her daughters it's like clouds coming over the clouds pass and we have music again when we were with the army we used to have many such guests i don't mean to make any comparisons every one to their taste the deacon's wife used to come then and say alexander alexandrovitch is a man of the noblest heart but nastasia petrovna she would say is of the brood of hell well i said that's a matter of taste but you are a little spitfire and you want keeping in your place says she you black sword said i who asked you to teach me but my breath says she is clean and yours is unclean you ask all the officers whether my breath is unclean and ever since then i had it in my mind not long ago i was sitting here as i am now when i saw that very general come in who came here for easter and i asked him your excellency said i can a lady's breath be unpleasant yes he answered you ought to open a window-pane or open the door for the air is not fresh here and they all go on like that and what is my breath to them the dead smell worse still i won't spoil the air said i i'll order some slippers and go away my darlings don't blame your own mother nikolai ilitch how is it i can't please you there's only ilusha who comes home from school and loves me yesterday he brought me an apple forgive your own mother forgive a poor lonely creature why has my breath become unpleasant to you and the poor mad woman broke into sobs and tears streamed down her cheeks the captain rushed up to her mamma mamma my dear give over you are not lonely every one loves you every one adores you he began kissing both her hands again and tenderly stroking her face taking the dinner napkin he began wiping away her tears alyosha fancied that he too had tears in his eyes there you see you hear he turned with a sort of fury to alyosha pointing to the poor imbecile i see and hear muttered alyosha father father how can you with him let him alone cried the boy sitting up in his bed and gazing at his father with glowing eyes 
do give over fooling showing off your silly antics which never lead to anything shouted varvara stamping her foot with passion your anger is quite just this time varvara and i'll make haste to satisfy you come put on your cap alexey fyodorovitch and i'll put on mine we will go out i have a word to say to you in earnest but not within these walls this girl sitting here is my daughter nina i forgot to introduce her to you she is a heavenly angel incarnate who has flown down to us mortals if you can understand there he is shaking all over as though he is in convulsions varvara went on indignantly and she there stamping her foot at me and calling me a fool just now she is a heavenly angel incarnate too and she has good reason to call me so come along alexey fyodorovitch we must make an end and snatching alyosha's hand he drew him out of the room into the street end of section thirty section thirty one of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book four chapter seven and in the open air the air is fresh but in my apartment it is not so in any sense of the word let us walk slowly sir i should be glad of your kind interest i too have something important to say to you observed alyosha only i don't know how to begin to be sure you must have business with me you would never have looked in upon me without some object unless you come simply to complain of the boy and that's hardly likely and by the way about the boy i could not explain to you in there but here i will describe that scene to you my toe was thicker a week ago i mean my beard that's the nickname they give to my beard the schoolboys most of all well your brother dmitri fyodorovitch was pulling me by my beard i'd done nothing he was in a towering rage and happened to come upon me he dragged me out of the tavern into the market-place at that moment the boys were coming out of school and with them ilusha as soon as he saw me in such a state he rushed up to me father he cried father he caught hold of me hugged me tried to pull me away crying to my assailant let go let go it's my father forgive him yes he actually cried forgive him he clutched at that hand that very hand in his little hands and kissed it i remember his little face at that moment i haven't forgotten it and i never shall i swear cried alyosha that my brother will express his most deep and sincere regret even if he has to go down on his knees in that same market-place i'll make him or he is no brother of mine aha then it's only a suggestion and it does not come from him but simply from the generosity of your own warm heart you should have said so no in that case allow me to tell you of your brother's highly chivalrous soldierly generosity for he did give expression to it at the time he left off dragging me by my beard and released me you are an officer he said and i am an officer if you can find a decent man to be your second send me your challenge i will give satisfaction though you are a scoundrel that's what he said a chivalrous spirit indeed i retired with ilusha and that scene is a family record imprinted for ever on ilusha's soul no it's not for us to claim the privileges of noblemen judge for yourself you've just been in our mansion what did you see there three ladies one a cripple and weak-minded another a cripple and hunchback and the third not crippled but far too clever she is a student dying to get back to petersburg to work for the emancipation of the russian woman on the banks of the neva i won't speak of ilusha he is only nine i am alone in the world and if i die what will become of all of them i simply ask you that and if i challenge him and he kills me on the spot what then what will become of them and worse still if he doesn't kill me but only cripples me i couldn't work but i should still be a mouth to feed who would feed it and who would feed them all 
must i take ilusha from school and send him to beg in the streets that's what it means for me to challenge him to a duel it's silly talk and nothing else he will beg your forgiveness he will bow down at your feet in the middle of the market-place cried alyosha again with glowing eyes i did think of prosecuting him the captain went on but look in our code could i get much compensation for a personal injury and then agrafena alexandrovna sent for me and shouted at me don't dare to dream of it if you proceed against him i'll publish it to all the world that he beat you for your dishonesty and then you will be prosecuted i call god to witness whose was the dishonesty and by whose commands i acted wasn't it by her own and fyodor pavlovitch's and what's more she went on i'll dismiss you for good and you'll never earn another penny from me i'll speak to my merchant too that's what she calls her old man and he will dismiss you and if he dismisses me what can i earn then from any one those two are all i have to look to for your fyodor pavlovitch has not only given over employing me for another reason but he means to make use of papers i've signed to go to law against me and so i kept quiet and you have seen our retreat but now let me ask you did ilusha hurt your finger much i didn't like to go into it in our mansion before him yes very much and he was in a great fury he was avenging you on me as a karamazov i see that now but if only you had seen how he was throwing stones at his schoolfellows it's very dangerous they might kill him they are children and stupid a stone may be thrown and break somebody's head that's just what has happened he has been bruised by a stone to-day not on the head but on the chest just above the heart he came home crying and groaning and now he is ill and you know he attacks them first he is bitter against them on your account they say he stabbed a boy called krasotkin with a penknife not long ago i've heard about that too it's dangerous krasotkin is an official here we may hear more about it i would advise you alyosha went on warmly not to send him to school at all for a time till he is calmer and his anger is past anger the captain repeated that's just what it is he's a little creature but it's a mighty anger you don't know all sir let me tell you more since that incident all the boys have been teasing him about the wisp of tow schoolboys are a merciless race individually they are angels but together especially in schools they are often merciless their teasing has stirred up a gallant spirit in ilusha an ordinary boy a weak son would have submitted have felt ashamed of his father sir but he stood up for his father against them all for his father and for truth and justice for what he suffered when he kissed your brother's hand and cried to him forgive father forgive him that only god knows and i his father for our children not your children but ours the children of the poor gentlemen looked down upon by every one know what justice means sir even at nine years old how should the rich know they don't explore such depths once in their lives but at that moment in the square when he kissed his hand at that moment my ilusha had grasped all that justice means that truth entered into him and crushed him for ever sir the captain said hotly again with a sort of frenzy and he struck his right fist against his left palm as though he wanted to show how the truth crushed ilusha that very day sir he fell ill with fever and was delirious all night all that day he hardly said a word to me but i noticed he kept watching me from the corner though he turned to the window and pretended to be learning his lessons but i could see his mind was not on his lessons next day i got drunk to forget my troubles sinful man as i am and i don't remember much mamma began crying too i am very fond of mamma well i spent my last penny drowning my troubles don't despise me for that sir in russia men who drink are the best the best men amongst us are the greatest drunkards i lay down and i don't remember about ilusha though all that day the boys had been jeering at him at school wisp of tow they shouted your father was pulled out of the tavern by his wisp of tow you ran by and begged forgiveness 
on the third day when he came back from school i saw he looked pale and wretched what is it i asked he wouldn't answer well there's no talking in our mansion without mamma and the girls taking part in it what's more the girls had heard about it the very first day varvara had begun snarling you fools and buffoons can you ever do anything rational quite so i said can we ever do anything rational for the time i turned it off like that so in the evening i took the boy out for a walk for you must know we go for a walk every evening always the same way along which we are going now from our gate to that great stone which lies alone in the road under the hurdle which marks the beginning of the town pasture a beautiful and lonely spot sir ilusha and i walked along hand in hand as usual he has a little hand his fingers are thin and cold he suffers from his chest you know father said he father well said i i saw his eyes flashing father how he treated you then it can't be helped ilusha i said don't forgive him father don't forgive him at school they said that he has paid you ten roubles for it no ilusha said i i would not take money from him for anything then he began trembling all over took my hand in both his and kissed it again father he said father challenge him to a duel at school they say you are a coward and won't challenge him and that you'll accept ten roubles from him i can't challenge him to a duel ilusha i answered and i told briefly what i've just told you he listened father he said anyway don't forgive it when i grow up i'll call him out myself and kill him his eyes shone and glowed and of course i am his father and i had to put in a word it's a sin to kill i said even in a duel father he said when i grow up i'll knock him down knock the sword out of his hand i'll fall on him wave my sword over him and say i could kill you but i forgive you so there you see what the workings of his little mind have been during these two days he must have been planning that vengeance all day and raving about it at night but he began to come home from school badly beaten i found out about it the day before yesterday and you are right i won't send him to that school any more i heard that he was standing up against all the class alone and defying them all that his heart was full of resentment of bitterness i was alarmed about him we went for another walk father he asked are the rich people stronger than any one else on earth yes ilusha i said there are no people on earth stronger than the rich father he said i will get rich i will become an officer and conquer everybody the czar will reward me i will come back here and then no one will dare then he was silent and his lips still kept trembling father he said what a horrid town this is yes ilusha i said it isn't a very nice town father let us move into another town a nice one he said where people don't know about us we will move we will ilusha said i only i must save up for it i was glad to be able to turn his mind from painful thoughts and we began to dream of how we would move to another town how we would buy a horse and cart we will put mamma and your sisters inside we will cover them up and we'll walk you shall have a lift now and then and i'll walk beside for we must take care of our horse we can't all ride that's how we'll go he was enchanted at that most of all at the thought of having a horse and driving him for of course a russian boy is born among horses we chattered a long while thank god i thought i have diverted his mind and comforted him that was the day before yesterday in the evening but last night everything was changed he had gone to school in the morning he came back depressed terribly depressed in the evening i took him by the hand and we went for a walk he would not talk there was a wind blowing and no sun and a feeling of autumn twilight was coming on we walked along both of us depressed well my boy said i how about our setting off on our travels i thought i might bring him back to our talk of the day before he didn't answer but i felt his fingers trembling in my hand ah i thought it's a bad job there's something fresh we had reached the stone where we are now i sat down on the stone and in the air there were lots of kites flapping and whirling 
there were as many as thirty in sight of course it's just the season for the kites look elusha said i it's time we got out our last year's kite again i'll mend it where have you put it away my boy made no answer he looked away and turned sideways to me and then a gust of wind blew up the sand he suddenly fell on me threw both his little arms round my neck and held me tight you know when children are silent and proud and try to keep back their tears when they are in great trouble and suddenly break down their tears fall in streams with those warm streams of tears he suddenly wetted my face he sobbed and shook as though he were in convulsions and squeezed up against me as i sat on the stone father he kept crying dear father how he insulted you and i sobbed too we sat shaking in each other's arms elusha i said to him elusha darling no one saw us then god alone saw us i hope he will record it to my credit you must thank your brother alexey fyodorovitch no sir i won't thrash my boy for your satisfaction he had gone back to his original tone of resentful buffoonery alyosha felt though that he trusted him and that if there had been someone else in his alyosha's place the man would not have spoken so openly and would not have told what he had just told this encouraged alyosha whose heart was trembling on the verge of tears ah how i would like to make friends with your boy he cried if you could arrange it certainly sir muttered the captain but now listen to something quite different alyosha went on i have a message for you that same brother of mine dmitri has insulted his betrothed too a noble-hearted girl of whom you have probably heard i have a right to tell you of her wrong i ought to do so in fact for hearing of the insult done to you and learning all about your unfortunate position she commissioned me at once just now to bring you this help from her but only from her alone not from dmitri who has abandoned her nor from me his brother nor from anyone else but from her only from her she entreats you to accept her help you have both been insulted by the same man she thought of you only when she had just received a similar insult from him similar in its cruelty i mean she comes like a sister to help a brother in misfortune she told me to persuade you to take these two hundred roubles from her as from a sister knowing that you are in such need no one will know of it it can give rise to no unjust slander there are the two hundred roubles and i swear you must take them unless unless all men are to be enemies on earth but there are brothers even on earth you have a generous heart you must see that you must and alyosha held out two new rainbow-coloured hundred-rouble notes they were both standing at the time by the great stone close to the fence and there was no one near the notes seemed to produce a tremendous impression on the captain he started but at first only from astonishment such an outcome of their conversation was the last thing he expected nothing could have been farther from his dreams than help from any one and such a sum he took the notes and for a minute he was almost unable to answer quite a new expression came into his face that for me so much money two hundred roubles good heavens why i haven't seen so much money for the last four years mercy on us and she says she is a sister and is that the truth i swear that all i have told you is the truth cried alyosha the captain flushed red listen my dear listen if i take it i shan't be behaving like a scoundrel in your eyes alexey fyodorovitch i shan't be a scoundrel no alexey fyodorovitch listen listen he hurried touching alyosha with both his hands you are persuading me to take it saying that it's a sister sends it but inwardly in your heart won't you feel contempt for me if i take it eh no no on my salvation i swear i shan't and no one will ever know but me i you and she and one other lady her great friend never mind the lady listen alexey fyodorovitch at a moment like this you must listen for you can't understand what these two hundred roubles mean to me now 
the poor fellow went on rising gradually into a sort of incoherent almost wild enthusiasm he was thrown off his balance and talked extremely fast as though afraid he would not be allowed to say all he had to say besides its being honestly acquired from a sister so highly respected and revered do you know that now i can look after mamma and nina my hunchback angel daughter dr herzenstube came to me in the kindness of his heart and was examining them both for a whole hour i can make nothing of it said he but he prescribed a mineral water which is kept at a chemist's here he said it would be sure to do her good and he ordered baths too with some medicine in them the mineral water costs thirty kopecks and she'd need to drink forty bottles perhaps so i took the prescription and laid it on the shelf under the icons and there it lies and he ordered hot baths for nina with something dissolved in them morning and evening but how can we carry out such a cure in our mansion without servants without help without a bath and without water nina is rheumatic all over i don't think i told you that all her right side aches at night she is in agony and would you believe it the angel bears it without groaning for fear of waking us we eat what we can get and she'll only take the leavings what you'd scarcely give to a dog i am not worth it i am taking it from you i am a burden on you that's what her angel eyes try to express we wait on her but she doesn't like it i am a useless cripple no good to any one as though she were not worth it when she is the saving of all of us with her angelic sweetness without her without her gentle word it would be hell among us she softens even varvara and don't judge varvara harshly either she is an angel too she too has suffered wrong she came to us for the summer and she brought sixteen roubles she had earned by lessons and saved up to go back with to petersburg in september that is now but we took her money and lived on it so now she has nothing to go back with though indeed she couldn't go back for she has to work for us like a slave she is like an overdriven horse with all of us on her back she waits on us all mends and washes sweeps the floor puts mamma to bed and mamma is capricious and tearful and insane and now i can get a servant with this money you understand alexey fyodorovitch i can get medicines for the dear creatures i can send my student to petersburg i can buy beef i can feed them properly good lord but it's a dream alyosha was delighted that he had brought him such happiness and that the poor fellow had consented to be made happy stay alexey fyodorovitch stay the captain began to talk with frenzied rapidity carried away by a new daydream do you know that ilusha and i will perhaps really carry out our dream we will buy a horse and cart a black horse he insists on it being black and we will set off as we pretended the other day i have an old friend a lawyer in k province and i heard through a trustworthy man that if i were to go he'd give me a place as clerk in his office so who knows maybe he would so i'd just put mamma and nina in the cart and ilusha could drive and i'd walk i'd walk why if i only succeed in getting one debt paid that's owing me i should have perhaps enough for that too there would be enough cried alyosha katerina ivanovna will send you as much more as you need and you know i have money too take what you want as you would from a brother from a friend you could give it back later you'll get rich you'll get rich and you know you couldn't have a better idea than to move to another province it would be the saving of you especially of your boy and you ought to go quickly before the winter before the cold you must write to us when you are there and we will always be brothers no it's not a dream alyosha could have hugged him he was so pleased but glancing at him he stopped short the man was standing with his neck outstretched and his lips protruding with a pale and frenzied face his lips were moving as though trying to articulate something no sound came but still his lips moved it was uncanny what is it asked alyosha startled alexey fyodorovitch i you muttered the captain faltering looking at him with a strange wild fixed stare and an air of desperate resolution at the same time there was a sort of grin on his lips 
i you sir wouldn't you like me to show you a little trick i know he murmured suddenly in a firm rapid whisper his voice no longer faltering what trick a pretty trick whispered the captain his mouth was twisted on the left side his left eye was screwed up he still stared at alyosha what is the matter what trick alyosha cried now thoroughly alarmed why look squealed the captain suddenly and showing him the two notes which he had been holding by one corner between his thumb and forefinger during the conversation he crumpled them up savagely and squeezed them tight in his right hand do you see do you see he shrieked pale and infuriated and suddenly flinging up his hand he threw the crumpled notes on the sand do you see he shrieked again pointing to them look there and with wild fury he began trampling them under his heel gasping and exclaiming as he did so so much for your money 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 suddenly he darted back and drew himself up before alyosha and his whole figure expressed unutterable pride tell those who sent you that the wisp of toad does not sell his honor he cried raising his arm in the air then he turned quickly and began to run but he had not run five steps before he turned completely round and kissed his hand to alyosha he ran another five paces and then turned round for the last time this time his face was not contorted with laughter but quivering all over with tears in a tearful faltering sobbing voice he cried what should i say to my boy if i took money from you for our shame and then he ran on without turning alyosha looked after him inexpressibly grieved oh he saw that till the very last moment the man had not known he would crumple up and fling away the notes he did not turn back alyosha knew he would not he would not follow him and call him back he knew why when he was out of sight alyosha picked up the two notes they were very much crushed and crumpled and had been pressed into the sand but were uninjured and even rustled like new ones when alyosha unfolded them and smoothed them out after smoothing them out he folded them up put them in his pocket and went to katerina ivanovna to report on the success of her commission End of section 31section thirty two of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book five pro and contra chapter one the engagement madame holikoff was again the first to meet alyosha she was flustered something important had happened katerina ivanovna's hysterics had ended in a fainting fit and then a terrible awful weakness had followed she lay with her eyes turned up and was delirious now she was in a fever they had sent for herzenstube they had sent for the ants the ants were already here but herzenstube had not yet come they were all sitting in her room waiting she was unconscious now and what if it turned to brain fever madame holikoff looked gravely alarmed this is serious serious she added at every word as though nothing that had happened to her before had been serious alyosha listened with distress and was beginning to describe his adventures but she interrupted him at the first words she had not time to listen she begged him to sit with lise and wait for her there lise she whispered almost in his ear lise has greatly surprised me just now dear alexey fyodorovitch she touched me too and so my heart forgives her everything only fancy as soon as you had gone she began to be truly remorseful for having laughed at you to-day and yesterday though she was not laughing at you but only joking but she was seriously sorry for it almost ready to cry so that i was quite surprised she has never been really sorry for laughing at me but has only made a joke of it 
and you know she is laughing at me every minute but this time she was in earnest she thinks a great deal of your opinion alexey fyodorovitch and don't take offence or be wounded by her if you can help it i am never hard upon her for she's such a clever little thing would you believe it she said just now that you were a friend of her childhood the greatest friend of her childhood just think of that greatest friend and what about me she has very strong feelings and memories and what's more she uses these phrases most unexpected words which come out all of a sudden when you least expect them she spoke lately about a pine tree for instance there used to be a pine tree standing in our garden in her early childhood very likely it's standing there still so there's no need to speak in the past tense pine trees are not like people alexey fyodorovitch they don't change quickly mamma she said i remember this pine tree as in a dream only she said something so original about it that i can't repeat it besides i've forgotten it well good-bye i am so worried i feel i shall go out of my mind ah alexey fyodorovitch i've been out of my mind twice in my life go to lise cheer her up as you always can so charmingly lise she cried going to her door here i've brought you alexey fyodorovitch whom you insulted so he's not at all angry i assure you on the contrary he is surprised that you could suppose so merci maman come in alexey fyodorovitch alyosha went in lise looked rather embarrassed and at once flushed crimson she was evidently ashamed of something and as people always do in such cases she began immediately talking of other things as though they were of absorbing interest to her at the moment mamma has just told me all about the two hundred roubles alexey fyodorovitch and your taking them to that poor officer and she told me all the awful story of how he had been insulted and you know although mamma muddles things she always rushes from one thing to another i cried when i heard well did you give him the money and how is that poor man getting on the fact is i didn't give it to him and it's a long story answered alyosha as though he too could think of nothing but his regret at having failed yet lise saw perfectly well that he too looked away and that he too was trying to talk of other things alyosha sat down to the table and began to tell his story but at the first words he lost his embarrassment and gained the whole of lise's attention as well he spoke with deep feeling under the influence of the strong impression he had just received and he succeeded in telling his story well and circumstantially in old days in moscow he had been fond of coming to lise and describing to her what had just happened to him what he had read or what he remembered of his childhood sometimes they had made daydreams and woven whole romances together generally cheerful and amusing ones now they both felt suddenly transported to the old days in moscow two years before lise was extremely touched by his story alyosha described ilusha with warm feeling when he finished describing how the luckless man trampled on the money lise could not help clasping her hands and crying out so you didn't give him the money so you let him run away oh dear you ought to have run after him no lise it's better i didn't run after him said alyosha getting up from his chair and walking thoughtfully across the room how so how is it better now they are without food and their case is hopeless not hopeless for the two hundred roubles will still come to them he'll take the money to-morrow to-morrow he will be sure to take it said alyosha pacing up and down pondering you see lise he went on stopping suddenly before her i made one blunder but that even that is all for the best what blunder and why is it for the best i'll tell you he is a man of weak and timorous character he has suffered so much and is very good-natured i keep wondering why he took offence so suddenly for i assure you up to the last minute he did not know that he was going to trample on the notes and i think now there was a great deal to offend him and it could not have been otherwise in his position to begin with he was sore at having been so glad of the money in my presence and not having concealed it from me 
if he had been pleased but not so much if he had not shown it if he had begun affecting scruples and difficulties as other people do when they take money he might still endure to take it but he was too genuinely delighted and that was mortifying ah lise he is a good and truthful man that's the worst of the whole business all the while he talked his voice was so weak so broken he talked so fast so fast he kept laughing such a laugh or perhaps he was crying yes i am sure he was crying he was so delighted and he talked about his daughters and about the situation he could get in another town and when he had poured out his heart he felt ashamed at having shown me his inmost soul like that so he began to hate me at once he is one of those awfully sensitive poor people what had made him feel most ashamed was that he had given in too soon and accepted me as a friend you see at first he almost flew at me and tried to intimidate me but as soon as he saw the money he had begun embracing me he kept touching me with his hands this must have been how he came to feel it all so humiliating and then i made that blunder a very important one i suddenly said to him that if he had not money enough to move to another town we would give it to him and indeed i myself would give him as much as he wanted out of my own money that struck him all at once why he thought did i put myself forward to help him you know lise it's awfully hard for a man who has been injured when other people look at him as though they were his benefactors i've heard that father zassima told me so i don't know how to put it but i have often seen it myself and i feel like that myself too and the worst of it was that though he did not know up to the very last minute that he would trample on the notes he had a kind of presentiment of it i am sure of that that's just what made him so ecstatic that he had that presentiment and though it's so dreadful it's all for the best in fact i believe nothing better could have happened why why could nothing better have happened cried lise looking with great surprise at alyosha because if he had taken the money in an hour after getting home he would be crying with mortification that's just what would have happened and most likely he would have come to me early to-morrow and perhaps have flung the notes at me and trampled upon them as he did just now but now he has gone home awfully proud and triumphant though he knows he has ruined himself so now nothing could be easier than to make him accept the two hundred roubles by to-morrow for he has already vindicated his honour tossed away the money and trampled it under foot he couldn't know when he did it that i should bring it to him again to-morrow and yet he is in terrible need of that money though he is proud of himself now yet even to-day he'll be thinking what a help he has lost he will think of it more than ever at night will dream of it and by to-morrow morning he may be ready to run to me to ask forgiveness it's just then that i'll appear here you are a proud man i shall say you have shown it but now take the money and forgive us and then he will take it alyosha was carried away with joy as he uttered his last words and then he will take it lise clapped her hands ah that's true i understand that perfectly now ah alyosha how do you know all this so young and yet he knows what's in the heart i should never have worked it out the great thing now is to persuade him that he is on an equal footing with us in spite of his taking money from us alyosha went on in his excitement and not only on an equal but even on a higher footing on a higher footing is charming alexey fyodorovitch but go on go on you mean there isn't such an expression as on a higher footing but that doesn't matter because oh no of course it doesn't matter forgive me alyosha dear you know i scarcely respected you till now that is i respected you but on an equal footing but now i shall begin to respect you on a higher footing don't be angry dear at my joking she put in at once with strong feeling i am absurd and small but you you listen alexey fyodorovitch 
isn't there in all our analysis i mean your analysis no better call it ours aren't we showing contempt for him for that poor man in analyzing his soul like this as it were from above eh in deciding so certainly that he will take the money no lise it's not contempt alyosha answered as though he had prepared himself for the question i was thinking of that on the way here how can it be contempt when we are all like him when we are all just the same as he is for you know we are just the same no better if we are better we should have been just the same in his place i don't know about you lise but i consider that i have a sordid soul in many ways and his soul is not sordid on the contrary full of fine feeling no lise i have no contempt for him do you know lise my elder told me once to care for most people exactly as one would for children and for some of them as one would for the sick in hospitals ah alexey fyodorovitch dear let us care for people as we would for the sick let us please i am ready though i am not altogether ready in myself i am sometimes very impatient and at other times i don't see things it's different with you oh, i don't believe it alexey fyodorovitch how happy i am i'm so glad you say so lise alexey fyodorovitch you are wonderfully good but you are sometimes sort of formal and yet you are not a bit formal really go to the door open it gently and see whether mamma is listening said lise in a nervous hurried whisper alyosha went opened the door and reported that no one was listening come here alexey fyodorovitch lise went on flushing redder and redder give me your hand that's right i have to make a great confession i didn't write to you yesterday in joke but in earnest and she hid her eyes with her hand it was evident that she was greatly ashamed of the confession suddenly she snatched his hand and impulsively kissed it three times ah lise what a good thing cried alyosha joyfully you know i was perfectly sure you were in earnest sure upon my word she put aside his hand but did not leave go of it blushing hotly and laughing a little happy laugh i kiss his hand and he says what a good thing but her reproach was undeserved alyosha too was greatly overcome i should like to please you always lise but i don't know how to do it he muttered blushing too alyosha dear you are cold and rude do you see he has chosen me as his wife and is quite settled about it he is sure i was in earnest what a thing to say why that's impertinence that's what it is why was it wrong of me to feel sure alyosha asked laughing suddenly ah alyosha on the contrary it was delightfully right cried lise looking tenderly and happily at him alyosha stood still holding her hand in his suddenly he stooped down and kissed her on her lips oh what are you doing cried lise alyosha was terribly abashed oh forgive me if i shouldn't perhaps i'm awfully stupid you said i was cold so i kissed you but i see it was stupid lise laughed and hid her face in her hands and in that dress she ejaculated in the midst of her mirth but she suddenly ceased laughing and became serious almost stern alyosha we must put off kissing we are not ready for that yet and we shall have a long time to wait she ended suddenly tell me rather why you who are so clever so intellectual so observant choose a little idiot an invalid like me ah oh, alyosha i am awfully happy for i don't deserve you a bit you do lise i shall be leaving the monastery altogether in a few days if i go into the world i must marry i know that he told me to marry too whom could i marry better than you and who would have me except you i have been thinking it over in the first place you've known me from a child and you've a great many qualities i haven't you are more light-hearted than i am above all you are more innocent than i am 
i have been brought into contact with many many things already ah you don't know but i too am a karamazov what does it matter if you do laugh and make jokes and at me too go on laughing i am so glad you do you laugh like a little child but you think like a martyr like a martyr how yes lise your question just now whether we weren't showing contempt for that poor man by dissecting his soul that was the question of a sufferer you see i don't know how to express it but any one who thinks of such questions is capable of suffering sitting in your invalid chair you must have thought over many things already alyosha give me your hand why are you taking it away murmured lise in a failing voice weak with happiness listen alyosha what will you wear when you come out of the monastery what sort of suit don't laugh don't be angry it's very very important to me i haven't thought about the suit lise but i'll wear whatever you like i should like you to have a dark blue velvet coat a white pique waistcoat and a soft gray felt hat tell me did you believe that i didn't care for you when i said i didn't mean what i wrote no i didn't believe it oh you insupportable person you are incorrigible you see i knew that you seemed to care for me but i pretended to believe that you didn't care for me to make it easier for you that makes it worse worse and better than all alyosha i am awfully fond of you just before you came this morning i tried my fortune i decided i would ask you for my letter and if you brought it out calmly and gave it to me as might have been expected from you it would mean that you did not love me at all that you felt nothing and were simply a stupid boy good for nothing and that i am ruined but you left the letter at home and that cheered me you left it behind on purpose so as not to give it back because you knew i would ask for it that was it wasn't it ah lise it was not so a bit the letter is with me now and it was this morning in this pocket here it is alyosha pulled the letter out laughing and showed it her at a distance but i'm not going to give it to you look at it from here why then you told a lie you a monk told a lie i told a lie if you like alyosha laughed too i told a lie so as not to give you back the letter it's very precious to me he added suddenly with strong feeling and again he flushed it always will be and i won't give it up to any one lise looked at him joyfully alyosha she murmured again look at the door isn't mamma listening very well lise i'll look but wouldn't it be better not to look why suspect your mother of such meanness what meanness as for her spying on her daughter it's her right it's not meanness cried lise firing up you may be sure alexey fyodorovitch that when i am a mother if i have a daughter like myself i shall certainly spy on her really lise that's not right oh my goodness what has meanness to do with it if she were listening to some ordinary worldly conversation it would be meanness but when her own daughter is shut up with a young man listen alyosha do you know i shall spy upon you as soon as we are married and let me tell you i shall open all your letters and read them so you may as well be prepared yes of course if so muttered alyosha only it's not right oh, how contemptuous alyosha dear we won't quarrel the very first day i'd better tell you the whole truth of course it's very wrong to spy on people and of course i am not right and you are only i shall spy on you all the same do then you won't find out anything laughed alyosha and alyosha will you give in to me we must decide that too i shall be delighted to lise and certain to only not in the most important things even if you don't agree with me i shall do my duty in the most important things that's right but let me tell you i am ready to give in to you not only in the most important matters but in everything 
and i am ready to vow to do so now in everything and for all my life cried lise fervently and i'll do it gladly gladly what's more i'll swear never to spy on you never once never to read one of your letters for you are right and i am not and though i shall be awfully tempted to spy i know that i won't do it since you consider it dishonourable you are my conscience now listen alexey fyodorovitch why have you been so sad lately both yesterday and to-day i know you have a lot of anxiety and trouble but i see you have some special grief besides some secret one perhaps yes lise i have a secret one too answered alyosha mournfully i see you love me since you guessed that what grief what about can you tell me asked lise with timid entreaty i'll tell you later lise afterwards said alyosha confused now you wouldn't understand it perhaps and perhaps i couldn't explain it i know your brothers and your father are worrying you too yes my brothers too murmured alyosha pondering i don't like your brother ivan alyosha said lise suddenly he noticed this remark with some surprise but did not answer it my brothers are destroying themselves he went on my father too and they are destroying others with them it's the primitive force of the karamazovs as father paisi said the other day a crude unbridled earthly force does the spirit of god move above that force even that i don't know i only know that i too am a karamazov me a monk a monk am i a monk please you said just now that i was yes i did and perhaps i don't even believe in god you don't believe what is the matter said lise quietly and gently but alyosha did not answer there was something too mysterious too subjective in these last words of his perhaps obscure to himself but yet torturing him and now on the top of it all my friend the best man in the world is going is leaving the earth if you knew lise how bound up in soul i am with him and then i shall be left alone i shall come to you lise for the future we will be together yes together together henceforward we shall be always together all our lives listen kiss me i allow you alyosha kissed her come now go christ be with you and she made the sign of the cross over him make haste back to him while he is still alive i see i've kept you cruelly i'll pray to-day for him and you alyosha we shall be happy shall we be happy shall we i believe we shall lise alyosha thought it better not to go into madame holikoff and was going out of the house without saying good-bye to her but no sooner had he opened the door than he found madame holikoff standing before him from the first word alyosha guessed that she had been waiting on purpose to meet him alexey fyodorovitch this is awful this is all childish nonsense and ridiculous i trust you won't dream it's foolishness nothing but foolishness she said attacking him at once only don't tell her that said alyosha or she will be upset and that's bad for her now sensible advice from a sensible young man am i to understand that you only agreed with her from compassion for her invalid state because you didn't want to irritate her by contradiction oh no not at all i was quite serious in what i said alyosha declared stoutly to be serious about it is impossible unthinkable and in the first place i shall never be at home to you again and i shall take her away you may be sure of that but why asked alyosha it's all so far off we may have to wait another year and a half ah alexey fyodorovitch that's true of course and you'll have time to quarrel and separate a thousand times in a year and a half but i am so unhappy 
though it's such nonsense it's a great blow to me i feel like famusov in the last scene of sorrow from wit you are chatsky and she is sophia and only fancy i've run down to meet you on the stairs and in the play the fatal scene takes place on the staircase i heard it all i almost dropped so this is the explanation of her dreadful night and her hysterics of late it means love to the daughter but death to the mother i might as well be in my grave at once and a more serious matter still what is this letter she has written show it to me at once at once no there's no need tell me how is katerina ivanovna now i must know she still lies in delirium she has not regained consciousness her aunts are here but they do nothing but sigh and give themselves airs herzen stube came and he was so alarmed that i didn't know what to do for him and nearly sent for a doctor to look after him he was driven home in my carriage and on the top of it all you and this letter it's true nothing can happen for a year and a half in the name of all that's holy in the name of your dying elder show me that letter alexey fyodorovitch i'm her mother hold it in your hand if you like and i will read it so no i won't show it to you even if she sanctioned it i wouldn't i am coming to-morrow and if you like we can talk over many things but now good-bye and alyosha ran downstairs and into the street End of section 32